Okay, Dufid, we are live with uh, Week in Review. So uh, a lot to cover tonight. Been an exciting week. A lot of research and uh, excited to uh, start Week in Review. A lot of interesting things to share. Hopefully a few people tune in to find it interesting. So uh, let me jump right in with screen share and... Uh, show some links. Most of what I have this week is related to monism, some really interesting things, but uh, just to uh, clear my desktop off quickly, just jump straight into screen share. We'll see if uh, any guests want to come on later. I'll put the link in. Let me just... Um, so this was a little bit interesting. The last few weeks I've been talking about uh, you know, the history of science. I'm going to return to that. So here was an article on the history and theology of thermodynamics. And uh, let me just read the abstract here. The first and second laws of thermodynamics, stating respectively the conservation of the dissipation of energy, are considered by many writers to be the two most fundamental laws of the universe. Both laws are held to be empirically derived, yet upon reflection it does not seem possible to state from the limited empiric evidence available either proposition as a universal law. Further element appears to be involved in such statement, philosophical and religious belief. In this paper, the conservation law is traced to its origins in Greek philosophy. The second law is traced to its origins in their traditional Christian outlook. Traditional Christian concepts appear to have deeply influenced Many of the scientists who stated and developed the second law as a universal principle to cite Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, one of the originators of the second law, the law meant that all motion except that of heat must have an end unless it pleased God to restore by an act of new creative power and dissipation of mechanical effects that always go on. The conceptual development of the second law is followed from the works of Newton through the treatment of Laplace, Wewell, Kelvin, Clausius, Maxwell, Tyndale, Stewart, and Tate, Clifford, Boltzmann, Plank, Jane, Eddington, Whitehead, and a number of other writers, the view of these writers on the objective truth or falsity of the second law as universal principles found to vary less with empiric evidence than with philosophical or religious belief. From the thoughts of certain of these men, it is suggested that the physical evidence taken as supporting the second law, which states that entropy can remain constant or increase, but can never decrease may when considered with Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction suggests the probable presence of generically different and counterbalancing phenomenon yet to be discovered. A full statement of the second law may turn out to be entropy symmetrical. This theoretical possibility holds strong implications for technology. For over 100 years, we have employed a dissipative technology of low efficiency, which embodies our understanding of the second law. We have, as a result, an ecological and energy crisis if entropy changes turn out to be symmetrical for the universe as a whole, there may well be no ultimate barrier to the development of a technology which closely approaches unity in its efficiency. Reexamination of the second law with a view to obtaining higher technological efficiency is urged. The thoughts of many of the writers, particularly the physicists, appear seminal in this regard. So this was a PhD thesis. Um, just thought I'd... Uh, share that. Actually, I forgot to share it. So here are the religion and philosophy of entropy. Important uh, subject. So there's another one, um, contemporary panpsychism. And let me just read this abstract real quick. And uh, After spending the better part of a century in philosophical exile, panpsychism has recently been something of a resurgence in the philosophy of mind with an eye towards the so-called heart problem. Um, this is a University of Texas, Austin, Keith Tarowski graduate uh, program. Contemporary panpsychism holds the conscious simpliciter, not self-consciousness, emotion, desire, belief, cognition, or even really awareness as known in the human case but bare subjective experience is a fundamental force of our universe, intrinsic to literally everything. The view remains highly controversial, accepted reluctantly even by some of its most prominent advocates. As such, panpsychism 
has not yet been robustly developed as a theory of mind. Indeed, it might not be apparent to all observers that there are at least two and arguably three distinct strains of panpsychist thought in the philosophy today. Some views hold that consciousness is inherent in matter as mass, while others as more restrictive, limiting subjective experience to either informational computation or biological systems. Here now she'll examine the similarities and differences among these views, as well as arguments for and against each. Special considerations will be given to what I deem the chalmers strawson divide, a cluster of important conceptual tensions between two of the most influential voices in the nascent panpsychist movement, largely unexplored in the literature. These tensions microcosmically reflect larger debates in the philosophy of mind and may pose a significant challenge to those to the project of establishing a consistent and viable theory of panpsychism. Finally, we'll offer some tentative suggestions for a theory, a development of such a theory. So I won't be talking much about panpsychism today. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into monism, um, but monism and panpsychism are in many ways sister theories. So it's one to get those off my desk top. Uh, you know, here's David Chalmers who, uh, has a whole bunch of papers and PowerPoints and we can review of Church of Entropy. Um, in the past, we have uh, you know, read through many of Chalmers' PowerPoints and gone through his slides. So uh, just uh, people more interested. So modern day debate starting in less than an hour has the Thorpes, uh, Grace and Ben Thorpe, who uh, yeah, I met a few months ago, already a hundred people Waiting should be a lively program. So Ben and Grace finally got their big break. Um, that uh, Grace got on the Destiny program and will be debating on Stephen Crowder, Innocent, Destiny, Not So Erudite versus Grace Thorpe and Ben Thorpe. So Grace was on Destiny and then did a post show. And I was the first guest to congratulate her. And now you see her subscribers went way up. And uh, she got from like 900 subs to over 2,000 subs. And uh, so people could sub to Grace and Ben Thorpe, new debaters on the scene. Ben Thorpe also, like in Rhode Island, um, Catholic, interesting character, 940 subs, almost at 1,000 also. So they will be concurrently on Modern Day Debate starting in a few minutes. Um, I popped on AMC's, Amy's, uh, open panel last night. I didn't prepare a presentation, but she had an open panel on, uh, you know, just random John Wolf was there. So we had an interesting conversation talking about, uh, you know, like street life and some degeneracies and pickup culture and, uh, various topics. So it was, a uh, relatively a shorter problem program, just uh, two hours. Um, so I had Michael over for another introduction to Jewish prayer, part three, and we covered the blessings of the Kriya Shema and uh, the Shema. And uh, we did quite a bit of the Hebrew, some of the Sabbath, uh, El Adon. I didn't have a chance to timestamp it yet. Hopefully I'll do that tomorrow. And this Thursday, we will continue with Shimon Esrei. So the series is uh, going well, thank God. Um, I went to the Ceramics Expo. So, uh, you know, it's uh, convention season. This Wednesday is some sort of uh, business expo. And uh, I sold something. But uh, yeah, the Small Business Expo in Detroit is this Sunday. And uh, so, I mean, this Wednesday, so hopefully I'll stream from there. And then the, the Automate Conference is coming up the week after, the two weeks from then. That should be pretty interesting, a bunch of uh, robotics. So uh, the Ceramics and Thermal Management Expo and it was pretty interesting. Like it was the first time the show was here, you know, materials, uh, ceramics. I like, I'd heard the word ceramics. I, I hadn't really even known what ceramics meant. Like, 
because you know, I thought it just meant like pottery or the type of you know, things where you buy like ceramics. Uh, uh, but I guess ceramics has a technical definition as any various hard, brittle, heat resistance and corrosion resistant materials made by shaping and then firing an inorganic, non metallic material such as clay at a higher temperature. So uh, this was industrial ceramics and they had the thermal management and so manufacturing processes, material uh, refinement. So you had an interesting ramble. Uh, also a lot of Koreans, like so notice the, yeah, I think I mentioned that last week. And so this show also um, a lot of Koreans. So it's an interesting shift in, I mean, there's been quite a few Koreans, but I guess uh, a decline in uh, Chinese and an increase in Koreans you know, due to uh, global politics. Duvid is now on Rumble, and I don't have any subs. Like, you know, I'm, I'm my only sub. So if anyone is on Rumble, you could sub to Duvid. And I'm trying to put over my videos. And you can see I have, like, I mean, it could be they're going to allow me to upload all of my videos to Rumble. I did it a few days ago, and they've only done one so far. So uh, you know, maybe if I get a few more subs, that will uh, go quicker. So if anyone's on Rumble, uh, you know, please sub to Duvid, and uh, you know, maybe I'll figure out to the simulcast. But uh, yeah, I figure with all the potential censorship, you know, just backup video, free backup of my videos, I will put myself on to Rumble. So we'll see how long it takes for the videos to upload or see if I get any subs. Yeah, Odyssey. Yeah, I'm on Odyssey now also. Um, the Week in Reviews don't go to Odyssey because they have a maximum of uh, um, they have a maximum of like two hours or something like that. So um, any of the programs that are like less than two hours get transferred over. Um, but anything longer than that um, doesn't get on my Odyssey. And you know, like Odyssey, I only have like 17 subs, hardly any watches. So, uh, you know, God forbid. But, you know, I put myself on Odyssey anyways. Um I was looking at this today, foliation. Um, this is mathematical. I was I was looking into uh, uh, the physics of time and space, and you know, so there's more complicated mathematics. So you know, I don't know Church of Entropy anymore. We'll see what happens if she gets her Sundays back. Uh, but you know, just something I was looking into foliation. It's more complicated mathematical concept. Uh, I mentioned this to Luke Ford. So, you know, there's the big writer strike. So, like, Night Court had their last episode. Um, a, just Frank, how's it going? So, yeah, Hollywood, the writer strike. And a lot of these shows are going straight to repeat. Like, uh, you know, the night shows, Jimmy Fallon, um, Night Court, uh, a lot of the sitcoms. And I didn't realize how dependent they were on screenwriters. You think like night nighttime television, even comedy, that uh, you know, maybe people write this stuff themselves or would be capable, but uh, the writer strike causing mostly shows just to shut down. So I thought that was interesting. I mentioned it to Luke Ford in Hollywood. I'm not sure if you mentioned that, but uh, you know, thought you know, we'll see what happens with the writer strike. You know, there's financial problems with competition from TV and streaming and, you know, YouTube independent sources. And, uh, you know, like the Colbert Report, Kimmel, uh, Fallon. And I don't watch any of those programs anyways, but I mean, maybe that's part of the reason why you think like, like those people are, are kind of just actors. They don't even write their stuff. I'm not sure if like Fox News, you know, like, you know, the Tucker thing. I didn't mention anything on Tucker, but... Uh, um, you know, he had the department, and I mean, presumably they have some writing, maybe his monologue, people doing research. Uh, but uh, you don't know, think that most of those like late night comedy 
television shows are like completely written by screenwriters, even like Saturday Night Live, that uh, you know, like God forbid, it's only one week, you know, like uh, like week uh, the the newscast is only like ten minutes once a week, and like you would think the comedians write that stuff themselves, but like no, it's completely dependent on screenwriters. So I was kind of surprised about that. Um, the Boring Company, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying they deserve, like, I mean, you know, I favor the screenwriters or whatever. I was just surprised that they actually had to shut down all these shows because of the strike. Like, you you would think, like, Saturday Night Live, like, uh, their week, week weekend update or something like that. It's only, like, 10 minutes that, uh, you know, the comedians or something could do it themselves, but they're completely dependent on screenwriters. Um, I was kind of shocked, uh, but, you know, maybe it makes sense. And I don't even watch that anyway, so like you know, God forbid. So yeah, the Tesla Space. I'm I'm a regular viewer of this new YouTube channel, the Tesla Space, and they had an update on the Boring Company, and uh, you know the Boring Company in Las Vegas, and uh, they've actually bored quite a bit. They bored like 60 miles, and uh, you know they might have something ready, uh, you know like subways or something in las vegas coming soon and then like elon musk like workers city uh in texas for his workers so interesting updates i've been watching basically all the videos that come out of this uh youtube channel like the tesla space um and you know related to the society of automotive manufacturing your know, tesla has been a big disruptor game changer in manufacture in general so uh and they're not necessarily present at the mainstream conventions in Detroit that uh, you know, they appear to have alternative uh, methods and means than the classical you know, like uh, engineering societies. Um, I saw this new webpage, Ground, a news source. And it looked a little bit interesting because they collected together... Um, all of uh, the various, so, I mean, God forbid, um, you know, God forbid there was a shooting. P people probably heard of that. And uh, gunmen in Texas, mall shooting, may have had neo-Nazi beliefs. Marcinio Garcia is a, a local resident, probably Hispanic. Um, and then you could, you know, so this webpage that collects together the various news stories and rates it of from far left to far right and you could see you know the bias distribution in terms like you know cnn msnbc cbs the independent los angeles times um you know daily beast to on the right uh, the gateway pundit um the toronto sun red state fox news washington examiner and so on all these various issues they are comparing how the news is covered. Um, so some sort of statistical um, distribution. So you're just an inter interesting idea. So, um, you know, it's like Ukraine or various things, but, you know, just an interesting idea to aggregate all of the different news news uh, channels carrying the story, to rate them left to right, and then compare how they're covering the story of this new page ground news. So, uh, yeah, I, I just watched that 10-minute video on the test of news place. I'm not an expert on what's going on with the boring, boring machines, but I thought it was a little bit interesting. Here, Rick Beato... Um, a new era of AI music. So Rick Beato, he was going over, I guess they have this new like Drake song that uh, was written by AI. And, you know, people are saying like, it's better than Drake. It sounds like Drake. And the direction of AI music and also the question of copyrights is who owns the copyrights to AI music. And uh, so it's an interesting conception you know, one, what's the current state of AI music? 
how accurately could they represent voices that stuff like like Paul McCartney to using um, like a, a younger Paul McCartney uh, versus the you know the current now Paul, you know boomer Paul McCartney's voice or adding John Lennon into um, to splice John Lennon onto Paul McCartney's new songs and you the biggest questions these days is actually <coughs> copyright and uh, like who who makes the money um who owns the person's voice does the ai um i think rick, rick beato gets i don't know if he gets copyright strikes like i think he just gets demonetized or has to share the profit i'm not exactly sure I mean, he seems to be up he complains like about copyright but i'm not sure he gets like strikes he might just get demonetized or the profit from his video. So like if you play music from another site, um, some places will strike you, like Guns N' Roses will strike you. So he talks a lot about it. So like certain bands will like not let you use their music in any circumstance at all. Certain bands will let you use their music and the money just goes to them so that they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be informed. And it's actually, I'd mentioned the Parsons algorithm the father of Alan Parsons from the Alan Parsons project had created the Parsons uh, algorithm, which looks at music just as you know, going up and down to recognize music, but they could recognize the music in the video and from there link it to its uh, copyrighted source. And then the money from the Rick Beato video, uh, instead of going to him, would go to the owner of the copyright, although you know he sells his Beato book or other forms uh, that, that uh, you know, so even if his, um, he doesn't make the money from the YouTube advertisements, he still probably gets super chats and, uh, you know, sales of his book or whatever. But, uh, you yeah, so I, be I believe that some people let them use the music and, uh, you know, some people will just take the copyright and some, some people will strike you. And uh, like, so he's mentioned like Guns N' Roses is uh, one of those, like they'll strike you. If you, you if you do it uh, so that's actually a topic Rick Beato talks about quite often um, God forbid God forbid God forbid new Jeffrey Epstein stuff out this week specifically um, more of his travel log or like diary um, new book and it has a lot more names and meetings including Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky was asked about it, and he basically was like, none of your business. And there's a lot of uh, more like Larry Summers and uh, other people that were meeting with um, Jeffrey Epstein up through like 2015, 16. And, and I think the consensus was no one thought Noam Chomsky was really a good guy. Noam Chomsky has some opinions like on the left, he criticizes uh, the U.S. government. He criticizes Israel. But like on a personal level, Noam Chomsky is not known to be a nice or good guy. Um, like even Steven Pinker, um, like his protege, Steven Pinker, even says, you know, basically Chomsky is not a very nice person. Um, almost everyone who knows Chomsky says bad things about him, God forbid. Like so he's a genius. He has his anti-establishment politics um but like that he kept relations with epstein and is still unapologetic for it and was like you know I'll do whatever i want none of your business um not surprising and then you know i saw ryan dawson was on fresh and fit so uh you know ryan dawson on fresh and fit they got uh you know like a ton of views so sneeko hooked uh, dawson up on fresh and fit and then fresh and fit on rumble um, you know, they're doing like a whole series and getting uh, hundreds of thousands of views, 325,000 views. So, I mean, you're taking like, you know, Kevin Barrett on the, the Ooms report was, uh, you're, you're talking about, um, is Chomsky really like an Israeli shill? And so there is some element where, you know, like Chomsky's really like meeting with A.U. Barak. And these other people, he's just criticizing Israel, but at the same time, um, and I think, I think that guy Brandon Martinez, 
you know, said like, like Chomsky is really like a gatekeeper for Israel. Although, you know, from a Jewish pro-Israel perspective, Noam Chomsky is anti-Israel. Uh, but from like the anti-Israel perspective, Noam Chomsky is kind of like a gatekeeper. So, uh, you know, it was interesting that that came out more Jeffrey Epstein stuff, God forbid. And, uh, you know, pro probably like an ego thing. You know, it's like you could be wealthy and powerful. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side or people always want what they don't have. And in terms of promiscuity, um, you just, God forbid, God forbid. So more stuff coming out on that. There'll probably be continuing more stuff that <coughs> comes out. <coughs> okay, so uh, more ADL statistics in uh, – Analysis of how friends, family, religious institutes, talk radio, and pop culture, politicians, and social media predict anti-Jewish and anti-Israel attitudes. And you see how often people hear anti-Jewish comments from various sources, um, more from TV, movie, politicians, social media, news, than friends and family in general that uh, – you know, generally, like anti-Semitism is relatively small, and it's not that common for people to personally hear anti-Semitic stuff. Although it's relatively common, you know, saying like uh, you know, still like one out of uh, you know twenty twenty-five percent of people uh, regularly hear anti-Semitic stuff. Uh, you know, even from family, friends, religious organizations, um, but m you know more from politics and TV. Um, you anti-Israel was only slightly higher. Um, but here was the key thing of their relations. Like if you hear things from closer people, you're more likely to believe in more anti-Semitic tropes. Like so for their measure of how anti-Semitic people are by you know so how many of the tropes do people believe in? And so if you hear regularly anti-Semitic things from your friends and family, you're significantly more likely to fall into anti-Semitism yourself than just seeing anti-Semitic stuff in like TV, media, uh, social media, uh, the news. Uh, talk radio has the biggest influence, religious organizations, but most specifically friends and family that uh, hearing anti-Semitic -Sem things from friends and family has a huge influence on people. Um, but you can see philo-Semitism. Percent of respondents that have at least family member or friend that likes Jews. 70% of the people polled had, uh, you represented of Americans in general, have a philo-Semitic friend or family. Um, only 20% have anti-Semitic friends or family. So it's substantial that... Uh, you know, one out of five Americans has a family member or a, a friend that actively dislikes Jews, God forbid. However, three and a half times more have a family member or friend that likes Jews. Um, although only half of uh, Americans actually have interaction with Jews. And 40% of Americans have a Jewish family member or friend. And then, you know, the effect of that, that uh, in, in terms of uh, believing anti-Semitic tropes. So just the latest uh, ADL survey. So their conclusion, researchers found that one's relationship with family and friends seems to play a highly significant role in driving one's attitudes. Um, so like really relatively obvious that, uh, you know, media, uh, social media, public sentiment, if you know Jews, if you know people who like Jews, you're not likely to be anti-Semitic. If you know people that dislike Jews, you're substantially more likely to be anti-Semitic. And uh, you know, things like media, uh, social media, politics does not actually have as big an effect as personal relationships. Um, Science of Consciousness Conference coming up in 
two weeks. So God forbid, Duvid did not get to the Science of Consciousness conference. It was part of uh, you know, the breakdown of Week in Review, and it was a direction I was trying to move towards that uh, was unsuccessful towards. Jennifer had less interest in it. Uh, last year, we paid to go online. Um, it didn't seem that much benefit to be online in like the chat, and they put out the videos a few months later, so I will not be paying for online again this year, but uh, they have released the schedule and the complete booklet. So here is the the schedule, uh, Monday workshops, um, Tuesday, they they have nine uh, planet, uh, planetariums and only two keynotes. So I have to look at you know, David Chalmers um, and either the posters and coherence and um, you have various things so the panels on uh, quantum brain biology, phenomenal experience, neuroscience, hallucinations, AI and consciousness, intentionality, consciousness and uh, evolution, uh, electromagnetism and resonance theories, and free will with uh, Sir Roger Penrose. Their keynote, I guess the first keynote maybe they had back out if it was supposed to be Christopher Koch. I forget who their keynote, they said there was going to be there's a trip to the Etna Mountain on Saturday. Um, so I had kind of wanted to go to it, but you know, didn't work out. And uh, but uh, yeah, I will look forward to seeing the program afterwards. So I guess. Roger Penrose was supposed to be a keynote. Maybe maybe he won't be. And uh, you have some interesting names. So I've been following this for a few years now. Know quite a few of the names. I would have been interesting to uh, go and meet the people and uh, you know network, make connections, stream. Uh, but it was expensive, and I didn't have it together to do it. And you could see the... Uh, You know, the various things. So here, their booklet is a full 300 pages. So I will probably cover that again next week. So I, I think they just had, last time I looked, the booklet wasn't online. So, you know, the booklet is 400 pages, and uh, you, you has all of the synopsis, abstracts, uh, your full schedule, and you know, the concurrence. And so I didn't have a chance to read through this yet. I think they just released it recently. So hopefully next week, I will, you know, during the week this week, I will read through. And then next week, I will try to highlight some of the interesting things to uh, you know, that they'll be covering. And uh, you know, when they do eventually come out with the videos, I will definitely watch the videos and share that. But uh, you know, unfortunate, you know, two weeks uh, from today, they have uh, John Joe McFadden, um, Anirban Bandia Padhe, um, you know, spoke uh, last year, and uh, Michael Silverstein. I have a paper from Michael Silverstein that I might be reading today from Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, on uh, dual aspect uh, neutral monism, uh, panpsychism. So a lot of the names in monism that I'll be mentioning today in my uh, you know, research part of the program are people that have participated in the Science of Consciousness Conference. Okay, so this week I prepared a song analysis, and I would put this as one of probably the top five most famous songs ever, uh, classical music, opera,
Carmina Brana Ofertruna. And you know, the Carmina Brana, the from the 254 poems, um, some going back to the 11th, 12th, 13th century, many written by monks in Latin um, that were finally set to opera by Karl Orff in the 1935 is one of the most popular classic music pieces. It's in countless movies. It's uh, it's you know, very often recorded. Um, you know, background. You know, it's, it's you know it's Gothic. It's in Latin. A lot of the Carmina Brana poems are actually like about drinking and degenerate things. However, um, it was written by monks. So when I was in high school i took latin and we translated carmina brana o fortuna and uh you know that was a long time ago i was just looking at it uh, uh this week and so i thought i would examine it so you know it has a a musical accompaniment to a full symphony and opera and uh you know, has the like the timfani and the big drums pounding and uh you know so it Duvid will do my best to you know, chant it singularly. It's a relatively simple chant, although it goes high. So the high part, uh, you know, God forbid, um, yeah, I may not be able to chant that well. And you know, although it was written by monks, it more mirrors like Roman poetry, talking about like fate and. Uh, than a clear Christian message. And, you know, it starts out operatic and then goes into a low-level chant. So the first two stanzas, the first three three verses of the first stanzas in a high, and maybe people will recognize it. And then the, the first two stanzas here are in like a monotone um and then the third one is is higher significantly higher oh fortuna well let luna start to vary valleys semper crisis Ot decresis vita detestabilis nuncum durat et tuncurat ludo mentis aciem ego statem postestatem dissolitu glaciem Sorsimanis et dinanis ratu tu volubilis. Status malus vanus alus semper disalubilis. O bum rata et vilata Michi kukoi teris nunc per lutum dorsum nutum viro tui sigleris sor salutis et virtutis michi nunc contraria es affectus et defectus Semper in Angaria. Aki hora, sene mora, corde pulsum tangite. Cod per sortem, sternet fortem, vecum amnes plangite. So, God forbid, do did my best there. Um, it was meant to be chanted with a chorus and has, you know, divided into you know, like baritones and sopranos. Uh, the words are kind of interesting, like uh, fate and, uh, 
you know, the wheels of fate. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of related to monism and free will and more romantic than Christian, although it was written by monks. It doesn't go back to Roman times, but kind of praying to the God of fate. Okay, so I have a lot of material there this week. So I'll put the link in the chat. In case anyone wants to come on and talk, maybe uh, Michael will come around later and uh, you'll see if my voice holds up because I have a ton of articles, a lot of research on monism. And you know, it's pretty important. It's the direction you yeah, are moving. You know, so we can review, you know, God forbid, weak, weak uh, viewership here. So, uh, you know, even if no one tunes in, you know, just the research to, you know, get through these papers, push forward, and, uh, you know, I have some intentions here of what I'm trying to do. So, you know, just, you know, some of the weekend reviews, some of the things I found interesting, you know, God forbid, Jennifer, um, schedule fell apart. So, um, to be able to do it, uh, you know, the regular Sunday time. So, I'm doing it by myself, similar to how I did Week in Review, just with no backup. So I didn't reach out to any guests or anything um, because I really just have a lot of research to share. So, you know, I wouldn't mind having guests if anyone you know, is watching or wants to come on and uh, join. They're more than welcome. Um, but, you know, more just to push forward some of my research. People could watch it after and... Uh, you know, I'll timestamp it. And so let me just pour myself a cup of tea. Okay, so... Let's look quickly at some of the last few weeks of um, Week in Review. So this is the fourth week since I've gone solo. The first week, you know, I had Claire on, and I talked about monism from my own paper that I had written and I still have that essay, what I've read on monism. I haven't updated it. I have some books here. I'm in the middle of reading on monism. So, you know, here's on Hemholtz. We're going to talk more about Hemholtz and, you know, Wittgenstein and uh, his theory of perception, which relates to monism. Um, you'll hear the Mach, James, and Russell and you know, Ernst Mach as one of the precursors to monism to William James to um, Robert, uh, Bertrand Russell's formulations. And we're going to go over Bertrand Russell in more in depth. I'm still looking at this, uh, the history of the cognitive Re revolution by Howard Gardner. Um, I plan to write an essay and cover the cognitive revolution in more in depth. Uh, we talked about that in Week in Review with Church of Entropy quite a few times. Here's another book, Consciousness in the Physical World, Perspectives on Russellian Monism. And this has, it's like a reader starting with Leibniz. So hopefully this week I will do quite a bit more research on monism. But I thought, you know, this week I would go in-depth into it. So, you know, I did my science, philosophy of science series, the first five uh, of what hopefully will be a 10-part series. 
maybe the week after this, I will try to uh, return, put out more episodes in my philosophy of science, or it might wait a little bit just because I'm doing so much other research. So I talked about a lot about the conservation of energy, the history of the conservation of energy, um, and I mentioned biological theology in relation to my evolution debate. And in that sense, monism, I'm going to talk about Advaita this week also, like, uh, you know, Eastern philosophy, Hinduism, a monistic philosophy that's religious in nature. So like the Western modern scientific philosophical monism is not that theological in nature. It's more related to explaining scientific phenomenon, specifically the dualistic, you know, Cartesian divide that I've talked about many times where Descartes, uh, breaking the dualism from ancient times of the Aristotelian hylomorphism form and matter to mind and matter, or as Descartes would call extension and mind, cogitas and extension. And Descartes, by calling it extension, is unifying what used to be form and matter and then the separate realm would be consciousness and mind. And so science arises as the pure material phenomenon. Um, however, you with the rise of evolution and physics, you have an attempt, you, the creation of psychology, Kant, and all these things I discussed on my philosophy of science series, and we can review your know, back to church and entropy the last few months of neo-Kantianism, the Vienna School, uh, scientific realism of your know, metaphysics, of philosophical grounding of the nature of mind. So we talk about biological teleology purpose. How does function derive from form? So you have an architecture, you like form determines function, but you know, going back to Galen and Aristotle, form determining function. And historically, biology had a form of vitalism that it was believed that biological materials had a spirit, a vital spirit, and that vital spirit is what caused biological units to have function. And that was actually the mainstream view up until Hemholtz, um, you know, with the conservation of energy. And from there, I talked about um, the history of molecular biology. So, you know, I had stream of Amy, and I did the dangers that eat personality and went over that. And then I went in depth two weeks ago into the history of molecular biology and the rise of, so to say, scientific biology. And, and then last week, I did even more about the history of molecular biology. And I covered also the nature of friendship slides with uh, that I'd done with Amy and I'd Michael on, um, you know, the week before at Elliot on, we talked about selling books. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I talked about more about the history of molecular biology, the Rockefeller Foundation. If uh, Daniel's watching this or tunes in, and he says he's writing a book about the Wallenbergs, happy to interview you. That'd be an interesting book. I don't know that much about the Wallenberg. I mean, I know the Wallenberg Group is one of the biggest uh, banks, funders of science, probably more so than Rockefeller today. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting topic. But I talked last week in depth about Schrodinger's What is Life? And uh, so I'm just trying to put this all together. So 
you know, why I'm going in depth into monism and how it ties together. So Hemholtz was a monist. Hemholtz was also a neo-Kantian. And so I'd mentioned when I was talking about monism, what they call neutral aspect monism. Yeah, you, you Paul Shalom. Um, and to you know, the concept, you know, obviously materialism and the philosophy of science, I read through the whole Stanford encyclopedia on physicalism and your know, dualism in the Cartesian sense that there's a realm of mind and a realm of matter and physicalism to say that matter is the only thing that exists. So monism says there's one primordial element you're referred to as the monad that gives rise to both mind and matter. And so we're going to talk more about there's like spiritual monism that's in relation to like religion and God. And you're know, saying like, uh, however, scientific monism doesn't focus on God and spirituality. It focuses on the concept of mind, theology, and secondary properties. So we say like uh, color. So if you say like, you know, Newton talking about masses operating in space over time, mass is the primary, uh, like mass and shape, uh, temperature, the scientific quantities are the primary qualities. The secondary qual qualities would refer to taste, um, color, and purpose. And you could have other things listed in it. And already like Leibniz and Descartes talk about that. And like from a dualistic sense, you would say that from, but uh, from the monistic sense, you say that matter cannot give rise to secondary qualities. So the monad, I mean, you could argue some of from a physicalist perspective, the secondary qualities emerge from the physical and probably in the future, maybe in the near future, I will go in depth into emergentism and, uh, either I've, I've talked about my, my, uh, philosophy of science, you know, there's like supervenience and, uh, um, I'm forgetting the other terms, but there's a few, you know, theories like emergentism from a physical perspective that try to explain where these secondary qualities derive from, from a physical perspective. Um, you say it's difficult. It's very difficult to derive secondary qualities from physicalism and something like consciousness, thought, um, perception, emotions. You might have physical correlates uh, neural correlates of consciousness, physical correlates to the secondary qualities. However, there's no direct way to show where they come from. And even, you know, the concept of information in general, what is information? A question like mathematics, where does uh, things like mathematics and information uh, dwell if you're a materialist? So the theory of monism is that there is a primary substance that gives rise to both mental and physical qualities. That there's one, it could be, you know, atomic, you like you would call it like the monad, like the atom, the monad that gives rise to both material and mental properties. Or and You'll, from the schools of monism, you could be more mental leaning to, so to say, the monad that gives rise to both mental and physical is more closer to mental, and that is generally referred to idealism, idealistic monism, or naturalistic monism, 
where something physical is, it's closer to physical that gives rise to both properties. Or you have neutral aspect monism where there's something neutral that is neither mental nor physical that gives rise to both. And so I mentioned two weeks ago that Helmholtz, William James, Ernst Mach, Bertrand Russell um, had ideas for what could this be? What could be this thing that gives rise to both the mental and the physical? And that's you know, what's referred to as neutral aspect monism. So it's a big topic. There's a lot to cover. So, you know, there's a lot to read. Um, so, you know, someone comes around and wants to talk, I'll take a break and we have a conversation. Other than that, I have over 10 papers I want to read good, uh, good portions from. So let's jump right in. And you'll first look at This was a conference, Quantum Physics Meets Philosophy of Mind, in 2013. And these are all theories of monism. So, you know, I'm going to circle back. So, I'm going to you know, come back to the history of monism, uh, you know, long articles on the history of monism. I mentioned some of that two weeks ago. So, I'm going to go in depth onto the origins of monism. And, you know, including the Eastern origins, like Advaita philosophy, and its comparison to what we'll call Western monism. And then there's a whole bunch of schools of monism. And monism has sister theories of panpsychism and pantheism and panentheism. So hopefully we'll look also at some of those. So this first one is Bob Doyle from Harvard University Department of Astronomy talking about um, information as the possibility. So I have quite a few of these. Some of these are going to read through the majority of them and take a long time. Some I'm just going to you know, read through tiny parts. The problem of mental causation depends heavily on the idea of causal closure of the world under laws of nature. If everything that is caused has a physical cause, what room is there for mental causes? Must mental events be eliminated, reduced to physicalism at best, and epiphenomenalism at worst? The central question in the classic mind-body problem is how can an immaterial mind move a material body if the causal chains are limited to interactions between physical things? We propose a model or theory of an immaterial mind as the pure information in the biological information processing system that is the brain and central nervous system. We show how this model can support a non-reductive physicalism and an emergent dualism. Information is physical but immaterial. It is neither matter nor energy although it needs matter for its temporary embodiment and energy for its communication, for example, to other minds or for storage in the external environment. Indeterminism in quantum physics breaks the strict causal chains that have been used to reduce biological phenomenon to physics and chemistry and mental events to neural events, but statistical causes remain and they are more than adequate to support the idea of self-determination. Our information theory of mind is a powerful alternative to the computational theories popular in cognitive science. Biological information processors are profoundly different from digital computers. We argue against neurobiological reductionism and physical bottom-up causation. At the same time, we defend a supervenient statistical downward causation that allows free thoughts, mental events that are not predetermined by past events in the law of nature, to cause willed actions. Actions are ultimately statistical, but adequately determined by our motives, reasons, intentions, 
desires, and feelings, in short, by our character. Our actions are thus determined for practical purpose is but self-determined with at least some of the causes originating inside our minds. We defend an emergent dualism of mind and matter, subject and object, idealism and materialism. Monists might like the idea that information is a neutral quantity that can ground a triple aspect, monism of matter, life, and mind. Information itself is an emergent that did not exist in the early universe. We will show that information structures emerge in three ways and in a temporal sequence corresponding respectively to matter, life, and mind. First is the emergence of order out of chaos that has given rise to complexity and chaos theories that try to explain life as a complex adaptive system. Ilya Prigongain won a Nobel Prize for far from equilibrium dissipated processes that produce information structures like Bernard convection cells. He called it order out of chaos. These complex systems have no internal information processing their dumb structures. They do, however, exert a gross downward causation over their physical parts. Second is the emergence of order out of chaos, order out of order. Erwin Schrodinger showed that all life feeds on stream of negative entropy from the sun. He called that order out of order. Biological processes rearrange this information in the negative entropy to create and maintain themselves. Their information processing systems, their downward causation is extremely fine, meaning they can cause exert causal control over component atoms and molecules individually. Third is the emergence of pure information of order. Abstract information is the stuff of thought. It is the lingua franca, the currency, the coin of the philosophical realm. Mental processes create and store abstract information in the brain hardware. At the neuron level, atoms and molecules are exquisitely controlled by neurobiology to enable nerve firings and to record information. The core of our information theory of mind is an experience recorder and producer reproducer, the experience recorder and reproducer stores information or neural networks about all perceptual elements, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell of an experience along with our emotions during the experience. They are stored in whatever neurons fire together. Later new perceptual elements that fire the same or nearby neurons can activate the neural network to replay the original experience complete with its emotional content. The unconscious mind is a blooming, buzzing confession, confusion, and of these reproduced experiences, some of which we focus our attention, we identify four evolutionary stages in the development of an experience recorder and reproducer that exhibits consciousness. So if you remember, hey, Amy, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. God bless. So if you remember last week, you know, I read an article about Erwin Schrodinger's What is Life? And it was mentioning information theory, that Schrodinger hypothesized DNA before the discovery of DNA in terms of a biological mechanism that could store information. And, you know, so this theory here is monistic in a sense where the key is information and information having your know, element of physical and mental and it has some basics on quantum physics and the collapse of the wave equation and trying to reduce the collapse of the wave function to a form of information. And uh, you know, so information is a non-reductive physicalism. Um, so here... He's quoting Donald Davidson in his anomalous monism. Mental events such as perceiving, remembering decisions and actions resist capture in the nomological net of physical theory. How can this fact be reconciled with the causal role of mental events in the physical world? Reconciling freedom with causal determinism is a special case of the problem. If we suppose the causal determinism entails captures in and freedom requires escape from the nomological net, but the broader issue can remain alive, even for someone who believes a correct analysis of free action reveals no conflict with determinism. Autonomy, freedom, self-rule may or may not clash with determinism. Anomaly is, it would seem, another matter. Davidson developed the following set of arguments. At least some mental events interact causally with physical events. Where there is causality, there must be a law. Events related as cause and effect fall under strict deterministic law. There are no strict deterministic laws on the basis of which mental events can be predicted and explained. 
So Davidson falls into the theory of supervenience, which theoretically allows for something that emerges, namely um, thought to inversely have a causal relation. So say if thought is not material, thought arises from the material. However, the thought can go back and affect the material. And you know, I mentioned also the reverse anthropomorphization related to how computers work and assuming that the human mind would work in a similar method to the way computers work. So this is interesting. It's something I'll return to in the future as we get more into the physics end. So your consciousness and the experiencer, recorder, reproducer, consciousness can be defined in informational terms as an entity that reacts to information in its environment in the context of information philosophy, we can define this as information consciousness. This, thus, an animal in deep sleep is not conscious because it ignores changes in the environment, and robots may be conscious in our sense. Even the lowliest control system using negative feedback is, in a minimal sense, conscious of changes in the environment. The definition of consciousness fits with our model of mind as an experienced recorder and reproducer. The ERR model stands is a major alternative to the popular cognitive science or computational model of the mind as a digital computer. No algorithms or stored programs are needed for the ERR model. The physical metaphor is a nonlinear linear, random access data recorder where data is stored using content addressable memory, simpler than a computer with stored algorithms. A better technological metaphor might be a video and sound recorder enhanced with the ability to record smells, tastes, touches, and critically essential feelings. The biological model is neurons that wire together during an organism's experience in multiple sensory and limbic systems, such that the later firing or even in part of the wired neurons can stimulate firing of all or parts of the original complex. So this goes on and on, and let me just look here. The four levels of consciousness, you have instinctive consciousness by animals with little or no learning capability, Automatic reactions to environmental conditions are transmitted genetically. Information about past experiences by prior generations of the organism is only present implicitly in the inherited reactions. Learn consciousness for animals whose past experiences guide current choices. Conscious but mostly habitual reactions are developed through experience, including instruction by parents and peers. Predictive consciousness, the sequencer in the ERR system, can play back beyond the current situation, allowing the organism to use imagination and foresight to evaluate the future consequences of its choices, and reflective normative consciousness in which consciousness deliberation about values influences the choice of behavior. And the determinism itself is an emergent property. Determinism itself emerges as the universe evolves. Determinism did not exist in the early universe of pure radiation and subatomic particles when all interaction of particles and matters where quantum mechanical indeterministic, when small numbers of atoms and molecules interact, the motions and behavior are indeterministic, governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. However, when large numbers of microscopic particles get together in aggregates, the indeterminacy of the individual particles gets averaged over, and macroscopic adequacy deterministic laws emerge. This allows macroscopic systems to exert downward causal control on their indeterministic atomic and molecular components, macroscopic systems, and making the transition from quantum to classical effectively suppress the indeterminism. And so this also has a evolutionary perspective, a Big Bang perspective. Um, so this is something I'm going to return to, and it's going to be extremely important when I get more into the hard problem of consciousness and the different theories of mind. So, you know, just a little precursor there on some of the stuff that I will be getting more in depth into. So let's jump into now um, Advaita, Eastern philosophy. Um, monism has 
some precursor history in the West in the ancient Greeks and the Kabbalist, but monism is most thoroughly developed in Eastern systems. And although Advaita literally means non-dualism, um, that many people understand Advaita as monism. So, yeah, John Williams, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Okay, so let's look at this article I found here from um, Shashikant Padalkar on monism, and it's from 2003. I was looking for some you know, good material on the subject, and this one seemed you know, reasonably comprehensive. So it starts with the verses in the Rig Veda that are interpreted to mean monism. Ashaldya Sukha is notable, uh, it's a part of the Rig Veda, is notable for using the term tatikam, that one, for the origin and for its open position on the creation creator, the seeds of monism, and agnosticism can be seen in the Sukta. Vedic monism, uh, Asadhya Sukta, that one, is followed by various shades of monism in later Vedas. Orthodox monism traces the whole of existence to a single source. It sees only one eternal reality and views world as its appearance. Supra monism sees all inclusive reality, both existence, sat, and non-existence, asat, are part of it. Pantheism equates creator with creation. It sees God not as transcending nature, but imminent in it. Monotheism separates creator and creation. Creator creates, controls, and destroys, merges with its own creation. Metaphysically, all these views converge if we accept the relativity of reality. We call this convergence as relativistic monism. Vedic monism is based on the theme of Brahman and Atman. The word Brahman originates from the Sanskrit verb uh, Bria, similar to the Hebrew uh, bore, like a bracious to create, which means to grow or to burst forth. Originally, Brahman was used to describe the mystical powers of mantras. It was later used in the Upanishads to describe the source of the universe or the one eternal reality. Atma in Rig Veda is mentioned as breath or life force. Gradually, it acquired the meaning of self or soul. Uh, Upanishad is together from the word sad, sit near upa and ni devotedly. To sit near devotedly, Upanishad, to acquire knowledge from the guru. Upanishads are also known as Vedanta, uh, meaning the end of Veda. Upanishadic Brahman is said to be one alone without a second. It is pure awareness. It is, it is reality, knowledge, infinity. Uh, satyam, it is pure existence, consciousness, peace, satchitananda, it is all-pervading, it is eternal, nitya, it is unalterable, it cannot be perceived by the senses, it is without any attributes, nirguna, it is the annulment of all phenomenon, it is indescribable, neti neti, it is the self within all, it is the self innermost immortal, it is the witness consciousness, if it shines, all these shine. Through its radiance, all these become manifest. All this is barely Brahman. Upanishads describe a cosmic Brahman, which is a tribute list and beyond space, time, and causality. Upanishads also describe cosmic Brahman, which is all comprehending, all pervading, and causal. The idea of Brahman has been propagated in Upanishads. Um, Multiple Upanishads, the main element of monism based on Brahman and Atman appear to be established by 5th, cent 5th century BC in the earlier Upanishads. Some later Upanishads are monotheistic. And by the 4th century AD, restored the primacy of Orthodox monism of the Upanishads. Uh, Brahma Sutras are extremely Laconic, hence were interpreted by later seers, including Shankara, Shankara, in their own ways. This gave Vedic monism the flexibility to be defended and developed through the unending advances of rational thinking. 
Advaita. Um, Gotapada in the 7th century and Shankaracharya in the 8th century interpreted the theme of Brahman to establish the Advaita non-dualism system of philosophy. In Advaita, a cosmic Brahman is the only absolute reality. Physical universe Jagat is an illusion which is apparent to Jiva, sentient being, under the spell of Maya. Maya is the inexplicable power by which Brahma appears as the Jagat, a flux of matter and causation. Jiva's innermost self, the Atman, is nothing but Brahman. Jiva cannot see the Brahman Atman unity due to ignorance, avidya, and limitation of body and mind, both being manifestations of Maya. When Jiva knows Brahman equals Atman unity, it attains the eternal state or fulfillment, uh, moksha, liberating itself from the cycle of rebirths. Advaita is known as Orthodox Vedanta, it being consistent with the monist spirit of the oldest Upanishads. Advaita, systematized by Shankaracharya, is known as the Kavel Advaita, the only Advaita. Later Advaita versions dispense with Maya's mysterious role, acknowledge Saguna Brahman as the principal reality, and inject theism. In pantheistic pure non-dualism, Brahman itself takes the form of physical world and souls. It in the scheme of organic pantheism, qualified non-dualism or uh, Brahman souls and world are real and different from each other, but latter two are organically dependent on the Brahman-like body is dependent on the soul. In dualistic non-dualism, souls and world are one with the Brahman, but at the same time different from it, like a ray is one with and different from the sun. Uh, Dvaita Dvaita is a supramonist theme where Brahman is assumed to be both cosmic and acosmic, suggesting that it is not exhausted itself in the creation of the universe. There is also a dualistic version of Advaita where Brahman souls and the world have independent existence, but latter two are subordinate to Brahman. In general, Indian philosophic mind has latched onto the idea of monism right from the days of Rig Veda till today for more than three millenniums. Western thought too arrived at similar ideas through Paramides, Plotinus, and later Berkeley, Spinoza, and Hegel. We can however safely say that the orthodox monism is the indigenous and one of the main themes of Indian philosophy. Inverted and relativistic monism. Buddhism and Jainism are Indic schools which do not trace their origins in Vedas. Buddhism, however, can be seen as bringing to a logical conclusion certain Upanishadic speculations, while Jainism has some commonality with Orthodox uh, Sankhya and Vaisheka schools. Both these schools have common trait of separating philosophical content from theological. Uh, Gautama Buddha, founder of Buddhism, and Vardhamana uh, Mahavira, protagonists of Jainism, were contemporaries in 6th century BC India. These two streams of heterodox philosophies, particularly Jainism, were present at the time of the oldest Upanishads in one form or the other. There are four major Buddhist schools which were established during the 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. Uh, there is a new reality in the Vabashika. Vaba there is a new reality against every instant of time. The Sat Antika reality can only be guessed. Yogachar Achara, reality is nothing but is it's knowledge. And Madhyamaka, there's no absolute reality as a corollary, only nothingness, uh, sunya or void, is beyond this appearance of this world. Uh, Madhyamaka Buddhism is also known as sunyavada or voidism. Sunya is much like Nirguna Brahman, but Madhyamaka does not acknowledge it is the substratum reality this scheme can also be termed as inverted monism because only becoming or flux has been granted reality while being has no reality. Being is equated with nothing or void. Jainism speculates seven combinations of realities out of it is, is asti, and nasti, not is, and unpredictable, uh, avak, yavyam, in this pluralism, realism, pluralistic realism, being, non-being, and probable can stand together to represent the composite reality of Syat. Sativada holds that all knowledge is probabilistic and conditionally true. Syat's reality is mutable, contextual, and relative, 
and Satyavada can also be termed as attributive monism or relativistic monism. Buddhism and Jainism are known as heterodox Indic schools as against orthodox Indic schools, namely Sankhya, Yoga, Nayana, Vaishika, Mimasa, and Advaita, except Advaita, no other Indic school shows clear monist absolutistic, absolutist non-dualistic tendency, though monotheistic tendencies are seen in Nayaya and Yoga schools. Indic schools other than Advaita, Naya, and Yoga are generally silent on God, while Advaita subordinates the god Ishvara by relegating it to the relative level. So this essay goes on, and you have some interesting things besides that, but uh, you just want an overview on the origins of monism in Eastern thought. And I'd mentioned some of the in my essay on chess and the Ahimsa principle, uh, also about the Jainism and the probabilistic truth related to the multiple truth hypothesis. So these are topics I'd like to return to. And there's many schools. Advaita is probably the most dominant school of Hinduism. You know, however, like the Hare Krishnas are non-Advaitists or even anti-Advaitists, and there's many criticisms of Advaita philosophy. However, Advaita could generally be seen as simple monism. And you know, so it's important to mention. So I have a lot of stuff to cover here. So um, a lot of this stuff is really interesting. And yeah, I want to go in depth. So let me talk about the Pauli Jung conjecture. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for tuning in. Um, so Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, of most notability for the Pauli exclusion principle is had psychological problems. Like, like he had a lot of issues, um, you know, God forbid, um, you know, his personal life uh, took a lot of weird turns. You know, he had drug habits and visit prostitutes, God forbid, his mother committed suicide. And he was a patient of, Jung, Carl Jung, who you know, I mentioned quite a few times on Amy's shows related to uh, your personality. And so he was a patient of Jung, and he had correspondence he wrote with Jung. And he developed, together with Jung, what referred to as the... Pauli Jung conjecture, and it's a form of monism that is derivative from Jung's theory of synchronicity. So I'm not sure if anyone in the chat, if they're familiar with the uh, Jung synchronicity, uh, you know, it's an important idea. And then working together with um, Wolfgang Pauli, who was a psychological patient, they developed a monistic theory referred to as the Pauli Jung conjecture. So let's just look briefly here at synchronicity. Synchronicity is a concept first introduced by analytical psychologist Carl Jung to describe circumstances that appear meaningfully related yet lack a causal connection. In contemporary research, synchronicity experiences refer to one's subjective experience that coincidences between events in one's mind and the outside world may be causally unrelated to each other, yet have some other unknown connection. Yun held that this was a healthy, even necessary function of the human mind that can become harmful within psychosis. So I'm thinking like, you're like Jennifer, I was just thinking of Jennifer, and then she appeared in the chat. So I mean, there could be explanations like statistical, probabilistic, predictive mind, or you know, like I have an omen that something good or bad is going to happen, and then something happens, or you know these type things. So we call a synchronicity, where a mental event correlates to a physical event, and there's no causal connection. That what like I was just thinking of uh, you know this person, then they called me. 
And so why would I be thinking of this person that they called me? Um, so Jung had developed this theory from psychology and then had mentioned it to his patient, Wolfgang Pauli. And Wolfgang Pauli came up with a monistic atom, atom, atomistic theory that we're going to talk about quite a bit. So Jung developed the theory of synchronicity as a hypothetical non-causal principle serving as the intersubjective or philosophical objective connection between these two singly meaningful coincidences. Mainstream science generally regards that any such hypothetical principle either does not exist or falls outside the bounds of science. At first coining the term in the late 1920s and early 30s, Jung further developed the concept in collaboration with the physicist and Nobel laureate Wolfgang Pauli uh, through long correspondence in their eventual 1952 work, The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche, which compromises, comprises one paper from each of the two thinkers. Their work together culminated in what is now called the pulley young conjecture. During his career, Jung furnished several different definitions of synchronicity, defining it as a hypothetical factor equal in rank to causality as a principle of, of explanation, an a-causal connecting principle, a-causal parallelism, and the meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than the probability of chance is involved. In Pauli's words, synchronicities were correlations to chance fluctuations by meaningful and purposeful coincidence of causality unconnected uh, events, though he had also proposed to move the concept away from coincidences towards instead a correspondence connection or constellation of discrete factors. Jung and Pauli's view was that just as causal connections can provide a meaningful understanding of the psyche and the world, so too many acausal connections. To, um, 2016 study found that two-thirds of therapists surveyed agreed that synchronicity experiences could be useful for therapy. Analytical psychologists likewise hold that individuals must come to understand the compensatory meaning of these experiences in order to enhance consciousness rather than merely build up superstitiousness. However, clients who disclose synchronicity experiences in a clinical setting often report not being listened to, accepted, or understood. Furthermore, the experiencing of an overabundance of meaningful coincidences characteristics of the earliest stages of schizophrenic delusion. Uh, Johansson and Osman write that the prevalent among many scientists, particularly psychologists, studying coincidence is the view that occurrences of coincidence as psychologically experienced is induced by noisy chance occurrences out in the world, which are then misconstrued via irrational cognitive biases into unfounded, possibly even paranormal beliefs in the mind. One study has shown that both counselors and psychoanalysts were less likely than psychologists to agree that chance coincidences was an adequate explanation for synchronicity, well, more likely than psychologists to agree that a need for unconscious material to be expressed could be an explanation for synchronicity experiences in the clinical setting. Jung used the context of synchronicity in arguing for the existence of the paranormal. The idea was similarly explored by the writer Arthur Kostler in his 1972 route, the work of Coincidence, Arthur Kostler, also known for the 13th Tribe and uh, 72 book, uh, Introduction to Theories of Parapsychology, including Extrasensory Perception and Psychokinesis. Uh, Kostler postulates links between modern physics, their interaction with time, and paranormal phenomenon. It was also taken up by the New Age movement. Unlike magical thinking, which believes causally unrelated events to have some paranormal causal connection, the synchronicity principle supposes that events may truly be causally unrelated yet have some unknown non-causal connection. The objection from a scientific standpoint, however, is that this is neither testable nor falsifiable and therefore does not fall within the realm of empirical study. Scientific skepticism regarded as pseudoscience, Jung stated that synchronicity events are nothing but chance occurrences from a statistical point of view, but are meaningful in that they may seem to validate paranormal ideas. However, no empirical studies of synchronicity experiences based on observable mental states and scientific data were conducted by Jung in order to draw his conclusions. Through some studies, though some studies have since done in this area, while a given observer may subjectively experience a coincidence as meaningful 
this alone cannot prove any objective meaning to the coincidence. Very statistical laws, such as Littlewood's law and the law of truly large numbers, show how unexpected occurrences can be more likely to encounter than people otherwise assume. These serve to explain coincidences such as synchronicity experiences as chance events, which have been misinterpreted by confirmation bias, spurious correlations, and or underestimated probability. So Jung was studying uh, you know, Chinese uh, philosophy where he came up with synchronicity. Um, I talk about synchronicity that when I debate atheist in relation to karma, and uh, you could relate like karma of what I would refer to as the reward of the righteous or the punishment of the wicked in like a synchronicity type uh, where I did a good deed and then something good happened to me, uh, that that could be considered a form of synchronicity. So Pauli, who was Jung's patient and developed into Jung's friend and eventually Jung's collaborator, together published a work together, uh, which is called the Pauli-Jung Conjecture, which is a form of monism. Pauli Jung conjecture. The Pauli Jung conjecture is a collaboration and meta theory between physicist Wolfgang Pauli and analytical psychologist Carl Jung centered on the concept of synchronicity. It was mainly developed between the years of 1946 and 54, four years between Pauli, before Pauli's deaths, and speculates on double aspect perspective within the disciples of both collaborators. Pauli additionally drew on various elements of quantum theory, such as complementarity, non locality, and the observer effect in his contribution to the project. Jung and Pauli thereby offered the radical and brilliant idea that the currency of these correlations is not quantitative statistics as in quantum physics, but qualitative meaning. Contemporary physicist uh, Philk writes that quantum entanglement being a particular type of a causal quantum correlation was plausibly taken by Pauli as a model for the relationship between mind and matter in the framework he proposed together with Jung. Specifically, quantum entanglement may be the physical phenomenon which most closely resembles, represents the concept of synchronicity. Okay, so this is an interesting concept and something that I'm going to return to, and I'll probably use the Jungian term from now on. You know, like I, I talk in karma, but I'll probably talk about synchronicity, um, you know, because it's an important concept. So let's look more in depth. So Harold... Atmenspacher is one of the main philosopher of mind monists today, dual aspect monists. And um, he was at the Science of Consciousness Conference in 2020 uh, with uh, Roger Penrose. And yeah, Amy, it happens to everybody. Um, it, you know, the sense that you'll call it like some, like call it deja vu. Or you're just like, you know, I was just thinking of Amy and then she called me. And you're saying, well, is it possible? I mean, I just hypothetically, but things like that happen all the time. I was just thinking of a person and then I bumped into them. And you know, say, well, it's just coincidence. Like if I go out to the store, um, I'm likely to bump into somebody I know. Who that person I'm going to bump into might be random. Or if I, you know, go to an event or just streaming. You know, I have over 2,000 subs and only a handful of people watching. And, you know, like, so who's going to be in the chat? I have my regulars. Uh, but, like, oh, I, I had a feeling that so-and-so was going to be there, that I was going to bump into so-and-so. And you say, well, most of the time the feelings are wrong, and a person only recognizes it when it comes to be true. Or, like, dreams coming true, um, predictions. You say, like, uh, you know, one of the main theories, models of mind is the predictive mind, predictive brain, uh, that the mind is always making predictions and that the vast majority of predictions are incorrect. So if I go to the store, that my brain is predicting scenarios where I could meet any of the people that I know. You know, like um, Amy, we covered uh, um, the uh, Dunbar's number. And it would say like, well, 1,500, if you estimate, like, well, I know like 1,500 people. So like if I go to, let's say, the kosher store, um, you know, there potentially could be 10,000 people that might be there. You know, there might be 10,000 regular shoppers of the kosher store that I would have some sort of loose recognition if I saw them. And there might be a thousand people that I've had interaction that I could be like, oh, I know this person from there. 
or you know versus like you know someone that I was in the middle of a conversation with that I could pick up and you know be like oh you know like last time we met we were talking about this and could pick up the conversation or maybe someone I intimately know and like oh how's it going how's your family or you know we should really get together you know thinking like a Dunbar's number so in that sense like coincidences always happen and so your mind is always making predictions so from the physicalist point of view there it's impossible that there's causation that you know the mentally that you know, if i was thinking like oh maybe you know as like, oh maybe amy and jennifer are going to be in my chat and john are going to be in my chat and well you know they're always in your chat so that you know that's a reasonable prediction so you predicted uh, you know the people that were in your chat the last few weeks were going to be in your chat uh you know today that coming true is like no big deal that's obvious um as as opposed to um and some kosher food tastes better. I mean kosher food generally is a slightly higher quality than generic food, although like gourmet high quality food is usually higher than kosher. Like kosher has its limit. So like the best food is usually you can't get kosher, but kosher is you know, like a notch up, like you know, so it's a, a higher level than just average food. But uh you're just on, on the synchronicity that I'm a believer. So part of the reason I believe is because I don't believe in coincidence. I think everything is caused by God, by karma, by spiritual principles. So, you know, if you just look at randomly, like you could bump into any various people and it's just coincidence random. It's not some greater purpose caused by like God to put, you know, certain people in front of you because of past karma. Um, as a spiritual person, I believe that. And so from a materialist point of view, there's no mechanism for synchronicity. It has to be a coincidence. It has to just be a chance that occurred. And so you have a monistic theory. So the Pauli-Jung conjecture, and although Jung could be considered a spiritualist as Pauli, the Pauli Jung conjecture is largely a philosophical, non religious attempt to explain the phenomenon with, at the time in the 1950s, the most recent discoveries in quantum mechanics, of which Wolfgang Pauli is the Pauli exclusion principle, is a big name in physics. You know, like, I mean, he's not quite like Einstein or Schrodinger, but uh, you know, he's probably like top 50. You know, like, and even your average person who took a physics course in high school probably heard of Pauli and the Pauli exclusion principle. So let's look at this a little bit more in depth. Uh, this article, the Pauli Jung conjecture and its relative relatives, a formally augmented outline by Harold Atmanspracher, 2020. He's still around at the height of his research. The dual aspect monist conjecture launched by Paul and Jung in the mid 20th century will be couched in somewhat formal terms to characterize it more concisely than by verbal description alone. After some background material situating the Paul and Jung conjecture among other conceptual approaches in the mind matter problem, the mind body of this paper outlines its general framework of a basic psychophysicality, neutral reality with its derivative mental and physical aspects and the nature of the correlations that connect these aspects. Some related approaches are discussed to identify key similarities to and deviations from the Pauli Jung framework that may be useful for cross-fertilization. Background. The question of how the mental and physical are related to one another is likely as old as humans are pondering the human condition. Its advent in modern Western philosophy is usually appointed to the works of Descartes, who coined the terms res cognitans and res extensa to refer to the two fundamental substances. In contemporary terms, these substances are addressed as the mental and the physical. Of course, this dualistic stance does not characterize Descartes' thinking exhaustively, but a Cartesian dualist ontology has been eminently influential for the development that eventually led to science and engineering as we know it today. A key point of difficulty in this framework is the direct interaction between the mental and the physical, which is problematic for a number of reasons. Interpreting the concept of interaction in the sense of a physical causal local interaction 
it is entirely unclear to which properties of the mental these physical interactions could couple. Also, mental states have no spatial location, and their temporal dynamics exceed the repertoire of physical time, so there is no common space-time basis for a consistent joint discussion. Considerations like this resonate with the doctrine of causal closure of the physical, stating that every physical event has a physical cause by necessity. There are two immediate reactions to the Cartesian dualism, both trying to undercut the dualistic ontology by emphasizing one of Descartes' substances at the expense of the other. One of these is known as idealism, where some form of the mental is granted ontological primacy, while the physical is considered as derivative. The other is known as materialism or physicalism, where some form of the physical is granted ontological primacy, while the mental is considered as derivative. Both of them avoid the problem of interacting substances because only one substance is left as fundamental. However, the problem now that arises is how to describe the non-interactive relation between the primary substance and its derivative. In physicalism, the dominant view in current science and a large part of the philosophy of mind, there are two main projects to address this. One is reductive physicalism, claiming that the mental can be reduced to the physical so that ultimately all mental activity can be understood in terms of physical laws. Sopley speaking, the idea is that consciousness is understood as soon as the brain is understood. The alternative is non-reductive physicalism, claiming that such a reduction fails and the mental emerges from the physical in the sense that novel properties such as mentality or consciousness arise, which cannot be understood from physical laws alone. The other response to Descartes' idealism began with Leibniz and Berkeley and culminated in German idealism, Fitchie, Schelling, and Hegel, and British idealism, Bradley and Mittager, somewhat simplifying a more involved landscape. It also comes in two variants, subjective and objective idealism. Subjective idealism claims that there is no mind-independent entities, but rather everything depends on cognitive and perceptive capacities of individual subjects. Objective idealism maintains that there is a universal absolute cosmic mind of which individual minds are fragments, fragmented and impure offspring. A third alternative to Cartesian dualism was pioneered by Spinoza and gave rise to a number of so-called dual aspect approaches over the centuries. Dual aspect approaches consider the mental and physical domains of reality as aspects or manifestations of an underlying undivided reality in which the mental and physical do not exist as separate domains in such a framework. The distinction between mind and matter results from an epistemic split that separates the aspects of the underlying reality. Consequently, the status of the psycho-physically neutral domain is considered an antic relative to mind-matter distinction. Two basic different classes of calls of dual aspect thinking can be distinguished by the way in which the psychophysical physically neutral domain gives rise to the mental and the physical. For Mark, James, and Russell, and the Neo-Russellians also subsumed as neutral monists, the compositional arrangement of psychophysically neutral elements decide about their mental or physical properties. In this picture of holes constituted by parts following classical systems theory, the mental and the physical are reducible to the neutral domain. The other class of dual aspect thinking is decompositional rather than compositional. Here the psychophysical neutral domain is holistic and the mental and the physical neither reducible to one another nor to the neutral emerge by making distinctions this decompositional move was recently characterized as priority monism two quantum inspired versions of this picture have been proposed by paul and jung and bohm and highly the following is an attempt to argue ar argument the proposed by paul and jung the paul and jung conjecture by using somewhat formal terms in this way it will become clear how it is motivated by key concepts of quantum theory, both Pauli and Bohm played significant roles in the development of quantum mechanics. The general framework is sketched in terms of decompositional of psychophysically neutral states, phi PPN, into separate mental states, phi M, and physical states, phi P, together with cor correlations of phi M relative to phi P between them. The formalization, which is kept to a minimum, will serve to describe the empirical material and the comparative material more easily. Uh, so the general framework, uh, this section, so I'm going to have to skip some of this because I have a lot to get through, but uh, you can see some of the charts and he tries to put it into a similar relationship to quantum mechanics or a logical where, you, where you'd have your neutral aspect that gives rise to the two aspects of material and physical, and you talk about the 
causal or a causal correlation between them and, and even a way to mathematize it. So encourage people to read through this, um, but I will skip the math part. The Pollyune conjecture is not only conceptually appealing, but it also has wide-ranging empirical consequences, a promising feature that makes it particularly outstanding among several related approaches to mind matter research. Uh, as indicated above, induced correlations can appear as coincidence phenomenon and disassociated phenomenon above and below ordinary baseline correlation. Coincidence phenomenon exhibit excess correlation above ordinary baseline correlation. They include meaningful coincidences, synchronicities, and Jung's parlance uh, that connect M and P more than ordinarily. Conversely, disassociated phenomena exhibit deficit correlations where ordinary baseline correlations are disconnected in out-of-body experiences, sleep paralysis based on the Paul Jung conjecture. Atmansprocker and Fock proposed the taxonomy in which coincidence and disassociated phenomena form two of four fundamental types of exceptional experience based on induced correlations. As of today, about 3,000 cases of spontaneously occurring exceptional experiences have been systematically collected and evaluated by the Institute of Frontier Areas of Psychology as a result of various factor analysis, cluster analysis, item analysis, and scale analysis. The taxonomy predicted by the Paul Jung conjecture turned out to be the most robust and best generalizable model for all analyzed samples. The fact that all patterns occur not only in subjects seeking help, but also although less often in the general population, shows that exceptional experiences are widespread and continuously distributed in their intensity and frequency. One of the general population samples was compiled in cooperation with the Psychiatric University Clinic Zurich. After the standard questionnaire-based procedure of identifying individuals according to the taxonomy, their behavior in psychophysical settings known as Mooney task was analyzed. With such tasks, the disposition of subjects to project meaningful objects into random distributions of pixels can be studied. Weiss found that among the four basic types of exceptional experiences, only subjects inclined towards coincidence phenomenon showed a significant rate of false positives in the task. These subjects perceived meaningful excess correlations in situations that are random by construction, impressive support for the taxonomy of phenomenon, not only for spontaneous occurrence, but even in controlled experiments. Moreover, applying the framework of the Paul Jung conjecture to the psychodynamics of situations in which subjects report exceptional experiences yields new and fascinating insights Fox showed this in the interplay of bonding and autonomy for adolescents exhibiting exceptional experiences in their family context, in addition to a better understanding of the nature of mind-matter correlation in general. Such psychodynamic study offers, offers specific invention strategies with distinct therapeutic potential for subjects suffering from exceptional experiences. However, far from all subjects reporting exceptional experiences suffer from them or even receive psychotic diagnosis to avoid a premature and unjustified identification of exceptional experience exclusive as mental disorders. The constructed questionnaires assess their phenomenology only, disregarding issues of veridicality or even psychopathology. The question of veridicality or truthfulness is delicate because it bears critical on assumptions about ontology. From a physicalist perspective, the veridicality of the experience requires that it must not contradict the laws of physics. If it does, the experience will likely be ditched a, a psychopathological impairment or a hallucinization, which however is still vertical from a phenomenological standpoint. From a dual aspect perspective, correlate, correlative experiences are subject to neither physics no, alone nor psychology alone to dismiss them as hallucinations because they do not follow the laws of physics would be an obvious category mistake. The existing empirical material shows plausibly that the self-rated perceived intensities of induced exceptional experiences decreases as a function of increasing frequency. Subjects may report low intensity, hardly meaningful experiences fairly often, while once in a lifetime experiences of almost existential numinous qualities are rare. Low level intensity experiences exhibit a small difference from the baseline of no experience meaning at all. This suggests the heuristic picture of a monotonic increase of the intensity of meaning experience with increasing rather than treating singular events of high intensity as a statistical outliers. They are here seen as part of a lawful regularity. In a similar vein, the mater empirical material also shown that the structural baseline correlation of uh, with 
psychosomatic or psychoneural correlations are stable and reproducible as standard scientific methodology demands. So this goes on. I can't read all, all, of, the, all of this, but uh, you said it has somewhat been tested and correlated and material has been gathered. Elliot, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Arguably the closest relative of the Pauli Jung conjecture is Bohm's proposal that consider to consider the mental and the physical as decomposed explications of holistic implicate orders whose most fundamental form he calls hollow movement resembling the unus mundus of Pauli Jung. In between M and P of the hollow movement, Bohm suggests a multi-layer structural or implicate orders, each of which generates explications that in turn may be implicate with respect to further explications. In this way, he refers to structures that resemble a hierarchical or archetypal patterns in the Pauli Jung framework. Paul and you did not address anything akin to the relativity of the distinction between implicate and explicate orders. However, such a distinction is important to understand the interplay of ontic and epistemic domains in the nested hierarchy of levels of reality in their conjecture as an implicate order can be explicate with respect to the more implicate order an antic level of reality can be epistemic with respect to a more antic level. A more detailed discussion of such a relative onticity adapted from Quine's ontology, ontological relativity would exceed the scope of this paper. Manifestations of the implicate orders in the separate states of uh, the material and physical are called unfolding in Bohm's framework and back reactions from the material and physical to their underlying implicate order are called enfolding. While in the Pauli Jung conjecture, archetypal activity is always psychophysically neutral. Archetypes are neither mental nor physical. Bohm refers to implicate orders that are both mental and physical, suggesting a distinction between the material and physical within such implicate orders. The both and figure, as innocent as it may look, marks a grave deviation from the neither nor of the Pauli Jung conjecture. Taking it at face value, it points to a representation of implicate order states as product states states of an implicate order in which both mental and physical properties are already separate would characterize a version of panpsychism, the view that mentality is fundamental and ubiquitous in the natural world. In this view, the index, the psychophysically neutral, would be illegitimate for such states. Rather, one might want to speak of the product state for panpsychism. It is not clear whether Bohm wants to stretch his panpsychism eventually to the whole movement as the ultimate implicant order. If not, the whole movement state would not would be the non-product state, as all archetype patterns in the Pauli Jung conjecture are assumed to be. An important point common to Bohm and Pauli Jung is their emphasis on the significance of meaning, which no other approach to mind-matter problems highlights so crucially. Low Bohm naturally does not stress the subjective experience of meaning as much as Jung does. In Bohm's wording, this is addressed by the notion of active information, which brings implicate structures into explicate forms by doing so not only separate states of the material and physical are generated as explicate orders from the underlying implicate order, but in addition, active information deriving from the implicate order substantiates mind-matter correlations as meaningful the correlations arise as a consequence of the fact that both the material and physical unfold together from the same state of the same implicate order. Highly close collaborator of Bohm for decades developed the idea of implicate and explicate orders, further using the formal apparatus of representations of algebraic structures. Picking up on earlier proposers by Eddington, he identified idempotents I of Clifford algebras as operators that leave the structural existence of a system invariant, though its concrete properties may well be subject to change, irrespective of how much the appearance of a system may vary the structural existence of the state remains preserved. Formally, this preservation is expressed by the relation I equals I squared in the Hilbert Splates representation of ordinary quantum physics. Idempotents become projection operators leading to the propositional lattices of standard quantum logic. While these basic algebraic structures refer to implicate orders, their representation describes their manifestations as explicate orders of the mental and physical domain, specifying the general ideas laid by, out by Bohm and Hiley. Hiley successfully used uh, Clifford algebra to reproduce basic principles of known physics using representations of those algebras. In this reconstruction, the states of quantum systems are representations of elements, so-called ideals of the algebra, which are generated by idempotents. 
the idempotents have eigenvalues of zero or one can now be interpreted in terms of logical propositions with true values about the existence of states. If idempotents commute, existence is always well-defined. Either a state exists or does not exist. However, if idempotents do not commute, existence as such becomes difficult to define. A well-known matter of debate about ontic versus epistemic interpretations is the foundation of quantum physics. The process of measurement is a way of forcing unambiguous Boolean substructures to arise as explications of the implicate non-Boolean structure implied by non-commuting idempotents. Other representations algebra yet to be found are hoped to be relevant for mental processes as the basic algebraic structures is atemporal and aspatial. It is a promising candidate to characterize a pre-space and pre-time reality implying that the hollow movement must not be mistaken as a movement in time or in position space, eventually both in the mental and the physical should be describable as manifestations or representations of the algebra. Since both representations derive from the same algebra, they are supposed to exhibit the mind-matter correlations. They're at the core of the mind-body problem. Uh, Paikinon related Bohm and Hiley's work to modern approaches in the philosophy of science, the philosophy of mind, and cognitive science. Another set of relatives to the Paul Jung conjecture can be found in the class of compositional dual aspect thinking. The notion of neutral monism has been coined for this class as exposed by its main historical protagonists, Mark James and Russell. Studenberg discussed its relations to other frameworks and thinking, highlighting the influence of Russell. It is also sometimes dubbed Russell and monism. In a compositional dual aspect approaches, there are psychophysical neutral elements, neither mental nor physical, which can be composed into configurations producing larger entities. Depending on the configuration of the composed entity, its states acquire mental or physical properties. And this sense of phi PPN denotes the states of psychophysical neutral elements rather than the psychophysical neutral whole. States of phi M and phi P would figure as macrostates emerging from those neutral microstates. This is a conception that one reads in Russell's Analysis of Mind, where he sees the neutral stuff as neither mental nor physical. Both mind and matter are composite. The stuff of which they are compounded lies above them both, like a common ancestor. A few pages down, he refers to neutral monism in terms of some raw materials of which some arrangements may be called mental, while others may be called physical. Here, Russell's compositional atomistic move is obvious in contrast to the decompositional holistic structure of the Bohm and Pauli Jung. How are the neutral elements themselves to be characterized? Here, Russell refers to the notions of sensations and perceptions, which has caused some confusion among his interpreters, although he makes efforts to clarify that he does not think of both in terms of subjective experiences. These notions sound like phenomenological or even subjective idealist in his analysis of matter. Russell changes the terminology by moving to the more neutral notion of events and sticks to that later on. And in a late article in 1956, Russell clearly rejects panpsychism as lifeless objects move and undergo various transformations, but they do not experience these occurrences. The two other protagonists of neutral monism in the late 19th century were Mach, originally a physicist, and James, originally a psychologist. Both share with Russell the compositional structure of the mental states and the physical states out of a neutral element in states that are neither mental nor physical. Interesting, similar kinds of misunderstandings as for Russell have been prompted by Max uses of sensation and James uses of pure experience when referring to the psychophysically neutral, but as for Russell, neither of them subscribes to the subjective idealism. James does even categorically disavow any ontological significance for consciousness and explains his notion of pure experience as plain, unqualified actuality or existence, a simple that. If one still wants to understand this as non-neutral, one should prefer to resort to objective rather than subjective idealism, a universal mode of presence underlying all mental and physical appearances. Other selected versions of the objective idealism are sketched in uh, section 4.3. Alternative to neither nor figure or psychophysical neutrality in tr is in traditional neutral monism, the states of the base elements can be considered both mental and physical. A pertinent example is naturalistic dualism, according to Chalmers, where the base states have both internal phenomenal properties and external physical properties. Insofar as any base state has mentality as an internal property, mentality is fundamental and ubiquitous, as in panpsychism. Naturalistic dualism is a dual aspect model in which the two aspects appear at the same level as the base states of which they are aspects. Such a panpsychist ontology suggests that the base states are products states. A more radical panpsychist reading of Russell and Monism holds that consciousness 
in some primitive form is the non-structural categorical ground that drives all structure, its intrinsic nature, as it were. A special feature in naturalistic dualism anticipated by Sayer is the base elements as such are conceived as states of pure information. Pure here indicates that this information is conceived as purely syntactic in the sense of Shannon, and any reference to meaning is rejected. Such information states require distinctions in their state space, which are needed to define syntactic information. This in turn implies a non a context independent primitive partition of that state space, perhaps with the one constraint that the mental and physical aspects of so defined information states match with each other in the right way. Objective idealism, another relative of the Paul Jung conjecture, sharing a number of features with it is objective idealism. This position fell largely out of fashion with the rise of physicalism, though there are research programs in its spirit even today, such as Hoffman's compositional approach using conscious agents networks. Since it is impossible in this outline to sketch objective idealism anywhere close to its full comprehension, only a few exponents will be indicated from both Western and Eastern background. There's Schelling's philosophy at the turn of the 19th century and the much more ancient Indian systems of Veda Vedanta and the Yuga Sutra of Pantagela. Schelling, starting off as a follower of Fitch, uh, Fitch was dedicatedly more concerned about the results of developing sciences than his teacher. He realized that Fitch's subjective idealism with its emphasis on the ego is too narrow and too one-sided. Turning back to Spinoza, he explored the idea that mind and matter, spirit and nature are two sides of a primordial totality, a base reality conceived as a higher unity beyond the mind-matter distinction. Schelling's famous quote, nature should be made mind visible, mind the invisible nature takes Mind nature dualism is a cognitive move for the sake of discursive thinking, but he rejects this as a metaphysical option. His next step was to posit the primordial reality without space and time as a dynamic, undifferentiated unity of the absolute ideal subjectivity and the absolute real objectivity in an inter internal act of absolute reason from which mind and nature are decomposed as separate forms. Reality as such is a dynamic self-organizing activity indifferent with respect to even most fundamental oppositions of subject and object that this indifference later referred to as the on ground in his freedom essay points to states which are neither mental nor physical the highest law of absolute reason at this level is the law of absolute identity an identity whose only predicate is that it has no predicates this is the cause of, of his objective idealism. Schelling's system of identity offers a delicate balance of the mental and physical as forms of manifestations. Its perfect symmetry is the same as the Paul Jung conjecture, although Schelling's system does not at least explicitly include a back reaction from mind and matter to their basis. This back reaction is crucial for Pauli and Jung as it enables induced mind-matter correlations. Schelling does not explicitly address such correlations, but he talks about a transitive being that links mind and matter as predicates emerging from the indifferent unground, as he astonishingly clear about the necessary non-causal nature of this link. Rejecting the mind-like structure of Fichte's ego, Schelling downgrades the mental to a derivative aspect and insists on ultimate reality as a tertium quid that is indifferent with respect to mind-matter distinction. On this hand, Schelling at times also seems to think about the base reality as both mental and physical, similar to the panpsychist attitude. With both version, he departs from the basic tenets usually ascribed to German idealism, other than for Paul and Jung, who mostly reject epistemic access to the Unus Mundus, Schelling's ultimate and absolute reality can be apprehended by intellectual intuition, not to be conflated with intellect as a rational cognitive capacity. The late Schelling, in his struggle to achieve a better understanding of the absolute, resorted to Neoplatonic and mystic ideas, very much akin to what Jung did with his recourse to alchemy and the hermetic tradition, which have their origin in the near and Middle East. This makes it interesting to look at the objective idealism of Indian spiritual traditions and compare them with the Pauli Jung conjecture. One of these traditions was recently investigated by Whitney in a thoughtful comparison with Jung's analytic psychology, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, dating back to the first century. A key clarifying ingredient of Whitney's presentation of the Yoga Sutra is the distinction between two orientations of consciousness, consciousness in its true nature as orientation and consciousness, assuming the modifications of mind as orientation uh, A and B. Other notations for orientation A are pure consciousness, pure subjectivity, or consciousness as such, uh, Prusa, or cosmic consciousness. Consciousness and orientation A is unchanging, immutable, eternal, self-knowing, and non-dual, 
which is to say that it's free from distinctions by contrast, consciousness, and orientation. B refers to states of the material of our everyday consciousness, perception, cognition, emotion, and other more or less subtle contexts of the discriminating mind consciousness for us, Prakti. This framework of thinking is kind of cosmic objective idealism in which the cosmic mind orientation A is open to human experience if appropriate practices are conducted successfully. The difference between orientations A and B is created by avidya, ignorance, characterized by change, egoism, impurity, attraction, aversion, fear, suffering, and confusion. However, precisely since orientation B can change, it can in principle become aligned with the unchanging eternal orientation A. The striking similarity between Pentagula and Jung is the distinction of ego and self. In Pentagula's account, the former is a construct of the mind and the latter a mode of pure consciousness, sometimes referred to as Atman, although the ego is considered as one of the great afflictions within orientations B, it may nevertheless change so as to get aligned with orientation A and thus accomplish liberation. Note, however, that masquerading A with the tools of B is not the same as experience A directly. Likewise, Jung's notion of the ego and the conscious manifestation of an archetypal self, which is the goal of the process of individuation. Well, for Pentagula, it is Advaita that blocks the road from Prakti to the pure consciousness of Purusa, Analytical psychology proposes an increasing opacity of the unconscious as the obstacle precluding access to the ultimate ground of the undivided unus mundus. How can an opacity of the unconscious be interpreted in detail? In Jung's account, it is the loss of distinct distinctions as tools for differentiation that is required for practice. The law of distinction implies a loss of speakability and Effability, a loss of discursive cognition. As soon as the ultimate distinction is dissolved, the resulting undivided reality does not leave any discursive option, non duality par excellence. The neo Kantian flavor of Jung and Pauli's approach did not permit them for a long time to think about this non dual reality as being epistemically accessible. Only on the last pages of his final opus, Mysterium, Jung took the possibility of such an access seriously, literally as an act of revelation. However, imminent experience like this. A notion adopted from De, uh, Deleuze cannot be subjective experiences in the ordinary profane sense. Along the lines in the Pauline conjecture, one ought to think about them as experience of a neutral reality, neutral psychophysically and neutral with respect to other distinctions, including that so of subject and object, thus avoiding the objective idealist notion of pure consciousness. One advantage of this move is the term pure consciousness makes it too easy to be mistaken as subjective, as in James, pure experience or Russell and Mach sensations. This is avoided by less biased terms such as neutral reality. Another more important issue is that Patanjala analyzes the cosmic idealism of pure consciousness states in orientation A, primarily in relation to its mental manifestations, in orientation B. Physical manifestations remain largely unaddressed in his account, and the mental-physical connection is even less explained. By contrast, the neutral reality in the Pauline conjecture has an explicit relation to both the mental and physical, both are manifestations of the neutral. This entails three benefits with remarkable potential for concrete research and further insight. Starting with the psychophysically neutral offers the option to explore formal structures for the description of the mental that are already well established for the physical since both arise from the same neutral ground. One would expect that key features in the description of the two domains should be isomorphic. One of these features is non-commutative structures in physics and psychology, a novel research program that has been attracting even more scientists worldwide for the past two decades. The Pauli-Yun conjecture and its ramifications provide a most natural and straightforward characterization of the correlations between the mental and physical. Decomposing a holistic state into parts generally leads to correlations between the parts. This means that decompositional dual aspect framework implies such correlations. In the first place, there is no need to look for post hoc ra rationalizations for them, and also no need to declare them as mysterious. In fact, taxonomy and psychophysical correlations driving for the Pauline conjecture is now largely supported by a comprehensive stock of empirical material. More generally, cosmic idealism bears the risk of an embodied life, both mental and physical, being devalued relative to pure consciousness. Jung lends a dignity and sense of meaning to creation and human life, which becomes somewhat overshadowed by models conceiving human consciousness as mere ignorance or at best as something that can be aligned with pure consciousness and thereby be transcended. As cogently argued by Maine, Jung's emphasis can be understood by the panentheist thought 
that the divine creator needs feedback from his creation to become conscious himself. Together with the Yuga Sutra, another widespread and influential Hindu-related spiritual tradition is Advaita Vedanta, mainly due to Shankara, Shankaracharya around 800 AC. With the Yoga Sutra especially focuses on the psychological side of the path towards liberation, Advaita Vedanta talks about both mind and world more symmetrically. A particular informative and compact introduction to its main philosophical ideas is due to Deutsch. On the side of the physical nature, the outside world Advaita Vedanta suggests a procedure of sublation, bada, that can be applied to hierarchical hierarchy of levels of beings to sublate some experience of an object, means roughly to replace the experience by another one due to fresh insight. Sublation is a tool to distinguish experience, appearance from reality, understood as the ultimate reality, which while appearances can be sublated by other experiences, reality cannot be sublated by any other experience. The unreal, the third category next to appearance in reality is that which can neither be, cannot nor uh, be sublated by other experiences such as circular square or other oxymorons. Three types of appearances can be characterized by sublation, the real existent and the existent and the illusory existent. The real existence comprises those experiences that can only be sublated by the ultimate reality itself. These are spiritual experiences that are only sublated by transcending the subject. Object distinction, the existent compromises experience that can be sublated by the real existent and the ultimate reality. The vast majority of everyday perceptual, cognitive, and affective experiences belong to this type. The illusory existent comprises experiences that can be sublated by all other types of experiences, hallucinations, erroneous sense perceptions, and dreams, well, the illusory existent is epistemically empty, the unreal is ontically empty. The overarching idea of Veta Vedanta is for its adherence to analyze all experiences and sublate them until they cannot be sublated any further, until the ultimate reality is reached. In other words, this means to move through the successive levels of appearance with the goal of arriving at the most fundamental level, the ultimate reality of the Brahman. It experiences non-dual and unveils the delusional Advidya condition multiplicity of appearances in the physical world, yet this world can be made intelligent discursively by employing a video and by reversing sublation, moving back from the one to the many. One side on the side of the mind, Advaita Vedanta distinguishes four classes of states of consciousness, the wake state of the ordinary conscious mind, the dream state, the state of deep sleep, the transcendental consciousness, while wake and dream states are already targets of contemporary conscious studies, Deep sleep only slowly becomes lifted from unconscious activity to states of consciousness. In Veda Vedanta, experiences of deep sleep still retain a knowing subject, but all objects of consciousness are gone, and distinctions are experienced as pure potentialities. As far as transcendental consciousness is concerned, there are two distinct modes of it, a borderline experience at the transition from deep sleep and a pure experience of reality different from deep sleep itself, borderline experiences and experiences of the presence of non-dual reality with neither object nor subject, but still representational. The stage of transcendental consciousness culminates in the pure experience of non-dual reality directly. To put it succinctly, in borderline experience, there's awareness of non-dual reality. In pure experience, the non-dual reality is no longer an object of awareness. It just is. The pure experience of reality is the ultimate realization of the Atman in which it merges with the Brahman so that their distinction, the most fundamental one, it becomes lifted in Veda Vedanta to affirm oneself as reality is the act of a free human in Patanjali's account. This is a state in which consciousness B becomes aligned with consciousness A, in which all avidya collapses as all distinctions are gone. Likewise, realizing the archetype of the self in Jungian terms is the goal of the process of individuation in which the conjunction with the unus mundus is accomplished as a Veda Vedanta can be phrased in terms of successive stages of consciousness, terminating in a state of cosmic consciousness. It is tempting to classify this state in terms of objective idealism. This is consolidated by the fact that even on the physical side, the targets of discussions are not physical objects and their relations, but experience of those objects and relations are insofar as the experience of non-dual reality is explicitly beyond the mind matter and subject object distinction. Advaita Vedanta also shares an essential feature of a psychophysically neutral reality, or at least one might submit that more than traces of the psychophysical neutral stand out. Some conclusions. Common basic characteristic in all approaches discussed in this outline is the assumption of a kind of underlying reality in relation to which the mental and the physical 
our subordinate aspects, perspective, manifestations, explications, and appearances. The precise nature of the underlying reality comes in essentially three variants, psychophysical neutrality, panpsychism, or objective idealism with cosmic consciousness, including ambiguities among them. A psychophysically neutral reality is neither mental nor physical, void of the mind-matter distinction. The Paul Jung conjecture is clearly of this kind, and the Bohm highly holo movement seems to express the same idea, although implicate orders in general are typically described as both mental and physical, hence panpsychists, the compositional approaches of neutral monism, also proclaim their neutral elements as neither mental nor physical. Interesting, neutral monists denote their neutral domain using concepts such as sensations or pure experience, whose connotations are leaning towards objective idealism. The notion of a cosmic consciousness as such in the Yoga Sutra points towards an objective mind as an objective idealism, as opposed to the conscious of individual subjective minds of Veda Vedanta too proposes a number of features that fall into this class, especially the experiences are central also beyond the mental, but one may also see it as expressing psychophysical neutrality in the ultimate reality. Schelling's philosophy, though standardly counted as objective idealism, also seems to oscillate between panpsychism and psychophysical neutrality. From the point of from this point of from a formal point of view, the closest relative of the Paul Jung conjecture is no doubt the approach by Bohm and Hailey. One reason is that both approaches have been strikingly influenced by concepts of quantum theory suitably generalized to be applicable beyond the limitations of physics. In the corresponding work after Paul and Jung had passed away around 1960, Bowman highly proposed algebraic structures that are abstract enough to underlie both the mental and physical without presupposing a distinction between them. Appropriate representation of these algebraic structures have been exploited to successfully describe concrete situations in physics and psychology. By now, a key element of these applications is non commutativity of operations, something that Pauli, Bohr, and others had anticipated long ago. Contemporary developments in the Pauli Jung conjecture offer great potential to be vindicated by the study of psychophysical correlations in exceptional experiences. This can be seen closely related to the Yoga Sutra and Advaita Vedanta, which have a lot to say about practical techniques to induce such experiences in order to facilitate the path towards non-dual awareness. However, exceptional experiences can also cause digressions to be left aside along the way, depending on specific traditions. They're sometimes referred to as epiphenomena and it's recommended not to devote much attention to them in order to keep the process of liberation in flow. On the other hand, tantric systems such as Hatha Yoga, Kashmir, Shaivism, and others concentrate more on them as they assume that a substantially developing mind goes hand in hand with certain physical, especially bodily phenomena. The metaphysics of the Pauline conjecture is close to Spinoza's philosophy, albeit mostly formulated in a theological deplete fashion. It has been a matter of debate whether Spinoza's religious standpoint in is pantheism or panentheism, whether the creator is regarded as identical with his creation or whether the creator, in addition, transcends his creation. Schelling was arguably the first in the history of philosophy to use the notion of panentheism in his freedom essay with respect to the Paul Jung conjecture and Jung's major work on the psychology of religion, a panentheist perspective is highly informative for an appropriate understanding. And so doing the undivided psychophysical neutrality in the Paul Jung conjecture can be interpreted as a placeholder for the divine which transcends the multiplicity of profane phenomenon in the mental and physical, yet panentheism also allows us to turn to the transcendence into imminence. If the archetypal origin the meaningful coincidences can become experientially accessible. Rel uh, revelatory experiences and epiphanies of great mystics point to this thesis, and Jung himself referred to them as ultimate insights into the Unus Mundus. The late Schelling went a similar route when he turned to Bohm's mysticism and to divine reality, obviously with a very different cultural background, is recognized in the Indian systems discussed. Hey, the last Australian... Thanks for tuning in. Um, now I've never read Emerson Circles. I'm, I'm, I haven't read much of Emerson. I'm familiar. I've, I've took the great courses on Emerson's work. So if anyone wants to hop on and talk a few minutes, just to give my voice a rest. Um, So I'm just going to pour myself a, another cup of tea. You got a lot more to go. So anyone wants to hop on, feel free.
I have way more than I could possibly, you know, read or cover. So, uh, um, yeah, I mentioned Hemholtz. I you know, went very in depth into this Pauli Jung conjecture and synchronicity. It is a topic I'm going to return to. It's also, David Bohm, because David Bohm was also a Kabbalist, and uh, you know, so this is going to be. A direction of week in review and my research, you know, moving into the future. So, just curious how this uh, modern day debate is going. I'll probably check it out later. So, over a thousand people watching um, the Thorps. Okay, so. I had thought I had wanted to, you know, th these are just going to be way too long for me to read, but you know, th these were really good materials. I, you know, like if, if time, um, you know, was more, I would read through these, um, you know, just to, uh, um, you know, just cause they're really important stuff. So I'd mentioned, um, here's monism and meliorism. Uh, the philosophical origins of the open court. And I'd mentioned a few weeks ago the periodical called The Monist that had some of the biggest thinkers and writers in the late 1800s through the mid 1900s. And uh, you know, Hegler, who funded it, was an industrialist, and he um, recruited this man, Karras, from Europe to uh, establish this journal. And so the Monist was like a quarterly journal for um, decades, and you know, what's called what's called the Monist. And so this was an interesting article on the history of the Monist magazine. It was like a deep dive into Monism. And there was I mentioned Cosmos in the 1850s. There was another magazine called Cosmos that was uh, a precursor to Monism. So monism was the ideological or philosophical ground for the open court publishing company. It served as a catalyst bringing together Hegler and Koros as colleagues in a joint effort. But why monism? That is, what was significant about the philosophy over others? Moreover, what specific kind of monism did Hegler and Koros mutually subscribe? Koros's book, Monism and Meliorism, is an ideal source of arriving at understanding the monism of the open court. His biographer Henderson says the book is the best evidence we have of the thoughts that Paul Corus brought to La Salle and that appeared to Hegler. Hegler found his own intellectual sentiments expressed in the text and for this reason became convinced that Corus possessed the qualifications to give proper shape to his personal worldview. So Corus wrote a whole bunch of publications in German and English. Throughout his writings on monism, Koros provides explicit definitions of the philosophy and frequently returns over the course of his discussions to its most fundamental tenets. One definition appears at the opening page of the preface to monism in Mielerism. It states, we define monism as a conception of the world which traces all things back to one source, thus explaining all problems from one principle. The simplest statement is almost tautological since it does not describe a unique kind of monism. Rather, it indicates the general position common to all forms of monism, which is the grounding of a multiplicity in some kind of unity. The definition also does not inform us about the nature of the presumed monistic source, principle, or what have you. However, later in the book, Koros fleshes out his view by arguing that the universal principle governing the world is causality. By the law of causality, Koros in effect distinguishes his position from other versions of monism. This is one of two of his major theses. The other is Mullerism, which is an ethical position theoretically interconnected with monism. Together, the two doctrines comprise the systematic plan of the text. Causality is the beginning, ethics is the aim, and the end of this philosophy. These two points being fixed, the whole system is sketched in its outlines. 
Monism and Muellerism begins by putting forth the quintessential philosophical problem, the problem of dualism. An examination of course criticism of dualism allows for a proper understanding of his more positive doctrines since he proposes these as necessary solutions. Dualism commits itself to two distinct fundamental principles or forms of reality. A classic historical example is Cartesian dualism that proposes that the human being consists of a mind and a body and that the world as a whole is populated by the two substances of mind and matter. These substances are incommensurate because the former is a thinking, not extended being, and the latter is an extended, non-thinking being. Carus will reject this dualism, among others, because it does not account for the interaction between these two entities, given that they are ontologically distinct. However, in his book, he primarily focuses his critical efforts on the dualistic tendencies not of Descartes, but those that he believes are present in Kant's philosophical system. Some of the dualism that Carus identifies here consists in the following pairs, subject, object, reason, feeling, scientific inquiry, religious faith, a prior knowledge, a posterior knowledge, optimistic, pessimistic, ideal, real, necessity, freedom, natural law, moral obligation. A major goal for Carl's is to expunge these dualistic flaws from Kant's revolutionary philosophy so as to advance a progressive reconstruction of it into a philosophy of monism. Carl's motives here have an important historical context in the philosophical concurrence in the second half of the German 19th century. His student years and subsequent teaching career in the 1870s and 80s overlap with the rise of neocontinuism in Germany. During his residence at the universities in Germany as a student, and then subsequently in the gymnasium, the military academy at Dresden, as a teacher and uh, ac academician uh, with uh, Fischer, Lang, and Liebman, had been actively laying the foundation for a new approach to Kant. They and their peers were motivated by a strong reaction against Kant. They and their peers were motivated by a strong reaction against two major ideological trends that had become popular following Kant. On the one hand, the speculative idealism of such thinkers as Fichte, Hegel, and Schelling, and on the other hand, the dogmatic scientific materialism figures such as uh, Karl Vatt, uh, Heinrich uh, Zolbe, and Ludwig Buckner. In light of the perceived failing of these developments, since Kant, Fischer, and Liebman advocated for a return to the writings of the Sage of Koinsberg and a reassessment of their actual doctrines and critical methods as a sign of the time, Liebman's book uh, on Kant ended each chapter with the empathetic refrain, thus we must go back to Kant. Following upon such impulse, by the 1890s, two schools of neocontinism would emerge, each advocating their own way of returning to Kant, the Marburg School with its predecessors Lang and the main represented Hermann Cohn and Paul Maitrup of the Southwest or Baden School with its predecessors Fischer and Hermann Lotz and main representations of Wilhelm Windelbaum and Heinrich Rickert. From a historic Graphical perspective, albeit generalization, the two schools can be seen in opposition, whereby the former attempt to clarify Kant's views and adhere to his methodological practices, and the latter attempted to explore the wider implications of Kant's ideas to contemporary culture. Horace left his native homeland in 1881 before the establishment of any distinct school of neocontinuism, which would continue in the first two decades of the 20th century. For this reason alone, he is not a card-carrying neocontian. Furthermore, despite Karras' time in Germany overlapping with the rise of the movement, his early writings make almost no explicit reference to its figures, text, or internal academic debates, which were numerous and created fierce forms of partisanship across the universities. Nevertheless, when assessing Karras' relationship to neocontinuism and its origins, we should keep in mind that uh, the rising movement was hardly perceptible and consistent heterogeneous currents flowing together of which not one of the active participants in this process understood itself as part of a more comprehensive movement. The bottom line is that Coruscant's first philosophical ideas were born out of the same intellectual, social, and political milieu that came to define the Neocontians, and as we might expect, they share with the Neocontian program the effort to make recourse to Kant while critically assessing the philosophical trends uh, post Kant, the general spirit of Neocontium is evident in monism and Muellerism that takes Kant's philosophy as its starting point. The first chapter is a review of Kant's critical project, both its theoretical and practical slides, its historical perspective as a response to the insights of Enlightenment philosophy. Of course, there echoes one of Kant's most influential ideas by cautioning against the dangers of speculative reason and by showing a commitment to the grounding scientific knowledge on a prior truths. The idea was a major point of emphasis with his German contemporaries who focused on epistemology as a systematic concern, notably So putting aside the question of the accuracy or novelty, of course, interpretation of Kant in the history of philosophy, 
His views nonetheless inform his philosophy of monism. This is because he believes that Kant's dualism has precipitated a state of partisan scholasticism with conflicting and one-sided interpretation, thus setting the sage for a unifying voice. In order to overcome our disagreements and truly reap the benefit of Kant's insights, we must first acknowledge that his philosophy is truly dualistic and second, strive to reconcile its opposing elements. Thus, wise Carlos explains that Kant successfully incorporated the antagonistic principles of his times in his philosophy, yet he left the working out of the solution to posterity. That solution Chorus envisions is the unification of the principles in a theory of monism. To achieve this is the aim of his book. On the other hand, the method of achieving the goal of Kant's own method, which is actually a principle of justice, the method preserves each side of the issue and treats neither as inferior nor or superior to the others. Hence, Chorus concludes his first chapter. Um, the following articles try to realize this ideal and will prove, let us hope, that there is more unity in the general plan of human reason than Kant supposed. Our monism results in a contemplation of the world by which so many seemingly contradictory troops are reconciled with each other. The ideal on the one side with the real on the other, logical deduction with empirical induction, religious faith with philosophic and scientific inquiry, the inflexible causality with a higher te teleology, and the rigid law of necessity with freedom of will and morality. The specific dualism of religion and science that Chorus names in his monistic reconstruction of Kant's philosophy is especially relevant to his future role as editor of the Open Court. Consolidating religion with science was the stated aim of the magazine, appearing in the subtitle and standing notice, and it was part of Hegler's mission in founding the publishing company. Chorus attention to the problem must have appeared to Hegler when reading Monism and Meliorism, of future business pa partners, the two men will both insist on the imperative to reconcile this dualism along with the parallel dualism of feeling and reason. As Chorus puts in his book, the re re reconciliation is necessarily in order to avoid falling into extremism of either radicalism or dogmatism, each prioritizing one aspect of the dualistic pair over its counterpart. Radicalism for Chorus is the atheistic view rejecting religious faith in an overcommitment to reason. On the other hand, dogmatism is the superstitious view, rejecting scientific truths in an overcommitment to feeling. These alternative positions are furthermore expressions of the greater historical antagonism of materialism, spiritualism, and realism, idealism, opposing worldviews brought into full relief by Kant's varying approaches in the critique. In accordance with the method of justice, course takes neither of these views to be satisfactory alone, and said seeks a balanced position in establishing a scientific religious philosophy that holds a comprehensive view of human nature. Of course, solution to dualism that equally incorporates two fundamental principles may be deemed a neutralism, recalling Charles Pierce's description of neutralism as a kind of Fox monism. From at least 1890 onward, Pierce was attentive to the happenings of open court and the philosophical efforts made by Chorus. He found he shared similar ideas with Chorus, yet also had critical objections to others in his 1891 article, The Architecture of Theories for the Monist, Pierce described neutralism as the brand of monism that holds physical laws and physical physical law and physical law to uh, psychological law to both independent and primordial. Furthermore, he rejects the theory stating naturalism neutralism is sufficiently condemned by the logical maxim known as Occam's razor that not more independent elements are to be assumed the necessary by placing the inward and outward aspects of substance on par, it seems to render both primordial. Pierce's own metaphysics, rather, is a monism of objective idealism, unlike neutralism and materialism. Objective idealism is the one intelligible theory of the universe. It holds physical law to be primordial to physical law and matter as effete mind. Although Pierce does not name Chorus or anyone in particular as a neutralist, his remark in the architecture of theories has a not minimal probability of having him in mind amongst others, since the two were by then corresponding on philosophical issues. In addition, Pierce's explicit comment on Chorus Monism in his review on the first issue of the Monist published in the Nation shows that he finds Chorus position to share a point of confusion similar to the doctrine of neutralism. There he claims that Chorus definition of monism is no definition of monism at all, and that it inappropriately opposes itself to idealism and materialism, whose meaning Chorus misunderstands. There's more to Chorus monism that traces all things back to one source than a mere diplomatic perspective that adjudicates the middle ground between theoretical extremes. For him, there is a monistic source of all things 
that is, there is an ontological principle of unity. The article Monism, Dualism, and Agnosticism makes this clear. Monism is the conception of the world which traces being and thinking, the object and the subject, matter and force back to one source, thus explaining all problems from one principle. What is this one source or principle? Chorus's answer is causality, which he submits as a positive solution to the reductive extremes that stem from dualistic thinking. Causality is the keystone of all philosophical difficulty and all other problems depend upon the solution of this query. There's no problem in the empire of the human mind, which is not more or less connected with causality. Also the nature of causality is the foremost as objective and universal law strictly governing all events necessarily. It governs not only physical interactions, but also mental processes. In addition to the ontological role, course understands causality to play epistemological role Causality is the sense and the basis on which we reason in our efforts to discover truth about this world. This is because knowledge in the physical sciences, psychological science, and other disciplines consist in identifying causal relations. These two senses of causality appear in course as synopsis of three essential doctrines of monism. The so-called trinity, trinity of monism states, monism means a unity of source to which it traces the origin explanation of all things and phenomena both spiritual and material, a unity of principle animating the whole world, arranging the order of motion or the mechanics of causality and the unity of its finis end. There's everywhere the same goal, whether the development of evolutionary trends. This trinity covers the scope of monism as a systematic enterprise, referring to its methods, metaphysics and ethics, ethics respectively. The first aspect I've already discussed and the third aspect, uh, um, So this goes on. I have a lot to cover, but yeah, I wanted to give some background on monism as there's a magazine, you know, that, that Chorus and Hegler found of, um, and, you know, Jennifer was mentioning Emerson, and Emerson um, was an author in The Monist. Um, Pierce, William James, Dewey, Perkins, uh, W.E. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, uh, Cornell West. Um, a lot of people have written in the monist. So I um, wanted to give a little background and uh, you know, to the monistic theory, and this was in America. Some European authors. So established in 1890 in America. And the other monistic uh you know, theory, monistic journal, um, monistic society set up in Germany. So we have the riddle of monism, an introductory essay. essay. This is actually to like a book, um, monism, science, philosophy, and the religion and history of the worldview. I think I read this book and you has a more thorough you know, background. And I mentioned Ernst Haeckel, who was the biggest popularizer of the term monism. He wrote a book that you know, sold over 300,000 copies in Germany in the late 1800s. And they'd founded the Monist League. So uh, so Hackle and Natural Stories of Creation, 1868, um, as a Darwinian, has a concept of monism and is one of the biggest philosophy, uh, you know, um, the German Monistic League, which uh, was formed under Hackel in 1906. And so this article covers a lot of the history of monism. Monism became popular among eugenics, communists, um, even the Nazis, monism became, a, it was one of the, you know, it calls the monistic century from like 1850, 1850 to, 19, to the end of World War II. Um, he used the term riddles. The word riddle in its centrality to monism emerged out of dispute between two eminent German scientists over the property boundaries of natural science. Speaking to an audience of several thousand gathered at Germany's largest annual conference of scientists and physicians in 1872, the Berlin physiologist Emile Du Bois Raymond compared natural science to a world conqueror of ancient times, just as his imagined warrior chief might pause in the midst of his victorious career and survey the boundaries of the vast territories he subjugated. 
to discern whether some natural barrier that cannot be overcome by his horsemen might constitute the true limits of his power. Du Bois Reynolds told his listeners that it was fitting if natural science, the world conqueror of our times, resting on a festive occasion from her labor, should strive to define the true boundaries of her immense domain. As one of the best known and most powerful sciences of the capital recently unified Germany, Du Bois Rent Raymond was well placed to speak on behalf of the empire of science. He pinpointed two widely diffuse errors with regard to the limits of natural science that threatened its legitimacy. The origins of movements, first causes, and the origins of consciousness were two questions not open to empirical verifiability, quantitative mechanical explanations. Hence, their investigations did not belong to the realm of natural science. These marked the limits of natural knowledge, and he named them were world riddles. To illustrate the folly of any attempt to cross these limits, he argued that even a scientist with a perfect understanding of neural chemical processes could not no more explain the brain's thoughts than a balloonist could reach the moon, whereas scientists were used to saying, ignoramus, we do not know in the face of pre uh, presently inexplicable scientific problems of a mechanical nature, when faced with world riddles, we must turn back to the utter uh, ignoramus, ignoramus is, we will not know. In the second major speaker on the subject given eight years later, Du Bois Raymond expanded the number of world riddles to seven, some of which science could not presently solve and some of which could never be solved and were hence transcendent. The seven riddles were the relationship of matter and force, the origins of motion, of life, of sensation, of consciousness, and of free will, as well as the apparently purposeful order of nature. He also noted the wide public echo of his earlier uh, ignorabimus, Rather than leading to the acceptance of his riddles as boundary stones, the word had become a type of natural philosophical shibboleth, as in the biblical story where shibboleth was the word used to weed out the members of a hostile tribe who could not pronounce it. Du Bois Reynolds' ignorabimus had succeeded in flushing out its enemies, most particularly Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel responded with speeches and essays, countering Bois Reynolds' ignorabimus with his own Latin slogan, we must proceed without fear. When Hackle finally published a complete system of naturalistic monism in 1899, he took Du Bois Reynolds' uh, Weltrassel as the title of his book. Hackle's book also opened with an imaginary map or survey of the transformations of the whole of our modern civilization, not only by our astounding theoretical progress in sound knowledge of nature, but also the remarkable fertile practical applications of that knowledge in technical science industry, commerce, and so forth. Hackle's map, too, was drawn to characterize a threat to modern civilization, albeit a threat arising from a lack rather than excess of scientific zeal, insufficient progress in moral and social life, threatening grave catastrophes in the political and social world that could be averted only through the spread and application of scientific natural worldview. This worldview was monism. Hackle claimed the theory of substance and evolutionary biology could solve all the riddles that Du Bois Reynolds had posed. In a successive chapter, Hackle offered clear and simple examples from scientific research to prove these points. Hackle and Du Bois Raymond uh, represented two competing conclusions about the meaning of modern science and for culture. Each claimed that he wa his was a mechanical worldview derived entirely from empirical observation. However, where Du Bois Raymond's map of science halted by an act of manly renunciation at the boundary of world riddles, Hegel's map was unbounded, whole, and total. In a narrow sense, this was a debate about what constituted good scientific method. However, it was also a debate over the relationship between disciplines. Du Bois Raymond's rejected Hegel's claim that there was a dualist, that he was a dualist, and in league with Kantian philosophers and religious orthodoxy. However, by calling some of the world riddles transcendent, Du Bois Raymond was indeed setting up an argument for a separate sphere of influence for science and theology, something Stephen Jay Gould with similar anti-monist intent, will later call non-overlapping magisteria. Parallel conclusions were being reached by neo-Kantian philosophers who developed clear methodological boundaries between the empirical science, which sought general laws, and the cultural sciences, which were concerned with historical explanation. The proposed inviability of the world riddles allowed room for a transcendent sphere outside of the natural world and for a human subject outside the natural scientific determinism. It also strengthened discipline boundaries of theology, philosophy, and science, thereby preventing the pollution of science by religion and philosophy. Conversely, Hackle quite consciously saw the eradication of these barriers was essentially if monism was to act as a religion and philosophy 
of imminent transcendence. Monism was, as Hackle declared in a major speech in 1892, a link between religion and science. The debate between Du Bois, Raymond, and Hackle demonstrates paradigmatically how two versions of scientific secularity defined one another through conflict. On the one hand, out of opposition to monism, Du Bois, Raymond developed an argument for a secular order based on scientific self-restraint and disciplinary differentiation. Hegel's position, by contract, might be called secularist rather than secular, as it sought to replace religion with a new universal creed based on empirical natural science. The world riddles mark the key points of friction between monism and dualistic systems. They also form the epistemological and spiritual nodal points of the monist system, thus both a social formulation and philosophical system. The scientific, social, and religious struggles over these boundaries were made were what made monism operational. Exploration of the world riddles naturally formed a research agenda for monist scientists uh, because monist philosophy posited that the universe was an interconnected and unitary order of being raised to self-consciousness through human culture and crowned finally by monistic worldview. It fell to natural science to prove that the world riddles were merely points of transition and not boundaries between the domains of this order. Two of these points of transition stand out as key targets of monist science. The first was the transition from inorganic matter to organic life. So I have a lot to cover. So I would like to read through this whole thing, but uh, encourage people that want to learn more about it to read the whole article. Uh, you know, there's more um, important uh, you know, names and personalities, Feuerbach and uh, Olsted and different views of monism. And then he goes back you know, to um, Goethe, Hegel, Schelling, um, Spinoza, Bruno, a wolf is one, a Christian wolf, 1721, is one of the first people to use the word monism. Um, there was theological monism, um, earlier versions trying to connect science and spirituality. Um, and then monism becomes big in various social movements because the you know the world riddles where monism is claiming to have a universal answer to these questions so the marxist uh the eugenicist the nazis the feminists the homosexuals uh aestheticists all had various forms of monism that largely died out after world war ii so it was where monism was somewhat the dominant philosophy in the late 1800s leading up to world war ii monism fell out of favor um you know 1945 with the end of world war ii to uh you know possibly a re-rise in modern monism so this is an important article it's long but uh yeah i thought i'd mention it so hemholtz is also one of the most important monists. So, um, yeah, I've been talking a lot of, about Hemholtz in relationship to the conservation of energy. And Hemholtz is a precursor to Mach and James and Russellian monism in you know, this concept of um, perception. And so Hemholtz did a lot of research on vision. So let me just read the abstract here. This is a long, like, 60-page article. Um, During the second half of the 19th century in the field of physiological optics, there was a strong controversy between Hermann van Hemholtz and Edwin Herring. The controversy has been usually characterized as empiricism versus nativism in the field of physiologically invisible perception. Several subjects demanded attention among them, color vision. Hemmelts and hearing suggested different theories from their physiological correlation of color sensation and different color spaces to give an account of the relationship between colors. In this ar article, I argue that the contrary between controversy between the two authors could be understand, understood as differences between the two styles of reasoning, and these different styles express different presuppositions. More specifically, I want to suggest that the disagreements could be likened to the discussions on how vital phenomena should be studied. And so Hemholtz questioning 
the nature of vision and the role of the physical and the mind. So just a little Hemholtz here. It may often be rather hard to say how much our apperceptions as derived from the sense of sight is due directly to sensations or how much of them, on the other hand, is due to experience and training. The main point of the controversy between various investigators in this territory is connected also with the difficulty some are disposed to concede to the influence of experience as much scope as possible and to derive from it especially all notions of space. This view may be called the empirical theory. Others, of course, are obliged to admit the influence of experience in the case of certain classes of perceptions still with respect to certain elementary a perceptions that occur uniformly in the case of all observers. They believe it is necessary to assume a system of innate a perceptions that are not based on experience in contradiction to the former view. This may be called the intuition theory of the sense perceptions. Thus, the empirical theory adopts the following methodological corollary. Whatever, therefore, can be overcome by factors of experience, we must consider as being itself the product of experience and training. By observing this rule, we shall find it is merely the qualities of the sensation that are to be considered as real, pure sensations. So this is too much for me to get into detail. Like, I'm already um, you know, almost at three hours and have a lot more I want to cover. So you know, just to mention Hemholtz and perceptions, as I mentioned, Hemholtz, when he, he was the main formulator of the conservation of energy, um, was skeptical about biological processes and how the conservation of energy would work in biological processes. You know, metabolism and um, molecular biology didn't come out till the 1950s. And so Hemmoltz did much work in the nature of vision and you know this question of what he would consider dual processes of mental cognition and physical processes. And so there was monistic understandings at the time. Um, here, so Michael Silverstein is one of the speakers at this year's Science of Consciousness Conference. Um, this is a good essay, but, you know, just time is short, so I'm, I'm only going to, you just, uh, you look at uh, a tiny bit of it. It's so the abstract. It is argued that when it comes to the heart problem of consciousness, neutral monism beats out the competition. It is further argued that neutral monism provides a unique route to a novel type of panentheism via Advaita Vedanta Hinduism. So this is Michael Silverstein, uh, panentheism, neutral monism, and Advaita Vedanta. And uh, he's a speaker at this year's um, Science of Consciousness Conference coming up in Sicily in a few weeks. Why should we care about panentheism? Because it offers us an opportunity to think differently about the relationship between our conscious, experiential, and spiritual selves on the one hand and human beings as conceived by their reigning paradigms in cognitive science and neuroscience on the other the reigning paradigm being just an expression of methodological and metaphysical naturalism. As we will see, panentheism also allows us to think differently about a relationship to the universe as a whole. The reigning paradigm in cognitive science and neuroscience is mechanistic as is computationalism or biological mechanism, what John Searle calls biological naturalism. He asserts that given biological naturalism, the scientific study of consciousness requires two steps. First, discover the neural correlates of consciousness, of the entire field of conscious experience, and second, go from the neural cor correlates of consciousness to a discovery of the actual biological causal mechanisms that give rise to conscious experience. So he will point out that Searle's conception does not appear to be working. And through a process of elimination, Zilberstein argues that The only two options really from the physicalist perspective are um, eliminativism or emergence. And they thought that there's soft emergence or radical emergenceism. And at this point, most people are rejecting uh, soft emergentism, believe that it has to be radical emergentism. It, it was just mentioning that it has to be a dual aspect where mind emerges from matter and then this emergent function of mind could then have a causal effect back on the matter. Um, and then 
the concept of panpsychism that so here's a summary of his argument assume ontological and methodological naturalism are true and therefore substance dualism subjective idealism and the like are non goes conscious experiments can not be simply reduced without remainder to biological or physical processes biological naturalism is a non go as a distinct alternative because it entails radical emergence so for all practical purposes we are left with radical emergence or panpsychism so then he goes on to argue against those points and then will claim that the only reasonable theory left is monism and then a comparison um you know, both radical emergence and panpsychism agree above and therefore both attempt to answer. Um, and so he goes on to uh, you know, the justification for neutral monism. Mental and material features are real, but in some specified sense, reducible to or constructible from a neural basis in a non eliminative sense reduction. The neural basis is generally not conceived as substance, Mental and material features are not separable or merely correlated. They are non-dual. Indeed, they are not essentially different and distinct aspects. So then he brings uh, some William James, one of the founders of monism. And so I apologize just for the synopsis of this article. You know, so hopefully some of the people watching this will be able to read the article. Um, you know, this time is too short to cover this so uh you know if anyone's watching wants to hop on a john wolf you can see you so yeah a lot of, a lot of reading there so anyone wants to hop on talk a few minutes otherwise i have a lot four more articles to uh cover one of these i was hoping to read mostly through because it's pretty uh intense yeah so my research still continues yeah i mean jennifer for schedule changes she's always uh you're welcome back, but uh, yeah, the research has to go on. So here you're going to have Hemholtz and you know this question of neutral monism. What is the neutral element? So Hemholtz, as a precursor to monism, talks about perceptions, and he has his psi theory of perceptions. Efforts to trace the influence of the end of the century neo-Kantism of the early 20th century philosophy of science has led scholars to recognize the powerful influence of Morris Schlicht of the Vienna School on Hermann van Hemmelts uh, of the 19th century physics as a leader of the movement. But Michael Friedman thinks that Schlicht misunderstood Hemmelts' signature philosophical doctrine, the sign theory of perception. Indeed, Friedman has argued that Schlicht transformed Hemmelts' Kantian view of spatial intuition into an empiricist version of the causal theory of perception. However, it will be argued that despite the key role that sign theory played in his epistemology, Schlick thought that Kantianism in Hemmelt's thought was deeply flawed, rendered obsolete by philosophical insight, which emerged from recent scientific developments. So even though Schlick embraced the sign theory, but he rejected Hemmelt's ideas about spatial intuition. In fact, like his teacher, Max Planck, Schlick generalized the sign theory into a form of structural realism. At the same time, Schlick borrowed the method of concept formation developed by the formalist mathematician of Pasch and David Hilbert and combined it with the conventionalism of Henry Pankier, then to link formally defined concepts with experience. Schlick introduced his method of coincidences, similar to the point coincidence featured in Einstein's physics. The result was an original scientific philosophy, which owed much of its contemporary scientific thinkers, but little to Kant or Kantianism. So this is by Thomas Oberend of South Carolina. And so you see the important role of Kant. Even though Kant is generally viewed as a, dual, as, as a dualist, um, you know, the neo-Kantians reformulated Kant into a monistic view and you even, it was mentioned that the Hegler in American Karos are somewhat neo Kantians, although they come to Karos comes to America before the neo Kantians. That most of the monists 
are in the school of neo-Kantians. So how to understand Kant is extremely important to monism. The influence of the end of the century neo-Kantianism of the 20th century philosophy of science has become a focus of scholarly research since the appearance of Alberto Caffa's The Semantic Tradition from Kant to Carnap by examining the formative views of the latter leaders of logical empiricism. Caff uh, argues that their neo-Kantianism was transformed by the revolutionary scientific developments which marked the early 20th century. The confluence of these intellectual forces, uh, neo-Kantianism and the radical revision of space-time physics resulted in the philosophical views which matured into logical empiricism. Evidence in Kaffa's contention can be readily found in the training and early writings of Rudolf Carnap and Hans Reichenbach, and Kaffa regarded Schlicht as the intellectual heir of the neo-Kantian tradition originally conceived by Hermann van Hemholtz and fostered by Schlicht's mentor and physicist Max Planck. Michael Friedman had questioned Schlicht's fitness for the role of neo-Kantian in the tradition of Hemholtz, arguing that much valuable insight was lost in the transformation of the 19th century neo-Kantian thought into logical empiricism. And Hemholtz and Schlick's works, Friedman contrasted the views of Hermann van Hemholtz of the late 19th century physics and the advocate uh, of the Zurk zu Kant movement with Schlick's epistemology as developed in his momentual general theory of knowledge. Schlick's epistemology could well be regarded as a systematic attempt to extend Henholt's signature doctrine, the so-called sign theory of perception, to the entire theory of knowledge. But Friedman argued that the sign theory migrated from the context of Hemholt's thought to Schlick's early epistemology. It was transformed from a modified version of the Kantian concept of space as a subjective form of intuition into an empiricist version of the causal theory of perception. And this difference, Friedman argues, is due primarily to its radical divergences in the understanding of spatial intuitionism and the relationships to space in the philosophical thought of Hemholtz and Schlick. Instead of recognizing the source of spatial concepts and intuition, like Hemholtz, Schlick treats spatial concepts as implicitly defined by a Hilbertian axiomatic system conceived independently of intuition until coordinated with their applications. Friedman appreciates Schlick's perspective, understanding of recent scientific developments, especially the philosophical implications of the axiomatic foundations of geometry explored by Moritz Posh and David Hilbert, as well as Einstein's applications in non-Euclidean geometries to physical space. Yet Schlick embraced the deep separation of concepts and intuitions common at the time, which impedes any effort like Hemmelt's to ground objective physical reality in the subjective space of intuition. Friedman links this uh, thinks that this commitment impedes Schlick's grasp of a sign theory as Hemmelt's originally conceived it, in turn causing him to misunderstand Hemmelt's view on geometry, failing to appreciate the significance of Hemmelt's grounding of geometric empiricism in his analysis of spatial intuition. In what follows below, it will be argued that what Friedman regards as Schlick's misunderstanding is rather a decisive attempt to expand upon Hemmelt's more valuable philosophical insights independently of his neo-Kantianism. Specifically, Schlick extended Hemmelt's sign theory in order to develop an epistemologically incorporated philosophical ideas drawn from leading scientific figures, notably his teacher Max Planck, the ma French mathematician Henry Pankier, and Einstein. Planck developed a structuralist epistemological uh, epistemology by generalizing Hemmelt's sign theory and then destroying it in his critical polemic against the anti-realism of Ernst Mach. And one of the pillars of Schlick's early thought was a variety of conventionalism, which he adapted from Henry Pankier's arguments against geometric empiricism. Finally, there was Schlick's method of coincidences, which links objective scientific concepts with sensory experience. And while the resulting theory of scientific knowledge relies on ideas from Planck, Pankier, and Einstein, it is incontestably Schlick's own creative product, thus the scientific epistemology developed by Schlick's general theory of Knowledge differed profoundly from Hemholtz's neo-Kantianism, which had been rendered obsolete by recent developments. The discussion which follows begins with Hemholtz's classic essay on the facts in perception. In this work, Hemholtz's presentation of the sign theory reveals a deep underlying Kantianism, which explains the bearing of issues in perception on the foundations of geometry and in the centenary collection of Hemholtz's epistemological writings Edited by Schlicht and the physicist Paul Hertz in 1921, Schlicht emphasizes his agreement with Hemmelt's view, as well as the importance of Hemmelt's insights for his own epistemological thought. In the subsequent section, focus is directed on Schlicht's presentation of the sign theory, in which he describes it more as just a theory of perception, but the essence of all knowledge, implying that the sign theory provides the basis 
for a comprehensive epistemology, the generalizing of sign theory into the view that all cognition consists of structural representations of what is known is an idea borrowed from Planck's epistemological writings, especially his celebrated essay on the unity of the physical world picture. The result is an epistemological structuralism joined with Planck's own strident realism, which in turn formed the core of Schlick's epistemology. Um, in the fourth section of the discussion turns the transcendental foundation, the Hemmelt's geometric empiricism, and the challenge it faced from the conventionalist arguments of Pankier in his comments on the facts of perception. Slick concurred with Pankier's critique, thus fitting the latter conventionalism to the structure realism adopted from Planck. But all this is simply a prelude to Friedman's criticism of Schlick, which concerns the role of the sign theory in Hemmelt's efforts to ground physical geometry and spatial intuition. According to Friedman, Schlick simply cannot conceive of any relationship between physical geometry and intuition because it violates Schlick's fundamental distinction between concepts and intuition. But Friedman's contention neglects a key feature of Schlick's epistemology. While the gulf separating conceptual knowledge and intuitive acquaintance is a basic feature of Schlick's epistemology, one of the most impressive accomplishments of his philosophical thought is his method of coincidences, which grounds theoretical constructions in sensory experiences. The result is nothing less than an account of empirical scientific knowledge as the objective conceptualization of subjective intuition. Then Schlick's treatment of Hemholtz is not misunderstanding of the latter's analysis of spatial intuition at all, but a decisive rejection of his Kantianism. And this in turn undermines any effort to locate Schlick in the neo-Kantian tradition of Hemholtz and Planck as Koffer, Friedman, and others have tried to do. The sign theory. The fundamental idea of Hemholtz sign theory was that perception are signs or placeholders for their sources, but do not resemble or copy them in any way. As Friedman has pointed out, Hemmelt assumed in his essay of 1855 that perceptions are the eff effects of the nervous system of objects in the external world. So perceptual experiences presupposes the operation of ca causality, and causality is therefore a fundamental law of our thought, which precedes all experience, just as Kant thought. Moreover, since sensations are signs of something external, the association among sensations represents corresponding regularities among their sources. The regular change or serial order of signs reflects the connections relating their origins. At this point, Hemmelt also concluded that the changes among sensations are the effects of alterations among their causes, which are the characteristic inference of the causal theory of perception, the inference to the unobservable causes of observable phenomenon. And this inference is correct. Then a if this inference is correct, then appearances are the effects of causes which lie beyond the realm of appearances in violation of Kant's restriction of causality to appearances. Nor was this passage the first time Hemmelt's breached Kantian constraints on causality. In his 1847 memoir on the conservation of force, Hemmelt began with the idea that the very capacity to conceptualize nature depends on the ability to trace the series of causes from their effects in appearance back to those ultimate unalterable causes underlying all changes in nature. This line of reasoning, like those, like the one from Dash Sahin, affirms the classical causal theory of perception contrary to Kant's understanding of causality. But in his later 1881 notes to his memoir on force, Hemmelt's corrected himself recalling that Kant's view on causality were limited to lawfulness among appearances and the lawfulness obtained Obtaining among appearances did not warrant the inference to causal eff efficacious reality lying beyond the appearances. In the facts of in perception, Hemmelt had concluded that all localization of objects in space are nothing more than the discovery of the lawfulness of the connections obtaining among our motions and our perceptions, and the differences between what is actually perceived and its metaphysical interpretations is just the differences between the regularities and our perceptions and the hypothesis of enduring substantial sources causing the perceived regularities. The conclusion sig signals an important shift in Hemmelt's thought from the causal theory of his earlier writings towards an increasing respect for the Kantian limits of causality. Thus, it seems that as both uh, Hatfield and Friedman recognized, Hemmelt was unclear about Kant's idea of causality in the early years of his career, but his sensitivity to the nuances of Kant's thought de deepened over time. Still, the closet closest Hemmelt's ever came to a Kantian orthodoxy was the conclusion that in Hatfield's words, the law-like regularities manifest in the changes among sensation or signs is constitutive of the real. Friedman says that Schlick was scandalized by Hemmelt's 
efforts to identify the external causes standing behind uh, the play of our sensations with the law-like relations governing them. After all, Hemmels had refined the law-like connections among sensations by identifying them with the power to produce sensations, thus identifying laws as causes, a move which Schlicht regarded as truly inappropriate. In his memoir, The Conservation of Force, Hemmels transformed the lawfulness of certain patterns of sensations into the concept of a law, identifying the objective power of the law with force, and thus reducing the reality of material bodies and scientific entities to a conceptual substitute. But concepts, concepts according to Schlick, can never be real in the same sense in which the concepts, contents of consciousness or transcendent things in themselves are. Moreover, since Hemmels' view denies the reality of the causes of sensation, Schlick included him among the eminent philosophers like John Stuart Mill, Ernst Mach, uh, Petstolt, and early Bertrand Russell. All these thinkers limit reality to the given, the realm of colors, taste, and smells, as well as other sensations. Thus, eminent philosophers acknowledge the reality of appearances, but deny the reality of their causes, which are essentially what later philosophers of science called theoretical or unobservable entities, uh, in which Schlick called things in themselves. The reality of transcendent objects is expressly denied, thus abjuring the causal realism implicit in the everyday and scientific talk of objects which exist and endure beyond momentary sensations, but Schlick had a completely different attitude towards Helmholtz sign theory, which is evident from Schlick's comments on the facts and perception. Helmholtz introduced the sign theory and the facts after recalling that his teacher, uh, Johannes Muller, argued that the effects of a stimulus depend on the type of nerve ending affected. Helmholtz immediately added that in so much as the quality of our sensation gives us a report of what is particular to the external influence by which it is excited, it may count as a symbol of it, but not as an image. A sensation need not provide a resemblance of likeness of its source, nor need the sensation of the stimuli share any similarity of it, yet sensations remain critical sources of information, since like sensations will necessarily be associated with stimuli and unlike with unlike. From an image, one requires some kind of a likeness of form, but a sign need not have any kind of similarity at all with what is the sign of. The relationship between the two of them is restricted to the fact that like objects exerting an influence under like circumstances evoke like signs, and that therefore unlike signs always correspond to unlike influences. Schlick agreed that perceptions need not bear any resemblance to their signification, and that regularities among sensations ground law-like relations among what they signify. One of the two fundamental tenets of the sign theory, Schlick and Hemmels were in complete agreement, Lush Schlick wrote, in its general theory of knowledge, part one, an attempt is made to show that forming such an image of what is law-like in the actual, with the help of a sign system altogether constitutes the essence of all knowledge, and that therefore our cognitive systems can only in this way fulfill its task and need no other method for doing so. Schlick's use of Hemmels terminology in his endorsement of the sign theory leaves no doubt that he understands and accepts the idea of the structural series of sign provides an image of what is law-like in reality, and Hemmels further states that the sign theory in no way diminishes the value of sensations since they will allow us to form an image of the lawfulness of the process of the actual world. Thus, it appears that Hemmels and Schlick completely concur that causes of sensations are elements of the actual world in Hemmels term or reality in Schlick's. Uh, apparently, there is not the slightest shade of difference in the respective understandings of the most fundamental precepts of the sign theory. This is particularly surprising given Schlick's characterization of Hemmels as an eminence philosopher in the general theory of knowledge. According to Schlick, an eminence philosophers reject observable causes of observable phenomena and hence causal theory. Consequently, it's difficult to understand how Schlick could possibly agree with Helmholtz and any attempt to determine the intent of his agreement appears to be fraught with difficulty. The key to its resolution lies in the fact that Helmholtz identifies the real world with that which influences us standing behind the change of appearance, namely the actual. Indeed, Friedman emphasizes that it's precisely these terms that Hemmels expresses the Kantian contrast as he understands it between appearances and things in themselves as that between the actual and the real. Indeed, Hemmels equates the real with Kant's thing in itself, and he contrasts the actual with the real because he believed there is a further secondary reference to enduring existence as substance that the context of the real includes. 
The endurance with Hemmels mentions the enduring existence, which Hemmels mentions, is essentially a reference to the substantial uh, dinge on sich, which are unknowable in principle. But this conception of dinge on sich differs radically from slick. For one thing, Hemmels, dinge on sich are not, on Friedman's telling, identical with causal reality, responsible for sensation, though that is precisely the function of things in themselves in Schlick's epistemology. Unlike Hemmels, Schlick identifies things in themselves with whatever is real but not given, including the theoretical posits of the advanced sciences. As such, things in themselves are the causal sources of the given beyond the given and things in themselves. There is, for Schlick, simply no further category of the real. In short, in short Schlick would never have accepted the existence of enduring substantial entities other than the unperceived causes of sensations, which he called things in themselves, structural realism. Schlicht expresses endorsement of the sign theory as general claims that treating representations as signs constitutes the essence of all knowledge for a very good reason. He was emphasizing that not only perceptions, but other representations as well signified by means of their relation to one another rather than by virtue of any iconic relation they bear to what they represent. The result is nothing less than the epistemic structuralism, according to which the relations among cognitive representations signify structures rather than, say, individual objects or their properties. This generalization of the sign theory is already evident in the writing of Schlick's mentor, Max Planck. Planck himself had been deeply impressed by Hemmholtz, who was his own occasional teacher and his later his colleague, and whose influence is particularly evident in Planck's 1908 leading lecture on the unity of physics, physical worldview. Of course, the aim of Planck's philosophical efforts was to discredit Ernst Mach's philosophical views. Mach's regarded physical objects as unnecessary hypostatizations, implying that the mechanical view underlying physics was little more than an elaborate myth. In the science of mechanics and the analysis of sensations and the principles of theory of heat, he develops the idea that the phenomena are the basic constituents for which substantive objects of common sense and everyday objects are constructed, like Planck. Mach conceived science structurally as the study of the structural relations among phenomenal elements. Thus, out of the sensory impression of colors, sounds, feelings, and smells, which build the ordinary experience, those combinations, which are relatively more fixed and permanent, are most prominent imprinting themselves on memory and requiring distinctive linguistic designations, in particular those complexes of impressions which are functionally connected in time and space. Although they are by no means permanent, are christened with distinctive names and are called bodies. The body is the basis of the first and most naive notion of substance. These unnecessary postulated substances are merely the result of relating sensory elements to form the subject matter of the physical sciences. Ultimately, this is true of atoms as well, which Mach regarded as simply another instance of substantial entities hypothesized, hypothesized to account for what are at bottom relations among phenomena. It has been suggested that Mach's opposition to atomism was initially based on metaphysical misgivings rather than empirical concerns, as if atoms were transcendental rather than very small physical objects. Planck mistakenly attributed Mach's opposition to the metaphysical commitment to centralism, when in fact Mach's epistemological structuralism is closer to neutral monism, as even Bertrand Russell noted. Nonetheless, Planck thought his own Radiation Law of 1900, which relied on Boltzmann's statistical approach to thermodynamics, was proof of atomism since Boltzmann had already subjected Ostwald's energetics, the principal challenge to atomism, to a scathing critique at the Lubeck's conference in 1895. The only task remained for Planck was to demonstrate the bankruptcy of Mach's epistemology. Planck started from Hemmel's belief that our perceptions provide not a representation of the external world, but merely furnish the physicist with a sign which he must interpret. In the earliest stages of physical inquiry, distinct fields were distinguished by the different sensory modalities associated with their origins, but with further development of any field, whether acoustics, thermodynamics, or optics, its origin and experience are soon abandoned. By mathematically abstracting the qualitative contents of perceptions, the anthropomorphism in representations is reduced and distinct domains of inquiry, previously rooted in the different sensory modalities, may be unified. In other words, knowledge of the physical world advances by first abstraction the structure of perceptions from their sensory origins, and then subsequently extending the process of abstraction by further mathematical generalizations. In general, scientific advance 
requires the mathematical move from a given domain of elements to another in which the elements of the earlier stage are discarded and replaced with others. Thus, Planck envisions a successive of structural representations converging towards an accurate representation of reality. Planck's basic view is thus an early variety of epistemic structuralism, the idea that it is not the nature of objects which is known, but their structure is understood as the relationship to other objects. The operative understanding of structure is, of course, given by the mathematical representation of phenomenon illustrated by Planck here in his characterization of evolution from Francis wave optics to the electromagnetic theory of James Clerk Maxwell. The key difference between these earlier and later theories of light is that Frenzel conceived light as disturbances in a mechanical medium, the ether, and developed a series of equations describing the behavior of light as it passes through a medium of different optical densities. Subsequently, Maxwell treated light as a kind of electromagnetic radiation which presupposes no mechanical medium and hence no ether. Nonetheless, Frenzel's equations may be deduced from Maxwell's implying that the structure of Frenzel's conception is subsumed in the structure of Maxwell. In Planck's thought, as well as Planckier, epistemic structuralism was but a prelude to structural realism, and Planck thought his own theoretical work had contributed to the unification of the world picture by grounding thermodynamic phenomenon in mechanical principles. And this understating is just the natural result of extending Hemmelt's sign theory of perception to include theoretical as well as perceptual representation. Thus, Planck's transformation of Hemmelt's sign theory effectively collapses Hemmelt's categories of the actual and the real, but what Hemmelt's called the real was distinguished by its reference to enduring substance, which has no role in structural epistemology. In Planck's conclusion that the actual and the real are one and the same was celebrated by Schlicht as an expression of Planck's sound and vibrant realism. For both Schlicht and Planck, the collapse of the actual and the real is tantamount to the repudiation of the Kantian thing in of itself as a transcendental condition, but not a cause of appearances. In Schlicht's general theory of knowledge, the new role for things in themselves is embedded in the structuralist theme that both everyday and scientific knowledge is relational. To know something is to know it as something else. Hence, knowing is strictly distinguished from being acquainted with, which is simply consciousness of an intuition. Of course, an intuition may still be brought under concepts and hence known as something else. The relational character of knowledge is complemented by Schlick's treatment of scientific concept formation. Scientific concepts are formed by means of implicit definitions which stipulate the relations of concepts to one another, just as the primitive concepts of a mathematical discipline are defined in terms of one another by the axioms of the discipline. An implicit definition such as a fully contained with no relations to intuitive experience and at no point does it rest on the ground of reality. The definitions of objective quantitative concepts by means of axioms is completely independent of empirical matters and is only when such concepts are linked to intuitions that they can be mobilized in the expressions of empirical knowledge. In Slick's words, we concerned ourselves with the abstract only in order to apply it to the intuitive. Thus, Slick's early thought, like Planck's, is a form of structural realism. In this respect, it is not unlike the views of the turn of the century neo Kantians like Ernst Cassier, who also combined the rejection of Kant's things in themselves with epistemic structuralism. However, if these analogies she suggests that Schlicht is a neo-Kantian of some sort. The suggestion is readily disproved by his treatment of geometry. Conventions. In his, 19, in his 1868 essay on the facts underlying geometry, Hemmelt argued that the properties of spatial intuition are in fact learned through higher order cognitive processes. The title of Hemmelt's essay intentionally parodies Riemann's classical article in order to emphasize that unlike Riemann, Hemmelt was focused on the transcendental facts which distinguish three-dimensional space of experience from other continuous manifolds. In particular, Hemmelt's focus on three-dimensional infinite spaces which satisfy the condition of free mobility. This includes not only Euclidean geometry, but any three-dimensional geometry of constant curvature. Of course, free mobility represents a condition of the possibility of sensory experience involving motion and perception, so the necessary condition underlying three-dimensional geometries of constant curvature rest upon the very regularities which ground spatial intuition, or specifically the capacity to locate objects in space. If these presuppositions are satisfied, it then becomes an empirical matter to determine which of these geometries describe physical space. Consequently, even though space is transcendental, the particular geometry structure of physical space is empirical. So geomet geometric representations correspond to the law-like 
regularities occurring in spatial intuitions of what is law-like in the phenomenon. But what Hemholtz declared that the existence of rigid rods is a fact of experience, Schlick demurred, commenting that the conclusion drawn by Hemholtz is only admissible if it is true that every presupposition must either have a logical foundation or have originated in experience and thus cannot have come from a third source. Schlick's charge is just that Hemholtz's argument presents a false dichotomy since it neglects the possibility that the experience of rigid rods is simply a convention. This is implicit reference to Pankier's reply in Science and Hypothesis to the related question, are the geometric axioms synthetic a priori propositions or empirical truth? Pankier argued that the axioms of geometry cannot be synthetic judgments a priori because if they were, it would be impossible to conceive alternatives to non-Euclidean geometries would be simply impossible, nor can the geometric axioms be empirical truths since they treat of ideal objects and there are no such objects in experience or in other words geometry cannot be both empirical and ideal. Thus Pompier included that the geometrical axioms are therefore neither synthetic a priori intuitions nor experimental facts, they are conventions. And Schlicht extended this argument when he denied Hemmelt's conclusion that the axiom of free mobility is a transcendental fact of the matter. This in turn diffuses Hemmelt's conclusion the facts underlying geometry that the choice of geometry can only be determined empirically. Schlick first endorsed the conventionalism in his 1915 essay on the philosophical significance of the relativity principle, where he borrowed the idea of conventions from Pankier to use in the central argument of this essay. In that context, what was at stake was the choice between the Lawrence Fitzgerald hypothesis, which posited a real effect of absolute motion of length and Einstein's relativity principle, which allowed the events may be temporarily ordered in a particular way for a specific system of reference and differently ordered for some other system. Since the alternatives are physically equivalent, the decision between them is a matter of convention. Uh, Schlick's understanding of conventionalism is grounded in the idea that is primarily constitutive principles, the precepts which define the logical semantic framework of discussion that are conventions. This departs significantly from Pankare's conventionalism, which is based on the inherent limitations of the evidence determining choices of foundational precepts. But rather than attribute the conventionality to a lack of decisive empirical evidence, Schlick implicitly assumed that every genuine empirical claim presupposes a semantic apparatus consisting of non-empirical principles which are chosen by convention. Then it is possible to distinct alternative theories may both designate the facts univocally because certain features of the symbol system are left to our arbitrary action. We can select them in a way or that without damaging the unit vocal character of the correlation. Whether semantic frameworks employ different symbols or interpret them differently, there is no fact of the matter concerning which is right or wrong, correct or incorrect. Thus, the choice of a system framework rests on the arbitrary convention. The form of conventionalism will, of course, imply that whatever there are two sets of scientific statements which differ because they are formulated in different semantic frameworks, no factual matter can decide between them. Applied to geometry, it follows that no experience can compel us to lay down a particular geometrical system such as Euclid as a basis for depicting the physical regularities of the world. Entirely different systems can actually be chosen for this purpose. Though in that case, we also have at the same time to adopt other laws of nature. The last conclusion evolved into the geometrical relativity of space. In Schlick's 1917 monograph on space-time and contemporary physics, eventually passing into positivistic lore as the relativity of geometry, the form it received in Hans Reichenbach's philosophy of space and time. If Schlick is right about Hemmelt's argument, then Friedman's contention that Hemmelt successfully grounds the foundation of geometry in his analysis of spatial intuition simply fails. That is because Hemmelt's assumptions that the principle of free mobility is rooted in the same law like regularities which make spatial intuition possible, but rather than acknowledges that Schlick had identified an error in Hemmelt's argument Friedman contends that Schlick's criticisms are essentially a defense of his own distinction between intuitive apprehension and conceptual thinking. Unfortunately, this distinction has nothing to do with the argument under discussion. Rather, the argument shows that Hemmelt's efforts to ground the principle of free mobility in spatial intuition fails for the quantitative precision required to guarantee free mobility is simply not to be found in intuitive experiences. And so, too, Friedman's counter to Schlick simply misses its mark, yet he tries the same approach to Schlick's further criticism of Hemmelt's claim that higher-order cognitive processes, specifically deduction and induction, are necessarily ingredients 
of the identification of spatial locations of objects, Helmholtz adapted Mill's inventory of innate inferential mechanisms, which was essentially limited to the principles of syllogistic reasoning and added inductive reasoning as well. This was because Helmholtz thought that the syllogisms involved in the spatial location of objects required universal major premises, which in turn can only be derived from experience by induction. Thus, the conclusions that a particular object can be found by innervating the nervous mechanisms in a certain way can only be deduced from a major premise based on the evidence concurrently available concerning the locations of objects in past experiences and how the ocular muscles must be activated to locate them by means of an innate capacity to associate the premises of induction relating to the relevant features of the individual cases, the needed generalizations inferred in particular cases, the unconscious inferences may proceed syllogistically. Of course, Hemmelt's innovation violates Kant's ball plan of reason, of which higher order cognitive processes like induction and deduction never play a role in the identification and synthesis of sensory inputs. And that is because these processes involve complex cognitive functions belonging to the faculty of understanding rather than intuition, which is the passive faculty of receptivity. And that is no doubt why Hemmelt regarded his innovation as significant advance beyond Kant's architectonic. Friedman claimed that Hamilton's discussion of unconscious inference is anathema to Schlick since they challenged the distinction between intuition and conceptual thinking. However, Schlick's criticism of Hemholtz theory does not mention this distinction at all, nor for that matter any philosophical issue. Rather, his criticism depends entirely on recent results in empirical psychology. It is noted that modern psychology energetically rejects Hemholtz's celebrated theory of unconscious inferences since there are ample grounds for considering them to be nothing more than the process of association. But Friedman also worries that Schlick's distinction between intuition and concepts is incompatible with any relationship between special intuition and physical geometry. And that is because Schlick criticizes Hemmelt's efforts to relate the two. Of course, if Friedman is right, then it would be difficult to see how Schlick could possibly link the intuitions and concepts of his own epistemology. But the salient feature of Schlick's distinction between intuitions and concepts is that the former, but not the latter, can uh, be objects of acquaintances, and acquaintance is a form of knowledge because it does not relate intuitions to anything else. And the principal theme of Schlick's epistemology is, after all, that to know something is to know it as something else. Then the difference between acquaintances and knowledge is used in section 12 of general theory of knowledge to critique ideas of intuitive knowledge like those of Herschel and Bergson. Since, however, intuitions can be subsumed under concepts, they can be known as something else. So Friedman's idea that Schlick Criticism of Hemmelt's are rooted in the distinction between intuitions and concepts is simply a distraction from the central issue. Indeed, Schlick never thought Hemmelt's efforts to uncover the foundation of geometry and spatial intuition was wrongheaded or misguided. Rather than Hemmelt's efforts simply failed, his own approach to the same problem incorporated the structural realism he learned from Planck, along with the formalism of an implicit definition and the conventionalism he adapted from Poincaré, finally introduced coordination to relate the abstract formally defined concepts to intuition in order to ensure the empirical significance. And it is at this juncture that Schlick introduces his method of coincidences to provide a detailed account of coordinations. Coincidences. The most striking feature of Schlick's method of coincidences is its similarity to the basic ingredients of Einstein's point coincidence arguments in the latter's review essay on general relativity. In 1916, the year that Einstein wrote the essay, Schlick was writing what became the first edition of his general theory of knowledge. Soon he was residing in the environs of Berlin. Einstein also had various responsibilities in Berlin, and they may well have met to discuss their mutual interest in the epistemological significance of the new physics. After all, they had been in contact since 1915 when they corresponded about Schlick's essay on the philosophical significance of the principle of relativity, which Einstein praised for its clarity as well as mastery of the scientific details. By 1916, Einstein's thoughts had moved on to general theory, and he explained his ideas on covariance to Schlick, including the conclusion of the point coincidence argument that thereby time and space lose the last remnant of physical reality. Einstein's conclusion captured Slick's imagination, who later explained that his monograph on space and time in contemporary physics was less a representation of the general theory itself than a thought, uh, a thoroughgoing elucidation on the thesis that space and time have now forfeited all objectivity in physics. Given this, 
background, it's hardly surprising that Schlick featured his method of coincidences in his general theory of knowledge, which he was writing at the time. In Schlick's epistemology, the method of coincidences functions as the mechanism which relates abstract formal defines concepts with intuitive content. In geometry, for example, the method of coincidences constructs a bottom-up connection, which relates qualitative spatial intuitions by means of coincidences, singularities, in which intuitions of different sensory modalities coincide at the same intuitive spatial temporal point. Then the resulting intuitions may be linked in a top-down fashion by the coordination of objective concepts and axiomatically defined geometries with intersubjective spatial ones, the bottom-up phase begins with intuitive images which are inherently spatial since the exhibit relative locations as well as spatial extensions within each of the sense modalities so that the topological orderings of smells as well as taste and so on in is given in experience the spatial frameworks of each of these sense modalities are then coordinated organizing them in a single unified intuitive ordering for instance when a person sees a bruise spot on her leg and touches it with her forefinger, a singularity occurs, which involves both the visual and tactile fields. The coincidence of these two distinct types of sensory data, the sight of the bruise and the sensation of touch, contributes to the coordination of the spatial orders of the different sense modalities, thus creating an intersensory spatial order. This simple example of the kind of singularity by the point coincidence demonstrates why all of them can be brought under a single system of ordering, which by this very fact also becomes a type of ordering for transcendent things. Strictly speaking, another stage is necessary to coordinate point coincidences among distinct individuals so that the resulting point coincidences are generally intersubjective. If, for instance, an instructor wishes to draw attention to, say, the hypotenuse of a triangle on a blackboard at the front of a class by pointing to it, he affects the coincidence between the tip of his finger and the hypotenuse. Every witness to the demonstration observes the coincidence of the two visual points from their own distinct perspective. What they all share are their observations of the coincidence created by the contact of the instructor's finger with the feature on the figure on the blackboard. The next stage in the coordination of concepts and intuitions relate implicitly define concepts to intersubjective point coincidences like the one identified by the instructor's finger in the feature of the triangle drawn on the board. Of course, all measurements, all quantitative determinations of space and time as well are based on just such coincidences, whether it is the coincidence of the ends of measuring stick with the edge of an object or the hand of a clock coinciding with one of the numbers of the clock's face. Any two perceptual objects which coincide in the same sensory domain or distinct sensory fields may be correlated with transcendent things which share a point in the objective order to preserve uniqueness of designation. It is in this way that the method of coincidences affects the coordination of the objective geometry of transcendent things with the domain of the intuitive, but the linkage between the intuitive order and the objective spatial temporal one is neither an identity of the physical with the intuitive nor def definition of physical things in terms of intuitions in space-time and contemporary physics, Schlicht explained the limits of the method. The objects of the physics are therefore not the data of sense. The space of the physics is not in any way given with our perception, but is a product of our conceptions. We cannot therefore ascribe the physical objects of space of intuition with which our visual perceptions have made us acquainted, nor that which we find present in our tactual presentations, but only a conceptual arrangement, which we then term objective space and determine by means of a suitable disposed manifold of numbers or coordinates. Thus, objective space conceptually constructed by implicit de definitions is linked to intuitive space by the method of coincidences. Of course, intuitive geometry, including the spatial relations constructed by point coincidences, remains strictly topological with no quantitative structure in relativity theory it is linked with correlations with an object Riemannian manifold satisfying the conditions that the metric is at any point Minkowskian and in finite re regions satisfies Einstein's equations relating to the distribution of masses. The success of the resulting physics depends on the recognition of the fact that the intrinsic structure of spatial intuition is insufficient to definitely ground or uniquely determine physical geometry. Conclusion. Schlick's method of coincidence clarifies his understanding of how concepts and intuitions are related, thus illuminating the difference which separate his understanding of the sign theory from Helmholtz's neo-Kantian version. While these differences are indeed profound, they are by no means the result of a simple misunderstanding on Schlick's parts, Friedman's arguments notwithstanding. Both Helmholtz and Schlick 
begin with the core idea that perceptions are signs rather than images, so that it is their serial ordering which yields epistemic access to what is law-like in the actual world or reality. As far as these fundamentals are concerned, there is not the slightest difference between Hemmelt's but Schlick and Schlick, but rather thorough going consensus. Differences first arise when Hemmelt embeds the core ideas of the sign theory and the Kantian distinction between the actual and the real, and his motivation seems to be the reality. Hemmelt's core elate of the Kantian thing in itself carries with it a sense of Aristotelian scholastic substance, which function as the underlying substrate of all change. Schlick, by contrast, followed Planck's generalization of the sign theory into an epistemological structuralism, thereby eliminating Hemmelt's distinction between the actual and the real. The difference then between Hemmelt's and Schlick's conception concerns the metaphysical baggage with which Hemmelt burdened the sign theory. And this is evident from the fact that it is only Hemmelt's later version of the sign theory laden with the Kantian distinction between appearance and reality, which differ from the version of the theory featured by Schlick's epistemology. This much of the preceding argument shows that Schlick's epistemological structuralism led him to repudiate features of orthodox Kantianism which had also been abandoned by many turn of the century neo-Kantians to Schlick. The obvious conclusion was structural realism, the legacy of his mentor, Max Planck, but Schlick's decisive break with Kantianism in all its forms came with the adoption of Planckier's conventionalism. And Schlick's philosophy, conventionalism concerned concept formulation and the coordinating coordinations linking concepts and intuitions, rendering Kantian, Kantian efforts to ground geometric concepts and spatial intuitions pointless, like Hemmelt's, Schlick recognized that the intrinsic spatial, spatial relations among intuitions failed to provide the quantitative structure necessary to ground objective geometry. Hemmelt, of course, regarded this undetermination as transcendental fact underlying geometry, implying that the specifics of geometry must therefore be determined on empirical grounds. Schlick, following Pankier, argued that Hemmelt's conclusions rested on a false dichotomy which impl implicitly included the possibility that geometry is conventional, and Schlick further explained how conceptual structures are formed, and in turn related to intuitions. Many of these ideas, though philosophical, were inspired by developments in the advanced mathematical sciences and were first articulated by Planck, Planck here, and Einstein. Of course, their idea were part of the exciting intellectual scene of Schlick's formative years and contributed key ingredients to the philosophical perspective in which Schlick brought to bear on the philosophical issues of the day. By the time he co-edited Hemmelt's epistemological writings with Paul Hertz in 1921, Schlick's writings formed a substantial body of work which articulated a well-developed philosophical position, including this corpus was notably a master full text on epistemology, but a highly regarded monograph applying the insights of his theory of knowledge to the new physics of relativity. In the same year that he finished the Hemmelt's book, he was nominated for the Chair of Philosophy of the Inductive Sciences of the University of Vienna, previously occupied by such luminaries and Max of Mach and Boltzmann. When he assumed the appointment in the fall of 1922, he joined the mathematician Hans Hahn, who played a key role in securing Schlick's appointment, as well as the social economic Otto North, Hans North, along with the physicist Philip Frank, who succeeded Einstein at Prague, had been discussing the prospects of scientific philosophy off and on since 1907, and even though they were not professionally for philosophers, they developed from their readings and discussions the beginning of a genuine conception of the scientific enterprise. Their discussions presumed the rejection of school philosophies exemplified by the varieties of neo-Kantianism then currently in Germany. Instead, their vision married Pankier's conventionalism to Mach's structural phenomenalism tempered with Duhem's instrumentalism. Despite the fact that their view was not nearly as well-formed as Schlick's, they shared a broad consensus, putting aside their differences and pushing new avenues of inquiry. Instead, soon they were calling themselves the Schlick Zirkle, drawing, drawing go in, in their group. Among them uh, was Rudolf Carnap, and then there was Hans new student, Kirk Gordell, who shared in his interest in logic with Carnap at about the same time Schlick and his student uh, Weissman began meeting regularly with Lu Ludwin Wittgenstein, whose tractus had already been read and studied in the circle. Together, these thinkers explored the prospects of new conception scientific enterprise, a generally original scientific philosophy. Okay, Oswald, Elliot, yeah, thanks for joining, being in the chat. If anyone wants to pop on a minute and chat, I had a few more articles. Let me get more tea for a second.
Yes, I really wanted to in depth cover this um, your monism. So you might be a pretty dry topic to a lot of people um, and it's scientific to a large level also because um, you know specifically related to high levels of physics, relativity, um, um, and so I talked in my philosophy of science series a lot about uh, you know neo-Kantianism, Kant, um, the Vienna Circle, you know, leading to scientific realism uh, as the main schools of scientific philosophy. So at some point, metaphysics dropped from the picture, from like the Kantian view, where Kant became a less dominant thinker. And monism played a big part in it. You know, it's called like the monistic century. Hemholtz, uh, Mach, Schlicht are all monist. You know, they, they even have like the monist league. Not everyone's a monist. Like not not like monism wasn't universal among everybody. There were still dualists and the beginnings of physicalism. However, monism is you know, a dominant, extremely important um, aspect. So this is another long one. So um, 20th century variants of dual aspect thinking. This is also by Atmosbacher of uh, Zurich, Switzerland. In the philosophy of mind and the psychology as well as the cognitive science, the program of naturalizing the mind is conventionally understood as an attempt to reduce whatever appears to mental to physical explanations. In recent decades, this has become a central motif in cognitive neuroscience and consciousness studies, where it features the reduction of conscious states to brain behavior. In the long run, the resulting physicalism can be viewed as a counter position against both idealistic positions and Cartesian dualism. But is physicalism the only alternative? At least in Spinoza, there's a tradition of dual aspect thinking in which both the physical and mental are constructed as aspects of the underlying reality, which is itself neutral in respect to the mind-matter distinction. I will present and compare some selected variants of dual aspect thinking in the 20th century, such as Bertrand Russell's neutral monism and the holistic dual aspect monism of Wolfgang Pauli and the uh, Carl Gustav Jung and David Bohm's implicate order and naturalistic dualism, according to David Chalmers. They can all be viewed as versions of naturalism that aim at a concept of nature beyond the duality of the mental and the physical. Kinds of naturalism. The basic idea connected with the term naturalism is that reality is exhausted by nature, containing nothing supernatural, and that the scientific method should be used to investigate all areas of reality, including the human spirit. So, so Papineau, in his entry of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it is evident that the characterization is not particularly informative, as he himself admits it is, if not only for its lacking precision, then also because it just offsets the explanatory load from the notion of nature to the notion of reality and leaves open how the latter should be understood. Papineau's entry focuses on the understanding of nature, whose development began in the early 20th century and eventually led to the almost hegemonical pretense of what today is called physicalism. In a nutshell, physicalism pretends that nature is ultimately what physics is all about. Today, naturalism appears essentially construed as physicalism and naturalizing the mind means to explain mental states and their behavior by brain states and their behavior. Most contemporary neuroscientists adhere, knowing that they're not to this physical program, but the notion of naturalism is neither historically nor systematically restricted to physicalism, as discussed by Hampe. There is a variety of different versions of this kind of physicalism, eliminative, epiphenomenal, reductive, non-reductive, which I cannot discuss in detail here. Uh, our crucial assumption in all of them is the causal closure of the physical, meaning that every event in nature that has a cause has a physical cause. This assumption is widely held without discomfort, though a number of authors, authors have recently expressed concerns about its unquestioned validity. But many of the great hopes, the promises that the enunciators of the so-called decade of the brain, 1990 to 1999, generated are still unfulfilled today. There is no doubt that the brain research yielded important insights, yet an understanding of the fundamental problem, the relationship between our mental lives and what our brains do, solely has become 
remained an open problem. The naive idea of one-to-one -one neural correlates of consciousness states had proven pure fantasy and other physicalist-oriented ideas replacing it may turn out difficult to realize as well. At present, we can see that the lack of success of the physicalist approach towards one of the deepest questions in the history of humankind, the nature of the mind-matter correlation, entails the search for an alternative approaches. There is a touch of irony in the fact that a most prominent one among these alternatives is grounded in another long neglected, neglected kind of naturalism, which differs substantially from physicalism. It has received increasing attention under the notion of dual aspect thinking. The historical protagonist of dual aspect thinking in philosophy is Spinoza, whose framework of thinking constitutes the mental and the material as modes under which humans can apprehend two attributes of thought and extensions of an infinite substance. The substance in a pantheist reading of Spinoza is God and equivalently nature, or in Latin, uh, du civi natura. Since the psychophysically neutral substance is infinite, it has infinitely many attributes, but only two of them are aperceptible by humans. In this sense, Spinoza's philosophical system belongs to a variety of dual aspect monisms. As one can guess from the term Spinoza used for the attributes of thought and extension, he was thinking was a reaction to Descartes' interactive dualism. Well, this dualism clearly violated the assumption of the causal closure of the physical insofar as the mental is capable of acting upon the physical. Causal closure in Spinoza is violated in a subtler way since the modes which do not interact directly derive from the one substance. This substance may inject effects intrusions as they were into the modes so that they cannot be causally closed in principle. Spinoza was well received by the German idealist uh, like Hegel as a number of other important figures in the history of philosophy such as Schopenhauer, Evan Arias, James Whitehead, Russell remind us of Spinoza's dual aspect thinking. A more recent renaissance in philosophy is exemplified by Deleuze, Sayer, Nagel, Chalmers, Rosenberg, Strawson, Seeger, uh, Bruntrup, and many others. The rather influential accounts of Russell and Chalmers will be described in detail. Philosophically interested physicalists with dual aspect accounts are Mach, Pauli, Bohm, and more recently, Polkinghorn, Lockwood, D.S. Paganat, Primus, and Haken. A particular interest in the appearance of dual aspect thinking in psychology, pertinent names are Jung, and currently Velmes, Damasio, Solms, Ponskap, Hobsons, Friston, and the much-discussed approach by Tononi. Russell's, Russell's Neutral Monism. Bertrand Russell was a British philosopher, logician, aristocrat, peace activist, atheist, and journalist who lived most of his life in his home country, Wales, where he was born and died with respect to philosophy. He was generally recognized as one of the main founders of modern analytical philosophy with respect to the mind-matter problem he sympathized with. In the 1910s and later defended from the 1920s to the late 1940s, the position of neutral monism. Most of the text quotes in the following are from his analysis of mind in 1921, although his later analysis of matter in 1927 also contains an in-depth discussion of neutral monism. A recommendable review of neutral monism is found in Struttenberg. Russell picked up essential ideas for his neutral monism mainly from the dual aspect frameworks of thinking of Macht and James, but he is likely its most widely known advocate, so widely that the notion of Russellian monism was coined, and his current proponents are also called neo-Russellians. In the analysis of the mind, one of the works on the topic, Russell begins with a brief sketch of the situation between physics and psychology of his time. On the one hand, many psychologists, originally those of the behavioral school, tend to adopt what is essentially a materialistic position as a matter of method, if not metaphysics. They make psychologically... Psycho psychology increasingly de in dependent on physiology and external observation and tend to think of matter as something much more solid and indebtable than mind. Meanwhile, the physicalists, especially Einstein and other exponents of the theory of relativity, have been making matter less and less material. Whoever reads, for example, Professor Eddington's Space, Time, and Gravitation will see that old-fashioned materialism can receive no support from modern physics. Note that this quote refers to the development of the general relativity in the physics of the 1910s. As we will see, the rise of quantum theory after the mid-1920s contains material which makes Russell's thesis even more compelling. Anyways, with this prelude, he settles his standpoint about the mind-matter issue in the following words. 
the view that seems to me to reconcile the materialistic tendency of the psychology with the anti-materialistic tendency of physics is the view of William James and the American New Realist, according to which the stuff of the world is neither mental nor material, but a neutral stuff out of which both are constructed. The stuff of which our experience is composed is, in my belief, neither mind nor matter, but something more primitive than either. Both mind and matter seem to be composite, and the stuff of which they are compound lies in a sense between the two, in a sense above them both, like a common ancestor. A cartoon-like schematic representation of the scheme can be seen in figure two. It shows the two aspects of the mental and material above the horizontal line and the psychophysically neutral domain below it. I will use the same scheme for the other dual aspect frameworks discussed in this paper to facilitate their comparability. Figure two, dual aspects in Russell's neutral monism, also addressed, also often addressed as the distinction of subject and object. As Mach did previously, Russell referred to psychophysically neutral stuff in terms of sensation. The mental domain is subject, material domain, object. As a notable distinction from other kinds of dual aspect thinking, Russell is, along with James, conceives of the psychophysically neutral stuff as consisting of elements whose composition give rise to the mental physical appearances. James views that the raw material out of which the world is built up is not of two sorts, one matter and the other mind, but that is arranged in different patterns by its interrelations and that the arrangements may be called mental while others may be called physical. This conception is in line with Russell's logical atomism and needless to say with the physical atomist doctrine of the time as well. For him, the physical philosophical system is composed of individual atomistic elements and is a logical consequence that the manifold of different phenomenon that follows from the manifold of different possible combinations. Our Russell is not as clear as desirable about the precise logical status of the neutral stuff. Sometimes he refers to neither matter nor mind. Sometimes he says the stuff belongs equally to mind and matter. Yet in other phrase he uses the intersection of mind and matter. Strictly speaking, these are three characterizations describe three different scenarios. Neither nor is the negation of the logical distinction, also called logical nor, or the joint denial, both and an intersection point of the logical conjunction, also called the logical and. We will later see that these different versions play an important role in comparison to other dual aspect variants. Another important point in Russell's insistent that the neutral stuff can be apprehended namely by sensations. Again, referring to the paper in which James introduced the concept of pure experience as the neutral stuff that is apprehensible, Russell writes, my own belief is that James is right in rejecting consciousness as an entity and that the American realists are partly right, though not wholly in considering that both mind and matter are composed of a neutral stuff, which in isolation is neither mental nor material. I should admit that this view as regards sensation what is heard or seen belongs equally to psychological and to physics. As the term sensation suggests mental rather than psychophysical, neutral activity is somewhat infelicitously chosen. As a consequence, both Russell's sensation, Max used the same term, and James' pure experience have led to a considerable confusion about the actual systematic status. In his work in general, and in particular in his work about neutral Monism, Russell was largely abstinent about the notion of causation. He argued correctly that causation requires temporal direction, and since the fundamental laws of physics are time reversal symmetric, causal relations cannot be part of the fundamental physical description of the world. As a consequence, the law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy, only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. In this context, he shared the Humean position that cause and effect relations are always matters of interpreting observed correlations. All contemporary empirical sciences ascribe causal dependencies to correlations only on the basis of established theoretical models with broken time reversal symmetry. We will see an alternative to interpreting correlations by causations is an interpretation in terms of meaning, a speculative move that is entirely outside any current scientific thinking, though. In his earlier work, Russell referred to meaning basically as a reference between subjective states and their objective reference. This is very much in the spirit of Brentano's concept of intentionality, as usually construed by a two-place reference relation between a mental phenomenon and its content. But now Russell strives for overcoming the dualistic, the duality of subject and object, and dissolves it by the psychophysically neutral acts of sensation.
Dual aspect monism, Ali, Pali, and Jung. The ideas of Wolfgang Pauli, developed together with Carl Gustav Jung, have the specific flavor that they arose from a three decades long interaction between two scientific giants at different sides of the Cartesian divide. The physicist Pauli was one of the architects of the early quantum theory, and the psychiatrist Jung played a key role in the foundation of depth psychology. They spent most of their lives in the Zurich area where they discussed and outlined their version of the dual aspect monism essentially in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Much background material can be found in their correspondence edited by Meyer. In-depth discussions on their interaction with respect to the topic of this section are found in Antwinsbacher's Imprimus and Antwinsbacher and Fuchs. Paul and Jung's common interest was anchored in their search for a worldview better adapted to the extended body of scientific knowledge than what philosophers had offered so far. Their joint target was the psychophysical problem. How is the interface between the mental and the physical to be understood? On which idea the reality can, can it be grounded? How can psychophysical correlation be explained? And what is their epistemological status? The special format of the dual aspect monus all of Paul and Jung derives from Pauli's familiarity with the principle, basic principles of quantum physics, which he used to design structural analogies for the psychophysical problem. For instance, the idea of complementary, complementarity, com, complementary descriptions in physics led him to suggest that mind and matter may stand in a complementary relation. The general problem, the relation between psyche and physics between inside and outside can hardly be regarded as solved by the term psychophysical parallelism advanced in the last century, yet perhaps modern science has brought us closer to a more satisfying conception of this relationship as it has established the notion of complementary within physics. It should be most satisfactory if physics and psyche could be conceived as complementary aspects of the same reality. Complementary in this sense is not just a colloquial way of to superficially dissolve conflict, but has a strict meaning. Two or more descriptions of phenomenon are complementary if they mutually exclude one another and yet are together necessary to describe the phenomenon exhaustively. This can be formalized in terms of non-commutative algebras or of observables or more generally non-Boolean lattices of presuppositions. At least in important, as important as complementary, however, Pauli regarded the analogy from quantum holism or quantum non-locality which matched perfectly with Jung's conception of a basic reality that does not consist of parts but is unfragmented whole, the unus mundus, starting from this holistic, psychophysically neutral reality. Aspects such as the mental and material are generated by decomposition of the whole. This is a decisive difference from the neutral monism uh, a la Russell, where the aspects are created by composing psychophysically neutral elements, while composition entails that the mental and the material are reducible to those elements. The decomposition approach renders reduction to the whole impossible. The fact that the primordial whole cannot be derived from its parts raises the bar for an intuitively accessible reconstruction of the psychophysically neutral domain in Paul and Jung's scheme. A broken holism leads to the mental and material aspects, produces mind-matter correlations per free. They emerge as a consequence of an epistemic split of an underlying ontic holism, producing mental and material aspects. The split represents one among many possible distinctions which depend on further context. It resembles a kind of symmetric symmetry breakdown, another analogy from quantum physics, some general remarks on the status of structural analogies and model building, in particular for conscious studies have been discussed by Prentner and our reconstruction of the Pauli Jung scheme from the correspondence of the some scattered publications on the topic. We found that it implies two basically very different types of psychophysical correlation. They imply interesting conceptual conjectures and empirical predictions, some of which have been implemented in innovative research projects with first concrete results. In the dual aspect monism, according to Pauli and Jung, the mental and the material are manifestations of an underlying psychophysical neutral holistic reality called unus mundus, whose symmetry must be broken to yield dual complementary aspects from the mental, the neutral reality is approached via Jung's collective unconscious from the material, it is approached via quantum non-locality. The two types of mind-matter correlations are in indicated in a letter from Pauli to Jung, 
which itself is lost, but fortunately we know large parts of it through their extensive quotation in the appendix to Jung's essay on the nature of psyche. On the one hand, the unconscious can be made accessible in an indirect way by its ordering influence on conscious content. On the other hand, every observation of the unconscious, every attempt to make unconscious content conscious has a prima facie uncontrollable reaction back onto these unconscious contents themselves. As is well known, this precludes that the unconscious can be exhaustively brought to consciousness. The physicist will, per analogy, conclude that precisely this uncontrollable backlash of the observing subject onto the unconscious limits of the objective character of its reality and at the same time provides it with some subjectivity. The final part of this quote connects well with Russell's statement about physics and psychology, but from a systematic point of view, its first part is more significant. Both ordering influence and reaction back together constitute a bidirectional interchange between the psychophysical neutral domain in its two aspects, while the ordering influence is a structural feature leading to persistent mind matter correlations, such as the so called neural correlates of mental states. The reaction back is induced by all kinds of contexts, and the resulting correlations are unstable and evasive. The systematic analysis of these types of correlations yields a compact and transparent classification of so-called exceptional experiences, which significantly improve our understanding of several classes of extraordinary mental states. Since this is not the place where more details interest readers should consult the recent paper by Optimus Bakker and Fock, as well as commentaries and replies to it, the concept of synchronicity finds a natural place in the category of coincidence phenomenon within this classification. Crucial criteria for synchronicities between mental and material events are their connection by common meaning and the absence of a direct causal interaction. With respect to Pauli, gave a succinct characterization which clearly alludes to the induced type of mind-matter correlations mentioned above. Synchronistic phenomenon elude being captured in natural laws since they're not reproducible, unique, and are blurred by the statistics of large numbers. By contrast, a causality in physics are precisely described by statistical laws wanted a type of natural laws consisting of a correlation of chance fluctuations by meaningful or purposeful coincidences of non non causally connected events. With respect to Jung, illustrated how he concretely conceived the induction of synchronistic events indirectly via unconscious activity. When unconscious content trespasses into consciousness, its synchronistic manifestation ceases, and conversely, synchronistic phenomenon can be elicited by putting a subject into an unconscious state of trance. The same relation of complementary can be observed in the frequent medical cases in which particular clinical symptoms disappear when their corresponding unconscious contents become conscious. We also know that a number of psycho Somatic phenomenon, otherwise outside of the control of volition, can be induced by hypnosis by an attenuation of consciousness. Figure four suggests a sharp boundary between the mental and physical aspects on the one hand and the underlying domain on the other. This is a cartoon picture, as is for the other approaches discussed here as well. It should be refined by a whole spectrum of boundaries, difficult to sketch pictorially, each one indicating the transition to a more comprehensive level of wholeness until the distinction-free unus mundus is approached. A viable idea of this regard is a picture with increasing degrees of generality, the unus mundus at the bottom, and the mental and physical on the top, the intermediate levels in between, would make more sense. This twist is additionally interesting because it also revitalizes Jung's strict Kantian sense, stance that the ordering factors, archetypes in Jung's terminology, in the collective unconscious per se, are strictly inaccessible epistematic Mathematically and thus empirically. This extension of the Pauli Jung scheme, which they did not indicate themselves, resonates with a concept originally proposed by Quine, developed by Putnam, and later worked out in detail by Atman, Spacher, and Kranz. Ontological relativity, or in another parlance, relative onticity. The key motive between the notion is to allow ontological significance for any level from elementary particles to ice cubes, bricks, and tables and all the same for elements of the mental ordering factors which may be regarded as ontic relative to the perspective of mind-matter distinction can be seen epistemic relative to the unus mundus. Additional recent work trying to develop Paul and Jung's speculations and conjectures is found in Primus, who discussed the mental and material in terms of the complementary notions of mental and material time. 
This approach is formulated in a largely formal manner based on algebraic structures similar to those used in quantum theory, and it is not easily digestible for the non-mathematical reader. Again, the key idea here is to exploit structural analogies with quantum physics. Bernard de Espagnat is another important figure in recent renaissance of dual aspect monism. He uses the notion of the real as an independent primordial reality that is neither mental nor material. As in the proposal by Jung and Pauli, this reality is veiled insofar as it is in principle inaccessible to direct empirical experience. Bohm's implicate order. There's yet another well-known physicist whose ideas about the mind and matter are not too different from the Paul Jung scheme. David Bohm, born and educated in the U.S. Bohm, was prosecuted in the McCarthy area and immigrated first to Brazil and then to Israel and finally to the U.K. From 1961 to his retirement, he was a professor of theoretical physics at Birkbeck College, University of London. Apart from his attempts to formulate hidden variables for quantum theory, Bohm also proposed a dual aspect approach to mind and matter whose early precursors date back to the same time when Paul and Jung developed their approach in the late 1940s and early 1950s. A detailed historical account of this earlier work is found in Paikinen. More mature versions are based on his ideas about explicate and implicate orders of wholeness in the implicate order. While the notion of explicate order characterizes an empirically and thus epistemically accessible reality, the notion of the implicate order refers to an ontic realm. Also notes the implicate orders can sometimes be directly perceived or sensed immediately. The mind-matter distinction is part of an explicate order which is based on the psychophysically neutral implicate order without that distinction. The whole universe is in some way unfold, enfolded in everything and each thing is enfolded in the whole. From this, it follows that in some way and to some degree, everything enfolds or implicates everything, but in such a manner that under typical conditions of ordinary experience, there's a great deal of relative independence of things. The basic proposal is then that the enfoldment relationship is not merely passive nor superficial, rather it is active and essential to what each thing is because the implicate order is not static, but basically dynamic in nature in a constant process of change and development, I call its most general form the hollow movement. All things found in the unfolded explicate order emerge from the hollow movement in which they are enfolded as potentialities and ultimately they fall back into it. The general implicate process of ordering is common both in mind and matter. This means that ultimately mind and matter are at least closely analogous and not nearly so different as they appear on superficial examination. On Bohm's account of mental and physical states emerge as explication or unfoldment from an ultimately undivided and psychophysically neutral implicate enfolded order. This order is called holo movement because it is not static but rather dynamic. Just as Whitehead's process philosophy, this means that Bohm's aspect Bohmanism is not only holistic as is the Pauli Jung scheme, it is also fundamentally based on process rather than substance. This is much less pronounced in Pauli and Jung's view where structural and dynamic features appear to be regarded as equally important. Bohm avoids the concerns about a sharp boundary between and above the horizontal line by assuming many subtle levels of implicate orders whose distinction free limit would correspond with the unus mundus. His picture also contains the idea that the implication and explication are relative notions. Each level of the implicate order is the explication of a more subtle implicate order and each level explicate order is the implication of a less subtle explicate order. In this sense, Bohm's thinking is close to the concept of ontological relativity as mentioned earlier, although he also has even more radical ideas about this. So in Bohm's aspect monism, the mental and the material are unfolded explications of an enfolded implicate order with many subtle levels. These levels are increasingly holistic, and they are not static but dynamic, hence Bohm coined the term holo movement to characterize them. This move allows him to hold a subtle in intermediate position between Russell and Paul Jung as far as experiential access to the psychophysically neutral is concerned. If a particular level of implicate order is not yet explicated, it is experientially inaccessible, but every level of Implicate order can, in principle, be explicated, and if this happens, it becomes accessible. Along these lines, Bohm proposed novel forms of dialogue facilitating insight into deeper implicate holistic levels of nature. Psychophysical connections are governed by something Bohm calls 
active information, not synthetic information, but literally meaning to bring something implicate into explicate form, both mentally and material. There's a kind of active information that is simultaneously physical and mental in nature. Active information can thus serve as a kind of link or bridge between these two sides of reality as a whole. These two sides are inseparable in the sense that information contained in thought, which we feel to be on the mental side, is at the same time a related neurophysiological, chemical, and physical activity, which is clearly what is meant by the material side of this thought. By bringing the implicate into form, Bohm's active information can be seen very much in accordance with the archetypal ordering principle of the Paul Jung scheme, the bidirectional relationship between the psychophysically neutral and its aspects expresses in Pauli's quote of 1954 is mimicked in the mutual process of unfolding in the implicate and enfolding the explicate and correlations between the mental and material arise in consequence of the fact that they're both projections of the same implicate order. Dual aspect thinking invites the option to be interpreted in the spirit of panpsychism, the doctrine that mind is fundamental feature of the world which exists throughout the universe. However, neither Russell nor Pauli or Jung make concrete references to panpsychism, but Bohm clearly does. A rudimentary mind-like quality is present even at the level of particle physics. And as we go to subtler levels, this mind-like quality becomes stronger and more developed. Each kind of level of mind may have a relative autonomy and stability. One may then describe the essential mode of relationship of these as participation, recalling that this word has two basic meanings to partake of and to take part in. Regarding a panpsychist interpretation, there may be a nuanced distinction between atomistic neutral monism and holistic dual aspect monism, while the psychophysically neutral itself is neither mental nor material on the accounts of the Paul Jung and Bohm. Panpsychism can only refer to the level of aspects for Russell's monism where the elements of neutral self are sometimes characterized as both mental and material. Panpsychism would be an option even at the elementary level, not only in the aspects. After Bohm's death in 1992, Basil Hilly had further developed Bohm's proposal using the formal apparatus of representation in the mathematical sense of algebraic structures. While these structures would stand for implicate order, the representation would be equivalent to explicate order, specifying the general idea laid out in Bohm and Hiley in their joint book, The Undivided Universe. Hiley's work with the pre-space and pre-time algebra and attempts to produce basic principles of the known physics by representations of this algebra. Concerning mind-matter relations, the idea would be that other representations of the algebra yet to be found are relevant for the mental processes since both representations derive from the same algebraic structure. They are supposed to exhibit relationships that may be at the basis of the psychophysical correlation that are the core of the mind-body problem. Pavlo Palkakainen, a Finnish philosopher, has related Bohm and Hiley's work to modern approaches in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of mind. Naturalistic dualism, according to Chalmers. In chapter 8 of his book, The Char Conscious Mind, entitled Consciousness and Information, Some Speculation, David Chalmers outlines a proposal of the theoretical basis of a template of it and for how to explain consciousness and its relationship to the physical world as the originator of the notion of the heart problem of consciousness, Chalmers became known as an outspoken critic of approaches that tried to reduce phenomenal experiences to brain behavior all too quickly. A key ingredient in Chalmers' proposal is the concept of a syntactic information, all the Shannon. He does explicitly disregard semantics of pragmatics, at least to begin with. The neutral stuff in his proposed all consists of Information states that are neutral with respect to mind-matter split, they can be represented in so-called information spaces and manifest themselves phenomenally and physically simultaneously. Whenever we find information space realized phenomenally, we find the same information space realized physically, and when an experience realizes an information state, the same information state is realized in the experience's physical substrate principles concerning the double realization of information could be fleshed out of a system of basic laws connecting the physical and phenomenal domains. Needless to say, these basic laws are yet to be discovered. Perhaps the Weber-Fechner law of psychophysics may be regarded as a historical precursor of the classification of mind-matter correlations, may be of some general relevance in this direction. Truly, psychophysical phenomenon 
in this spirit are neither physical nor psychological, and they are subject to psychophysical laws, neither to physical laws nor psychological laws. But let us return to a more detailed characterization of the abstract information spaces. They are assumed to be endowed with combinatorial structure and relational structure in the following way. An information space will have two sorts of structure. Each complex state might have an internal structure and each element in the state will belong to a subspace with a topological different structure of its own. We might call the first of these the combinatorial structure of space and the second of these the relational structure of subspaces. Much of the time, each subspace will have the same relational structure. So we can just speak of the relational structure of the space itself. The overall structure of the space is given by the combinatorial and relational structures together. In other words, the relational structure exhibits the differences that are needed to define the choices leading to informational units. For binary choices, this unit is simply a binary digit, a bit. Sequences of binary or higher order choices are simple sequences of bits or higher order informational units. The simplest information state is thus one bit based on a binary choice or qubit, respectively, if quantum information is considered. Obviously, the complexity of information states increases with the length of symbol sequence, combinatorial structure, and the number of choices per simple relational structure. Naturalistic dualism, according to Chalmers, posits that the heart problem of consciousness can be addressed by psychophysical neutral states characterized by synthetic information. These states are represented in abstract information spaces and are endowed with a combinatorial and relational structure at the level of the mental and material that are realized in terms of phenomenal and physical states. Starting around 2000, Tononi and collaborators have developed and refined a theory of integrated information that can be seen as a concrete implementation of many features of Chalmers' proposers. proposal. Tononi's theoretical framework assigns a different level of phenomenal experience to a system depending on the measure of integrated information characterizing the system. And Baldozzi and Tononi even proposed a way to construct structures in so-called quality of space, which represent quality by their shape. Because phenomenal and physical realizations of information states always go hand in hand, panpsychism is straightforwardly entailed by naturalistic dualism. The integrated information approach predicts that simple and purely reactive systems like photodiodes or thermostats have non-vanishing, though not terribly interesting phenomenal consciousness. In recent works, it has been shown that very complex networks simulated as feed-forward systems can perform a high degree of functionality and yet have zero zombie consciousness. This and many other interesting results of Tononi's work were recently published by Oizumi. Naturalistic dualism shares with neutral monism that the mental and the material, here the phenomenal and the physical, are reducible to the psychophysical neutral here the information states this, their realization depends on the way they're composed, but also importantly on the difference between their external and intrinsic features. So the overall picture of naturalistic dualism presents is of the atomistic, not of the holistic variety. At the end of the chapter, Chalmers discusses the metaphysical dimensions of his proposal. The ontology that this leads us to might truly be called the double aspect ontology. Physics requires information states but cares only about their relations, not their intrinsic nature. Phenomenological requires information states, but cares only about their intrinsic nature. The, this view postulates a single basic set of information states unifying the two. We might say that internal aspects of these states are phenomenal and the external aspects are physical, or as a slogan experience is information from the inside, physics is information from the outside. The different ways of realizing information states are here connected to their external relations, physics, and to their intrinsic nature, phenomenology. The external relations are needed for physical states are intimately linked to the notion of efficient causation. Physical states are realizations of information states according to the effects along a causal pathway. Phenomenal states are not based on such pathways from causal to effects. Their realizations of the intrinsic structure of information states, not of external relations. Since physical states are solely based on external relations, the property of the physical world that we usually conceive of as intrinsic may thus actually be projections grounded in intrinsic phenomenal properties. This hypothesis, again, requires a variety of outrageous panpsychism, but is conceptually elegant 
is hard to deny indeed. As Chalmers points out, his proposal matches exactly the ontology of property dualism based on the ontically conceived notion of information, the purported observer independent ontic status of information is at variance with the standard understanding of information as knowledge relative to observers, hence epistemic. However, as we will see in the next quote, below the fundamental information space of Chalmers' approach are based on primitive differences. These differences are assumed to be primordial given as space partitions, so they need no observers. There is some tradition of corresponding ideas in modern physics as well, starting with Zeus in the 1960s and later employed by Fredkin, Cantor, or Wolfram in terms of classical information theory. Finkelstein and von Weissacker, also in the 1960s, pioneered the digital universe picture based on quantum information long before Lloyd, Bruckner, Zellinger, and others refined the framework in thinking. Is arguably most popular expression in Wheeler's illustrative phrase, it from bit, well, all this work has been restricted mainly to physics. Chalmers' approach is clearly more ambitious. It was designed on a basis for both the physical and the phenomenal. His view offers a picture of the world as a world of pure information to each fundamental feature of the world, their corresponds an information space, and whether physics takes these features to be instantiated in its information state from the relevant space is instantiated as long as the information states have the right relations among them, then everything will be as it needs to be. On this picture of the world, there's nothing more to say. Information is all there is. This is how I understand it from bit conception of the world. It is strangely beautiful conception, a picture of the world as pure informational flux without any further substance to it. The world is simply a world of primitive differences and of causal and dynamic relations among those differences. On this view, to try to say anything further about the world is a mistake. After the annotated presentation of selected variants of the 20th century dual aspect linking in historical sequences, they are now to be compared in a systematic fashion with respect to their commonalities and disparities. For a hasty reader, the comparison is summarized in a synoptic overview in the figure that the one feature that all four variants discuss have in common is that they regard the mental and physical as two aspects of one underlying reality that itself is neutral with respect to the mind-matter split. This is the key point of dual aspect approaches. They combine an epistemic dualistic with an antic monist monism, and in this way suggest an alternative to the conventional physicalist program of naturalizing the mind. In fact, dual aspect approaches consider both mind and matter to be naturalized by their underlying reality. The most momentous distinctive features between the variants consider has to do with the way in which the underlying psychophysically neutral Reality is conceived. Russell refers to sensations, Chalmer to syntactic information, Paul Jung to archetypal ordering factors, Bohm to holo movement and implicate order, while Russell and Chalmers both allude to concept of a pronounced epistemic flavor. Paul Jung and Bohm refer to less intuitive metaphysical ideas consistent with their epistemic leanings concerning the neutral domain. Russell and Chalmers posit that it can be epistemically accessed, experienced, or apprehended. This is different from Paul Jung where the neutral domain remains strictly inaccessible for direct apprehension. On Bohm's account, their overall idea is that there are levels of implicant orders which may become accessible under the condition that they can be explicated. Bohm's way to relax epistemic inaccessibility can be mapped to Quine's idea of ontological relatively, relativity and its later refinements. Russell and Chalmers' neutral domain is conceived atomistically. For Russell, there are neutral elements whose composition decides whether the compound state appears mental or material. Chalmers specifies these states as information states whose external relations give rise to the physical state and whose intrinsic nature gives rise to the phenomenal features. Both Pauli and Jung and Bohm turn the compositional move upside down. Their neutral domain is explicitly holistic and the mental and material aspects emerge due to decomposition. This idea resonates with a basic philosophical insight of quantum theory that systems are undivided wholes without parts to begin with. In principle, they are infinitely many ways to generate parts by particular operators under particular contexts. Among the accounts presented here, the Pauli Jung conjecture is the only one that addresses the collective unconscious and conceives of it in a similarly holistic way. The decompositional approach yields a mind matter correlation for free correlation emerge whenever the holistic symmetry of a system is broken. For some remarks about how this can formally uh, be formally addressed in the Pauli Jung scheme. See Ottoman Sprocker, 
However, moreover, mental and material aspects are not reducible to neutral domain. It is not possible to uniquely reduce parts to the wholes when there are infinite in many ways to decompose wholes into parts. In virtue of these two features, I think that the holistic dual aspect accounts show an obvious conceptual advantage over their atomistic competitors. In order to explain mind-matter correlations, Chalmer introduces external and intrinsic features of the neutral information states that are assumed to be correlated by default since external and intrinsic features manifest themselves in physical and phenomenal states. These inherit the default correlations, thinking that aspects of Composition rather than decomposition provides the option to reduce mental and material aspects to the neutral elements out of which they are composed. Panpsychism can be related to all four approaches considered. If the neutral domain is conceived holistically, it is neither mental nor material. And panpsychism refers to the simultaneous appearance of both the mental and the material aspects. If the neutral domain is conceived atomistically, it is possible to regard it as both mental and material. So that panpsychism may even refer to the neutral domain itself, the so-called combination problem for panpsychism, how experiences of fundamental physical entities combined to yield experiences of higher level physical entities does not contaminate decompositional approaches of both holistic versions of dual aspect thinking. The notion of meaning plays a significant role and it does so in two respects. First, the experience of meaning is constitutive and synchronistic correlations between mental and material events in the sense of Jung. On Bohm's account, experience meaning is due to correlation between mental and material states, which arises the result of unfolding active information. Both ways to conceive meaning are based on the idea of an explicit two-place relation. Second, there is also an implicit, not yet explicated sense of meaning. In Bohm's approach, this implicit meaning is addressed by the notion of active information, which Bohm empathetically distinguishes from syntactic information, the Paul Jung scheme. It is unfolded in the symbolic content of unconscious archetypal ordering factors, and it unfolds when the retrospective archetype gets constellated, activated in a particular situation. As a consequence, the meaning experienced in a synchronistic event is not merely subjectively ascribed. The range of possible experience meaning is also objectively prescribed by the archetype. In Russell and Chalmers framework, the thinking meaning does not feature prominently and certainly not in the implicit sense. Russell mentions Bertano's concept of intentionality as a relationship between a mental state and what his content refers to in a sense of the intentional content of a mental state expresses its meaning. But as we have seen, Russell proposed to override the duality of mental state and its physical referent and introduces the term sensation for exactly this purpose. For the heart problem of consciousness, according to Chalmers, it is not the intentional content but the phenomenal experience of the mental state that matters crucially these issue is what it is like to be in that state and how it relates to brain activity along this line and experience of meaning over and above meaning is as intentional content should be phenomenal experience just as that of pain sound disney's or whatever else since his dual aspect account is mainly concerned with syntactic information states his sophisticated work on semantics is not discussed here how far away are we from a concrete or even practical applications of dual aspect thinking? Among the four approaches presented, those of Pauli Jung and Chalmers did already initiate considerable empirical implied research. A number of the first results and insights from the Pauli Jung lineage, mainly in psychology and psychiatry, have been included in a collection of essays edited by Anton Spocker and Fuchs, and key ideas of Chalmers' approach have been utilized and developed in Tononi's integrated information theory with many recent results reported by Ozumi. The central challenge of dual aspect thinking remains the problem of how consciousness, mind, and phenomenal experience are related to the brain and physical world in general. mind manner correlation are at the heart of this problem, the way in which panpsychism works out for inanimate systems, exceptional experience apparently thinking, the mental and the physical, or the relation between physical time and mental time are only a few examples. No philosophical position in the mind matter debate comes free from, of charge. The most costly issue of the dual aspect thinking is arguably the unclarified, some might say, obscure nature of the psychophysically neutral domain underlying the mental and material aspect. Since current science is almost exclusively concerned with explorations of the two aspects, progress in understanding the neutral domain can be expected primarily through conceptual speculations and conjectures. At first glance, they may seem as outrageous as their creators need to be courageous. Okay, so God bless. That was uh, pretty intense. And 
believe it or not, I have more to cover. So, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, time is short and uh, there's a lot to cover. So, uh, um, let's keep it going. So, it's going to take a small drink. I'm going to do a little more on Advaita and maybe I'll cover Carl Friston also, but I definitely want to cover this thing on Advaita. Okay, so Orfeo, appreciate you being active in the chat. Oswald, sticking around, appreciate that. So uh, you know, hope this is uh, useful. This is extremely important for my research. People have been following me for a long time. You'll see how the multiple truth hypothesis. So today I just kind of want to put this research out there and you know, give myself time to digest it. And, uh, you know, having read it out myself, uh, you know, to understand it better. And, uh, you know, hopefully next week I'll talk about it more. Um, just because I want to, you know, as I said, deep dive into monism. So we're going to cover a lot of grounds, a lot of material. I've been going almost five hours already. And uh, um, so let's keep it going. So here, this article was really interesting. I actually shared this with uh, Jennifer Church of Entropy, and she found it very interesting also. And uh, this from Deepshika Shahi, um, Rethinking the Absence of Post-Western Internal Relations Theory in Indi India, Advaitic Monism as an Alternative Epistemological Resource. So this one's more general to a larger worldview of monism, specifically Advaita. It also covers some Chinese monism of, uh, of Tian and Tiantia. Uh, uh, so let's jump right in. The transformation of a Eurocentric epistemological base of international relations without inadvertently generating a derivative discourse of Western international relations requires an intellectual fight over rigid boundaries of Western scientism, thereby reorienting the discipline of IR international relations itself towards a post-Western epoch, as such post-Western IR theory can be largely viewed as an offspring of scholastic explorations aimed at breaking epistemological imperialism in international relations. Not surprising, the non-Western rising powers in global politics are taking particular interest in designing a post-Western international relations theory. While the notion of Tianxia has emerged as a Chinese conceptual response to the building of international curiosity surrounding post-Western international relations, the Indian scholarly skepticism towards formulating a systemic theory projects a hazy image of the status of post-Western international relations theory in India. This article aims at reconsidering the absence of post-Western IR theory in India India by evaluating the fundamental Indian scriptures as a potential epistemological guide to theorize IR. In order to do that, the article awakens the concept of Advaita as an untapped epistemological resource. The article is divided into four sections. The first section traces the academic space for post-Western international relation theorization in India. The second section evokes the notion of Advaita as an epistemologically methodological tool to craft post-Western international relations theory. The third section compares monism as the common underlying epistemological foundation of Tientia and Advaita. Finally, the fourth section sets out to establish the credentials of Advaitic monism as an intellectual strategy to formulate post-Western international relations theory. There are a lot of alien ways producing knowledge out there, including the wisdom of other civilizations which are wonderfully and creatively unscientific. The primary challenge in facing the academic discipline of international relations IR today is how to make it more inclusive by expanding its epistemological foundations beyond Eurocentric scientific biases. 
the debate is not so much about whether these scientific biases exist, but how to discover appropriate pathways to address these biases. The intuition that the greater incorporation of knowledge produced by non-Western scholars from local vantage points cannot make the discipline of IR more global or less Eurocentric is widely shared. The transformation of the Eurocentric epistemological basis of IR without inadvertently generating a derivative discourse of Western IR requires intellectual flight over the rigid boundaries of Western scientism, thereby reorienting the discipline of IR itself towards a post-Western epoch. As such, post-Western IR theory can be largely viewed as an offspring of scholastic explorations aimed at breaking epistemological imperialism in IR. Not surprisingly, the non-Western rising powers in global politics are taking particular interest in designing a post-Western IR theory. Since countries like India and China are generally recognized as rising powers, there is a noticeably global interest in knowing how these powers view IR. While the notion of Qianxia has emerged as a Chinese conceptual response to the budding intellectual curiosity surrounding post-Western IR, the Indian scholarly skepticism towards formulating systemic theories projects a hazy image of the status of post-Western IR theory in India. This article aims at reconsidering the absence of post-Western IR theory in India by evaluating the fundamental Indian scriptures as a potential epistemological guide to theorize IR. In order to do that, the article awakens the concept of Advaita as an untapped epistemological resource. The concept of Advaita, literally meaning non-dualism or non-secondness, presupposes a monistic epistemology that, unlike the conventional epistemologies based on fundamental subject-object distinctions, ties the perceiver subject to the perceived object together with a globe marked with a single hidden connectedness of or Brahman. The article employs this Advaitic monism, wherein the perpetually connected globe has no separate existence apart from Brahman as the epistemologically ground for theorizing post-Western IR. This article is divided into four sections. The first section traces the academic space for post-Western IR theorization in India. The second section evokes the notion of Advaita as a philosophical lens to visualize contemporary world politics as an epistemologically methodological tool to craft post-Western IR theory. The third section compares monism as the common underlying epistemological foundation of Chinsha and Advaita, thereby highlighting the distinctiveness of Advaitic monism. Finally, the fourth section sets out to establish the credentials of Advaitic monism as an intellectual strategy to formulate a post-Western IR theory. The article concludes that dualism, monism, debate in IR, which intends to reshuffle the epistemological hierarchies of IR theorization, is more indicative of the geopolitical repositioning emanating from the rise of non-Western powers such as India and China, and less investigative to the extent to which non-Western monism has a methodological and analytical edge over Western dualism in theorizing IR. Post-Western IR theorization in India, tug of war between skepticism and adventurism. The academic debates on the prospects of post-Western IR theorization in India oscillate between skepticism and adventurism. The skeptics opine that IR theory remains a causality in India primarily because of the absence of familiarity with or an interest in theory. By contrast, the adventurists assert that Indian scholars have enormous potential to engage with IR theory, but their theoretical endeavors are either marred with the use of the West as a referential point or not acknowledged as fully-fledged theory by Western scholars. Undoubtedly, the adventurists appear more enthusiastic than skeptics about formulating post-Western IR theory. Nevertheless, they chart varying parameters for such a theoretical venture and caution against specific pitfalls. In effort to chalk out an Indian roadmap for fashioning post-war, post-Western IR theory, um, Bahira calls for exploring alternative sites of knowledge construction, transgressing disciplinary boundaries of IR, incorporating everyday life experience and theory building, rereading Indian history and analyzing the political thought of various Indian philosophers, indigenizing the academic discourses in IR and questioning the a prior assumptions, procedures and values embedded in the positivist enterprise. However, Bahira is clearly against the nativist schemes of creating an indigenous Indian IR that presents a non-Western and Western IR theorization in a self-other binary mode. Amitav Acharya seems equally wary of the potential nativist undercurrents of post-Western IR theorization in India. He observed there's much less 
interest in India in developing a school IR its own because such a theoretical project underscores the potential self-centrism, a risk that was recognized by Bajpa before anyone took note of India's rise when he warned that the efforts to develop IR theory out of India might carry the danger of lapsing into uncritical nativism and seeking some essentialist Indian vision. Nevertheless, the Chari is optimistic about the possibilities of borrowing from Indian cultural and spiritual knowledge while shaping post-Western IR theory. He enumerates the following alternative sources of IR theorizing that could create space for inclusion in non-Western voice and experiences. The genealogy of international systems, the question of the agency of the self, bringing the human dimension to IR, and the role of area studies, the study of regions and regionalism. However, he declares the most important source for post-Western IR theorization concerns the epistemology of IR knowledge, drawing inspiration from Jackson's critique of Western IR theories, where he makes a powerful case for pluralism in IR. So I'm going to skip a little of this and... Since the concept of Aveta is located in the blurry junction between science and non-science, it most certainly crosses the linguistic barriers posed by Western scientism without juxtaposing the Western science and Eastern non-science as two incommensurable intellectual zones. Besides crossing the borders of Western scientism, Advaitic philosophical insights surmount the narrow confines of nativism, ethnocentrism, and other forms of ideological essentialism. The Indian scholars are apprehensive about the supposed nativist outlook of post-Western IR theorization in India because they fear that such theorization exercise is bound to generate a dualistic form of knowledge where an Indian IR theory could acquire an ethnocentric and essentialist overtone in Indian or Hindu or Asian or Eastern theory of IR in opposition to the non-Indian or non-Hindu or non-Asian or non-Eastern theory of IR. However, the very possibility of looking at knowledge through a prism of Vedic monism eliminates the likelihood of manufacturing a dualistic form of knowledge, distinguishing between dualistic degenerative nativism and monistic regenerative nativism. The monistic philosophy underpinning Advaitic, which makes allowance for a merger of the self and the others, qualifies as a non-nativist, non-ethnocentric, and non-essentialist epistemological resource for theorizing post-Western IR. The next section throws light on the abstract and non representational epistemological and methodological contours of Advaita, which could then be employed for post-Western IR theorization. Advaita, mapping the monist epistemological and methodological contours. The concept of Advaita is part of an ancient Indian philosophy. Shankaracharya is one of the most revered Indian philosophers and theologians who lived in the 8th century is regarded as a promoter of Advaita as a distinct school of Indian philosophy. Shankaracharya indicated that the Advaitic philosophical tradition existed in the early part of the first millennium. The first complete Advaitic work is considered to be the Manduluka Karaka, authorized by Gaudapada Shankaracharya, disseminated Advaitic vision throughout his commentaries on the Ten Upanishads, the cryptic uh, Brahma Sutra, and the Bhagavad Gita. He established four pitas, or centers of Advaitic excellence. Later, Shankaracharya's four prominent pupils, Padma Pada, uh, Shorshvara, Hatsadamalaka, and Totaka, undertook the responsibility for investigating Advaita, while Padma Pada authored uh, Panchapadika as a lucid commentary on Shankaracharya's understanding of Brahma Sutra. Shorshvara composed uh, Nayak. Karmya Siddhya as an independent treaty on Advaita. The two major subschools of Advaita arose after Shankaracharya, uh, Brahmati in the 9th century, and Vivarana in the 10th century. Many Indian scholars contributed to the philosophy of Advaita over the uh, millennia. Harsa and uh, Kashuka in the 12th century, Anagiri uh, and Amalanda in the 13th century, uh, Vidyarandya and Shankarananda's 14th century, Sananda 15th century, Prakanasanda and Nirshima Sama 16th century, Madhasarana Sarasvati, uh, Adarindra and Dharma Raja 17th century, Sarasiva Brahmendra 18th century, and Cassandra Shankar Bharati and Satyananda Saraswati in the 20th century. Different scholars, including Bhagavan Ramata Marsh Marishi, Swami Vivekananda, Swami 
uh, Topanava, Swami uh, Chittamanyandana, and Swami Bodhinanda enrich the philosophy of Dvaita by presenting its various interpretations, however historically sustained and hermeneutic hermeneutically rich intellectual tradition of Veda mostly remain confined to the domain of religious philosophy. This article attempts to revive the concept of Veda by treating it as an applicable epistemology within the academic dis discipline of international relations. Endeavor to release a concept from its historical, geocultural, and philosophical context of emergence necessarily involves a conscious yet inherent dose of anachronism, a very tension of relocating an ancient concept into an interpretive grid whose coordinates are provided by complementary modern terminology like epistemology and methodology forces our imagination towards a spatial temper reconfiguration of the concept by means of an ex post semantic translation. In addition, a fortiori, this is true when such endeavors aspire to grasp the contemporary relevance of a concept that is supplemented with a complex set of reciprocally interpolating generative notions, such as the case of Advaita. Eventually, the intellectual space to be investigated gets an even more vicious and dicey when the divergent and often conflicting hermeneutical gazes towards Advaita are taken into consideration. Nevertheless, the same complex viscosity nourishes the humans from where post-Western knowledge emerges, provided that a guiding criterion for deriving its conceptual meaning is determined and made explicit. What then should be the guiding criteria for deriving the conceptual meaning of Veta in international relations? The concept of Veta must be treated as a fertile ground for IR theorization only to the extent that enables the non-Eurocentric philosophies to constitute a legitimate plea for non-dualist epistemology. In addition, the plea for non-dualist epistemology has a political value. It obtains its political value not merely from Advaita's non-Western attributes, but also from how these attributes can be operationalized for theory building against the limits of the Eurocentric genealogy of IR in, in, uh, as an academic discipline. IR as an academic, cultural, and political praxis mirrors a hierarchical structuration of global power that has long reproduced and still reproduced the Western ideology idea of superiority, triumphalism, and exceptionalism. One of the basic axioms that provides support for this ideology and the multiple positivism that it endorses is precisely dualism. Broadly conceived, a dualistic epistemology presumes the separation of the subject from the object of the inquiry. Descartes' mechanism in science epistemizes a canonical formulation of the very general principle by separating the subject from the object and by extrapolating the former from the world he observes. A positional and abstracted distance is transformed into ontological difference. This difference is not neutral, rather is articulated into hierarchy and hierarchy comes to be naturalized. That is how Western modern thinking transmutes history and power into nature and necessity. So why is it important to explicitly specify that Veto assumes unique conceptual relevance only when one creatively exploits its attribute of non-dualistic understanding of reality and knowledge. Such a specification is necessary to consciously escape the trans-historical and essentialist understanding of Advaita. The conceptual utilization of Advaita for theorizing post-Western IR is not about indulging in investigation into uh, atavistic sources of truth. Conversely, it is about exploring the alternative worldviews that can be rescued from the seemingly denigrated position in the conventional intellectual space of IR theorizing. If not in their own geo-historical site of enunciation. It is a sign that the denigrated intellectual position of these alternative worldviews has been deliberately created by concrete political power configurations and global politics, which in turn depends on historically determined conditions in the lounge dre and not in the inner properties of the concepts, categories, and entire philosophical traditions. So long as the dualism as the intellectual pillar of Western modernity and therefore the overriding way of hierarchy organizing human groups into global politics shapes the dominant Western theoretical discourses on IR, non-dualism, Advaita remains mortified in its ability to shed light upon not only the conventional issues that Western theories claim to explore, but also numerous fresh issues that can be potentially added in order to widen the academic scope of IR. It is the dominance of dualism in IR theorism that marks the significance of non-dualism or monism as a generative epistemological locus 
for knowledge production in IR. Against this backdrop, Advaitic monism becomes particularly promising in terms of its capacity to unleash the theoretical perspective that has hit through remain concealed by the dominance of dualism in IR. As such, the conceptual relevance of Advaita is not buried in its own past, rather it is expectant in our tangible present. Before setting out to touch the radical transformative horizon by revisualizing IR through a monist lens, it is important to delineate the epistemological uh, epistemology of monism. Monism as an epistemological option holds that a variety of existing objects can be explained in terms of a single underlying reality or substance, since the object characterized by hidden affiliation to a single underlying reality is often not completely realized by the subject connected to the same single unified underlying reality, but the bounded perceptive capabilities, the object and the datum of consciousness of the subject appear identical only to the perceived degree of their common connecting reality. However, the subject is not merely connected to the object via an ontological continuum. They both pertain to the same underlying reality. In addition, this reality is placed at the core level of being. The monist epistemology discloses wide methodological upshots to be explored. Furthermore, given the vastness of the monist epistemological methodological territory, it is indispensable to circumscribe to the IR primarily by getting rid of the already recognized misleading paths. That is what monism in IR is not. Monism is not holism. Holism broadly conceived assumes that the parts of a whole are in intimate interconnections such that they cannot exist independently of the whole or cannot be understood without reference to the whole. And the whole is regarded as greater than the sum of the parts. Holism in modern Western thinking is closer to the idea of qualified monism or Vishitha Dvaita in Indian philosophy since the historic period of global exchange and the negotiation of ideas that Carl Jasper has named the actual axial age, the presence of holism is identifiable in several systems of knowledge production across civilization. Yet in the academic discipline of IR, the appearance of holism as a theoretical option is historically tied to the hegemony of structural functionism and US social theory. Its genealogy is bound to the geopolitics of Cold War and the way Western theories address the impact of decolonialization on the interstate system. Since the 1960s, some elements of the US sociological explanations peeped out of the field of IR, this contamination was prompted by the growing attention of the process of modernization and its implications for the stability of the interstate system fraught with tumultuous social political transformations in the newly independent countries of the third world. For a growing body of IR scholars, the international became imaginable as an analogical extension of the Weberian social differentiation within the state. The interstate system consisted of a single stratified hierarchy of societies wherein the state and their political elites were responsible for a variety of regular functions across the external and internal dimensions of world politics. Against this backdrop, IR scholars began to understand the transformation in power relations as occurring within the boundaries of one world. The emphasis of one world necessitated the methodological task of constructing the imagined integrated wholeness of the world as an adequate unit of analysis with this intellectual and geopolitical scenario Parsons' social system offered an authoritative theoretical infrastructure that could meet both the need to reframe the agency of the state as a realm of politics within a more complex network of inner societal relations and the call to replace the nation state with the world as an appropriate unit of analysis. In the wake of Latin American dependency theories that emerged in the 1970s, there was a departure from modernization theories under the auspices of uh, Braudel's history of the Lange Dure and Paul Sweezy's neo-Marxist theory of long-distance trade. Thanks to the insights produced by uh, Burton Lanfee's general system theory, at last, but not least, under the hegemony of structural functioning in U.S. sociology, with its reorientation towards the global since 1966, world system analysis champions holism in IR as an explicit theoretical and methodological position. According to Kilborn Hopkins and Amelian Wallerstein's classical formulation of holism, the arena where social action takes place and social change occurs is not society in the abstract, but in a definite world, a spatial temporal whole whose spatial scope is coextensive with the elementary division of labor among the constituent regions or parts and whose temporal scope extends for as long as the 
elementary division of labor continually approaches the world as a social whole. Holism in IR holds that the whole is determined by the relations between its constitutive parts and not the contrary. So in ontological terms, the relations overdetermine the spatial temporal scope of the world whole. In epistemological terms, the whole overdetermines the spatial temporal scope of the parts. And in methodological terms, the interstate system overdetermines the function of the state. Holism as approach to IR has two limits. The first is US Eurocentrism, and the second is dualism. And they are the two faces of the same coin. It is the Eurocentrism as it presents the origins of the interstate systems in Europe, which later diffused to the rest of the world by means of incorporation. The interstate system is maintained, expanded from its center, absorbing new peripheries up to the point that no land institution or human group was left outside of it. Yet in this sense, the world became global only when the West managed to incorporate the rest within a single world. The whole world would thus be a historic byproduct of the relative success of the West in imposing its institutions where nothing like a system of international relations of modern state machinery was in place, even though multiple colonial encounters generated multiple modernities. Although relations account for the ultimate ontological ground for reality, thus this self-expanding whole results in separated from what is historically still outside of it and alternatively profoundly asymmetrical. It is narrative of expansion, the whole, the West is active, transformative, modern, the outside, the rest is passive, stagnant, traditional, in a sense the former is subject to the history, the latter is the object of history. The theoretical importance of diffusionism has been mitigated in some Marxist and neo-Marxist approaches by introducing the concept of uneven and combined development. Uh, the concept of uneven and combined development ascertains that the origins of the international do indeed lie in the uneven and combined character of historical development. Rosenberg calls the trans-historical applicability of this concept, yet the concept of uneven and combined development is problematic to the extent that it attributes the central role of mode of production, thereby rendering other processes, those of colonization, secondary, however empirically significant they are allowed to be. The narrative of diffusionism applied by the idea of transition to modernity even though modernity is qualified as capitalistic, remains intact in uneven and combined development. Rosenberg has recently re-articulated the narrative of diffusionism at three levels of argumentation that convey the productive transformation of nature, the orchestration of social power, and the cultural rationalization of knowledge forms in Rosenberg's account on uneven and combined development. Eurocentrism does not take the semblance of geographical diffusionism as it is not modernity or capitalism irradiating from Europe, European, or even Eurasian center, yet the process of diffusionism, irrespective of its center of origin, becomes universal and totalizing explanatory factor. The category for social analysis gathered from European historical experiences were, are projected back in time so that no alternative starting point is left to think about IR outside of the West. Advaita instead demonstrates the epistemological, methodological departure from dualism and holism in the Western theoretical tradition. On the one hand, and from Dvaita and Vishtadvaita in the Indian philosophical tradition on the other. Unlike the Dvaitic subject object separation and the Vishtadvaitic holistic evaluation of the whole over the constitutive part, Advaitic monism believes that the only reality that exists at the core of being is Brahman, a single hidden connectedness. Beneath the experience objective and subjective diversities across the globe, this does not mean that the world with its compatible and incompatible diversities ceases to exist, but that it has a lower perceived level of ambiguous reality, partial and distorted reality that exists within Brahman, the ultimate core reality at its roots. Jiva, bodily self, and Atman, auto-reflexive self, constitute the diverse external expressions of the single core reality called Brahman. Advaitic monism asserts that the grounds of all objects, contents, and details of both objective and subjective components of a knowledge situation is luminous continuum of the nature of consciousness and or intelligence. In the Advaitic monistic epistemological methodological scheme, the theorist, the subject who generates a meta-narrative, and the theory, the meta-narrative that corresponds to the object, have the possibility to get merged because the higher is the ability of the theorist to reveal the hidden connectedness between the seemingly diverse forms of realities, the greater would be the proximity of the theorist to ultimate connecting reality that is Brahman. 
the mutually constitutive effect of subject-object dualism in international relations has been variously prompted from different theoretical angles, from social constructivism to critical theories to post-colonial studies. However, none of these theoretical angles foresees the collapse of the subject-object dualism. Since they methodologically adopt the Western subject-object dualism, they fall into the trap of the same two-sided, limited ethno story from which they derive their legitimacy. By contrast, when the Advaitic monistic methodology is evoked to reconsider the diverse polycentric ethno stories from a global connectedness perspective, the groundbreaking post-Western theoretical alternative emerges. Although Advaitic monism offers a novel epistemological resource for theorizing post-Western IR, in fact, it is significant to admit that monism in IR theory is not entirely on explored theme. The Chinese attempt to exploiting the concept of Tiancha for theorizing IR, IR follows the monistic epistemological tradition to some degree. As such, it is academically as well as strategically crucial to contrast Advaitic monism with monism in Chinese IR. The intention behind drawing these contrasts is to acknowledge the similarities and differences between the two forms of monism and not to establish the intellectual superiority of one form of monism over the other. In fact, the comparison between Advaita and Chancha is a false dilemma because the two visions are not positioned on the same ontological level, while Advaita is a suitable concept for forming post-Western IR theory as it rejects the subject-object dualism characterizing Western IR theories. Chancha represents a world order that significantly resonates with the Western idea of structural functional based on the subject-object dualism. The next section is devoted to clarifying the heterogeneity and the value of putting Advaita and Chancha in tension. Monism, the common epistemological foundation of Kansha and Advaita. The Chinese contribution to IR theorizing is chiefly exemplified by the selective reinterpretation and employment of the concept of Kansha, literally meaning all under heaven. The diverse meanings of association with the term uh, Chansha encompasses the cosmological construction, moral belief, and self-identity of the Chinese geocultural. Historically, the transforming denotations of Chansha manifest the gradual evolution of China from the center of all under heaven to a modern nation state. In fact, the conceptual ships of Chansha from a geographic space in the time of the five emperors and the three dynasties to the universal ethics based on human heartedness in the time of the Qin and Han witness a decisive change in the making of the Chinese people. Chansha not only reflects the geographical and ethical experiences of the Chinese people that originated in their families at the stage of patriarchal society, but also symbolizes the recognition of the wider geographical world by the Chinese people over more than 2,000 years. Chancha as a Chinese approach to cosmopolitanism has played a great role in preserving the ideal of a unified Chinese territory and the integration of the Chinese people. Chancha has become a hot topic in the discussion since Zhao Qingyan introduced it into the domain of IR theory in 2002 during an international conference on universal knowledge and language in Gao, India. While Chinese scholars have been discussing the traditional concept of Chanchka to grasp domestic and foreign policies for over a decade, Zhao's plan for a Chinese-inspired world utopia provides an ex exemplary case of the workings of normative policymaking because it directly shifted the discussion of Chanchka from the margins to the mainstreams, although Zhao's Chancha theory does not match with the ancient cultural concept that Chancha borrows the core meanings of its concepts as key ingredients for constructing a Chinese international relations theory. Zhao makes it clear that he has not simply recycled the old concept of Chancha, but also renewed it, thereby giving it a fresh meaning in accordance with the realities of global politics in the 21st century. Zhao's Chancha theory is roughly based on the model of Zhao dynasty, from 1100 to 256 BC, and not on the unified Chinese empire after 221 BC. Zhao explains that the practice of imperial China deviated from the best practices of the Zhao dynasty, thus restoring the Chencha ideal. However, Zhao laments the, that the model of the Zhao dynasty was not was also not a perfect embodiment of the Chencha system. Ever since King Li of the West Zhao dynasty ruled the prowess of morality of the kings declined all over Chancha and was metaphysically believed that the great heaven did not show its virtues as it destroyed the feudal kingdoms through famine. In light of the death, the merits, Zhao decided against using the Zhao dynasty as a referential point in Chancha theory. The object of Zhao's theoretical project, therefore, is to innovatively reinvent the concept 
of Qianzhi in order to fa fabricate a Chinese style of comprehending and rebuilding contemporary world politics. Zhao argues to reorder the world, we need to first create a new world concepts, which will lead to a new world structure is the concept of all under heaven. Qianzhi means firstly that the earth or the whole world under heaven. Its second meaning is the hearts of the peoples or the general will of the people. An emperor does not really enjoy his empire of all under heaven, even if he conquers an extraordinary vastness of land, unless he receives the sincere and true support from the people on the land. Its third meaning, the ethical and or political meaning, is a world institution or a universal system for the world, a utopia of the world as one family. On the basis of this threefold meaning of Chensha, Zhao proceeds to formulate the Chensha theory of international relations. The theoretical proposition of Chensha in IR can be scrutinized at three levels, structural, functional, and ethical. At the structural level, the Chensha theory conceptualizes the world that rests on a fundamental unity between the physical, psychological, and political components. While the physical components encircles the earth and the land under the sky, and the psychological components involves a universal agreement in the hearts of all people, the political components embody as a world institution to ensure peace, prosperity, stability, and order. These structural dimensions of Chancha theory unfold certain functional connotations. At the functional level, the Chancha theory promises to synchronize the physical, psychological, and institutional aspects of worldly existence through analyzing and measuring the issues and the affairs of the world by a world standard rather than a national standard, and the world context rather than from a local perspective. The principle of the following, the world standard has been identified by Lao Tzu, 500 BC, and from the standard of all under heaven to understand the affairs of all under heaven. The functional principle wherein the world should be seen from a view of world size acquires ethical justification from the value of family ship. At an ethical level, the Chanche theory proposes a foster of good society based on the ancient Chinese understanding of family ship. As such, the ideal of the good society promoted by Chancha is nothing but the greatest family. The family ship grants political and ethical consistency as well as transivity to the good society. It is presumed that the family ship that ethically underpins the structural and functional claims of Chancha theory essentially reflects the general will of all people. From a formal viewpoint, it is noteworthy that the conscious emphasis on the structural and functional elements of global politics in Chancha theory echoes the structural functionalist typical of Western theorizing. The formal similarity between Chancha theory and Western structural functionalism also hints at an analogous way to perceive the historical development of the international the intellectual hegemony of Western structural functionalism, to which the emergence of world systems theory is not extraneous drew its legitimacy from the meta-historical rise of modernization led by the West. Likewise, Norden opened opines that the notion of all under heaven is mobilized, mobilized to buttress the emerging discourse of China's modernization in world politics. She or, argues, discourses of modernization, development, and civilizing missions all perform the same maneuver. Euphemistically renaming the uncivilized as developing does not change the basic move. Others are not simply different. They are just behind. Their future is our past. Eventually, they will become like us. The Chanxi ideal is based on the desired application of the Chinese notion of family ship across the globe appears to move to convert others to the self, yet the Chencha theory is irreducible to the Western understanding of structural functionism to the extent that it presumes continuity and fluidity between the different scales that Western structural functionism considers as discrete entities, that is, the individual, the family, the nation state, and the world. Moreover, Chencha extends the spatial imagery to the entire cosmos, blurring the micro-macro distinction within the theoretical landscape of Western structural functionalism, separates the scope of sociological systems, theories from the scope of functionalist anthropology. The structural, functional, ethical implications of Chencha theory spring from a specific Chinese epistemology. So what is the epistemological foundation of Chencha theory? Intriguingly, the epistemological foundation of Chencha theory is different the identified by different Chinese scholars, while Quinn Yaquit calls it holism, uh, Wang Yui calls it monism. Emphasis added. Uh, Quinn writes, since Chincha was a combined whole, the concept of the subjectivity or the subjective I was not conspicuous, conspicuous at all, and therefore 
existed no dichotomy of the self and the other. As a result, in the Chinese mind, there could be something far away in time and space, but there was nothing, uh, never something that was opposite, intolerant, or needed conquering. The far away was indeed an extension of the self, the great grandfather and the great grandson in the temporal framework, or the center of a ripple is gradually spreading circles in the spatial framework. This holist worldview is different from the Western dualistic system of the two opposites where an inevitable conflict is implied. While Quinocratic's the holistic epistemology of Tantra theory for dissolving the self-other dichotomy, Wang acknowledged the monist epistemology for generating the same effects. Wang states, in international relations, the Chinese perspective tends towards monism, preferring a harmonious world over a dualism or dichotomy rooted in Christianity, a culture prone to dividing the world between good and evil. The thinking frame of the West constitutes people as subjects able to view, see the world. In this theory of knowledge, every object that cannot be converted is assigned to the absolute God or absolute otherness. God is identified as the source of creation. Others are affirmed as irreconcilable enemies. By contrast, Chinese thought supposes that there is always a method by which otherness can be changed into harmonious coexistence. In other words, all non-harmonious things could be changed from other to us. Although the prospective dissolution of the self-other dichotomy in the Chinese epistemology is elucidated in the writings of Quinn and Wang, evidently distinguish it from Western dualism, it is difficult to automatically infer from this elucidation that the non-dualist Chinese epistemology is holist or monist. From the Indian philosophical standpoint, the epistemological base of Tantra theory is similar to uh, Vishya Veta or qualified monism, which is closer to holism than Advaitic monism. It is closer to holism for two reasons. First, the whole in the Chancha theory, which is depicted as all under heaven, or the world is greater than its constitutive part, nation states, in other words, the world is greater than the nation state, and worldism is superior to internationalism. Zhao argues that the world theory of all under heaven, which is the best philosophy for world governance, is more appropriate than international theory in dealing with world problems. Second, the relations overdetermine the spatial temporal scope of all under heaven, the meaning of the human and nature, the ideal and the reality, the moral and the material determines the spatial scope of all under heaven, whereas the amount of time required for realizing family ship based on worldness constitutes the temporal dimensions of all under heaven against the spatial temporal framework. The world is a non-world waiting to fully acquire its maturity as a whole. Uh, Zhu Bajun clarifies, Zhao argues that the largest political unit in Western political theory is the nation state, while in Chinese theory, the largest political unit in is the world or society. Based on the methodology, the conceptual defined empire under heaven does not mean a country at all, but an institutional world instead, and all under heaven is extensively defined world with harmony, communication, and cooperation between all nations, guaranteed by the commonly agreed upon institutions. Without this thought, we are talking nonsense about the world, for the world has not been fulfilled with its worldness. The whole is insinuation of Chencha theory is further confirmed by uh, Nolset, who observes that Zhao Tingxing's, uh, Zhao Tingxing's Chencha shows parallels to world systems theories and theories of world society, yet officially draws an original Chinese philosophy to develop uh, auto Otto Shathana's concept as such, the Chinchel theory, with its holist and qualified monist epistemological inclinations, is more non-Western than post-Western, and Advaitic monism as an epistemological resource for theorizing post-Western IR is indisputably distinct from it. Advaitic monism, an untapped resource for theorizing post-Western IR. How could the distinctive epistemological resource offered by Advaitic monism pave the way for building a post-Western IR theory while the dualistic or holistic ascent of Western IR theorizations treat the state as the primary unit of analysis and assume the spatial temporal gap in the evolution of different nation states as the principal factor in driving international relations? The qualified monist or holist tilt of Chinese IR theorization consider the world as the chief unit of analysis and imagines the spread of the Chinese notion of family ship among different nation states along the lines of diffusionism in the neo-Marxist concept of uneven and uh, 
compact development as a key factor in the harmonious realization of the world. Differently from the Western Chinese dualist and or oldest presumptions, the monist slant of Advaita begins with the visualization of the entire globe as already connected single reality, wherein both the state and the world hold equivalent ontological significance. Given the equivalent ontological status, it is a matter of political motivation choice to give priority to one ontological entity or the other as a dominant unit of analysis. From this perspective, the difference between the state and the world as an analytical category and the perceived evolutionary gap among different nation states in the world is a reflection of the politically motivated choice. The political choice is intellectually explicated and justified according to the predetermined research aim to the extent that there is no ontological priority of one entity over the other. The historical significance of the world as the space for understanding the international and the state as an entity within the space is transposed onto the level of heuristic. The state and the world serve as a conceptual artifacts whose reality depends on, even if not reduced to the partial understanding of the single hidden connectedness that only binds the globe comprising individuals, nation states, classes, communities, cultures, peoples, ecology, and the world together, but also finally defines it. As such, the diverse individuals of nation states constitute sub-realities pertaining to the ultimately connected global reality and to the core nature of sub-realities and the ultimate reality are not ontologically distinct, despite the fact that they're analytically differentiable, since both the marked with and the manifest in the same single hidden connectedness, unlike the horizontal Westphalian international system organized on the basis of sovereign equality among nation states, or the hierarchy of system of world order based on a world measure for ethically evaluating nation states, Advaitic monism suggests an ever-transient global system characterized by an unbreakable and irreversible micro-macro linkage on an ontological nexus between diverse individuals, nation states, and the world, thereby problematizing the traditional methodologies of Eurocentric higher theories. The alternative methodological presupposition propositions based on Advaitic monism suggest the following preliminary framework for formulating a post-Western higher theory. The globe as a political entity is perpetually connected. The constituents of the globe, individuals, nation, states, classes, community, cultures, people, ecology, and the world are diverse sub-realities essentially pertaining to the same ultimate global reality, single hidden connectedness of or Brahman. The relations between the constituents of the globe cannot be understood by following a religion, relig rigid unit of analysis or level of inquiry, individuals, and institutions at any political level, local, international, global, bear the same symptom of connectedness. The diversifying among the constituents of the globe is partial reality depending on the analytical priorities and heuristic attitudes calling for advancement in the intellectual capabilities to reveal the hidden connectedness across diversities. The connected nature of the globe is not an unfulfilled political goal to be realized, but an unrealized intellectual quest to be explored. The intellectual realization of connectedness can make powerful case for reinterpreting diversities and political identities, thereby creating new ethical space for condemning divisive domestic international global politics. Within the terrain of post-Western IR theory, the notion of Brahman or single hidden connectedness offers a peculiar understanding of the global the inaccuracy of holism in conceptualizing the global lies in its assumption that the global is a product of relations. This is why the global could not precede colonial expansion because the relation of incorporation of the rest within the whole expanded from the West. On the contrary, if we presume the connected nature of the world, the globe is no longer potentially to be translated into actual condition by constituent relations. The globe is connected whole stays constantly there. It is always already there. There is no relation coming into being since the connectedness exists continuously. Yet the connectedness does not imply a logical jump into a sort of totalizing and paralyzing imminence. Connectedness does not mean that all processes or entities to be analyzed are equivalent or mutually replaceable, or that it is analytically congruent to consider the global as the unavoidable unit of analysis or level of inquiry. The fallacy, in fact, appears if we do not fully take on monism and if we objectively objectify connectedness as if it were simply a function of homologue of relations. Everything is connected true, yet connectedness does not operate on self-evident level of understanding, not because of deficiency in observation or perception per se, but because the process of observation and perception themselves belong to connectedness as such. Essentially, connectedness is not relationalism 
relationalism and Western thinking conveys two irreconcilable ontological positions, realism and constructivism. For realists, the relations exist in the world out there. They are intrinsic to the object of study. For constructivists, relations are real too, but their status of reality belongs only the, the only reality conceivable in terms of knowledge, that is the realm of mental representations of subject, the genealogy of the irreconcilability, not the genealogy of the broad ancient controversy around the universals, who coordinates would need to be addressed from a global historical perspective on philosophical traditions, is eternal to Western modern thinking. So while the Western modern notion of relations oscillates between the two poles defined by the dualism between subject and object, connectedness as a monist ontological position resolves this dualism by affirming the underlying intimate coextensiveness of the process of knowledge production that the Western tradition has generally thought of as a performative operation of a subject over relations as the privileged object of analysis. Yet there's a crucial tie between connectedness and relationalism that needs to be clarified. If connectedness is the ontological condition to think from, it is also true its full understanding is not imaginable. It marks the horizon of possibility for historical and analytical connectedness to be hypothesized, explored, and qualified given the theoretical presumption of connectedness, international relations can be alternatively imagined, perceived, and constructed, thereby making the conventional understanding of IR questionable and debatable. The very act of thinking, the relations between a monistic frame of thoughts leads to the collapse of the subject-object dualism. Advaitic monism is an epistemological position wherein the subject is perceived as integral to the relation he activates with regard to the object. As uh, Prasad explains, Advaita adds the thesis that the self is never the object of consciousness. Of course, particular states of consciousness can perfectly well become objects of other states as to their contents, but the self is simply always the fact of consciousness. And no matter how focused the point of consciousness, what is objectified in, is a particular contentful state, never the conscious entity itself, namely the self. So the most rigorous and abstract way, there is no self-knowledge in Advaita if by that is meant knowledge of self. What is possible is knowledge only of the states of consciousness of which the self is a subject. The theoretical and practical implications of this collapse of subject-object dualism in IR could form grounds for further research, concluding remarks. Western IR thinking has constantly restricted the infinite array of generative questions to a limited, however ostensible, large set of grounds to place interrogatives, power, national interest, institutions, military needs, the scarcity of resources, political economy, politicians, ability, or psychology, knowledge production, cultural, civilization, identity, and interactions, and so on. Furthermore, it has erected standards of accountability that reproduce these interrogative grounds of ad libitum giving, at the same time, the impression of generating infinite numbers of answers. The possible answers though, are doomed by the way in which the questions are posed, the inherent inability to overcome the limits of dualist scientist epistemology in the West is imposed to understand how different human groups interact and differentiate while conducting international relations via large-scale long-term long -term social processes. Global collectiveness, which Advaitic monism makes foreseeable, instead discloses a new creative space in social sciences where new relations can be constructed as analytical space of inquiry, since every possible choice is grounded ontologically on the assumption that there exist no relations that are more real than others a prior. There is no hierarchy among spaces of inquiry that can be presumed as ex ante conditions of epistemological foundations. It is via intellectual work that both what to study and coextensively how to study has to be produced, both what to validate and confute and what the standards of validation are for this knowledge to be proven. Far from being an ultra-relativistic position, Advaitic monism, not as a trans-historical notion, but rather as a specific context of the emergence of post-Western categories for knowledge production in IR, claims that those standards of validation are historical, social, and political. The definition of them is thus the dialogical space of tension. Within the space of dialogical tension, the monist epistemological base of post-Western IR theorizations cannot and should not compulsorily suggest that non-Western monism has methodological or analytical edge over Western dualism. Rather, the attempt to rethink IR from a monistic perspective calls for further investigation into two interrelated sources of tension in IR theorization. First, the historical sociological roots of the dialects 
ticks between dualistic and non-dualistic epistemological foundations, and second, the periodic reconfiguration of global power relations that grant specific geopolitical meanings to these dialects. The tensions delineate international relations theory as a field of ontological, epistemological, and methodological struggle, and no one is authorized to imagine this struggle as a blitzkrieg. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to cover monism from a different perspective. I thought this international relations was pretty interesting in the Chansha, uh, the Chinese possible monism, um, in you know, the dis difference, so to say, the Western dualism of separating object and subject. So uh, this was the last paper I wanted to read. So um, yeah, five and a half hours. So you know, good research, you know, saying that got to uh, really delve and study and, you know, break your head over trying to understand this stuff. So, you know, God give me strength. I'm still going here. So uh, let's look at uh, Carl Friston and active inference. So the last most modern form of monism, you know, I had Daniel from the Active Inference Institute and uh, yeah, I've watched almost all of their content. So sentiments and the origins of consciousness from Cartesian duality to Markovian monism. This essay addresses Cartesian duality and how its implicit dialectic might be repaired using physics and information theory. Our agendas describe a key distinction in the physical sciences that may provide the foundation for the distinction between mind and matter and between sentient and intentional systems. From this perspective, it becomes tenable to talk about the physics of sentience and force that underwrite our beliefs in the sense of probability distributions represented by our internal states, which may ground our mental states and consciousness. We refer to the view of Markovian monism, which entails two claims. Fundamentally, there is only one type of thing in that, and only one type of irreducible property, hence monism. All systems possessing a Markov blanket have properties that are relevant for understanding the mind and consciousness. If such systems have mental properties, then they have them partly by virtue of possessing a Markov blanket. Markovian monism rests on, upon the information geometry of random dynamic systems. In brief, the information geometry induced in any system whose internal states can be distinguished from external states must acquire dual aspect. This dual aspect concerns the intrinsic information geometry and the probabilistic evolution of internal states and separate extrinsic information geometry of probabilistic beliefs about external states that are parameterized by internal states. We call these intrinsic and extrinsic information geometries respectively, although these mathematical notions may sound complicated, they're fairly straightforward to handle and may offer a means through which to frame the origins of consciousness. Introduction. The aim of this essay is to emphasize a couple of key technical distinctions that seem especially present for an understanding of the beliefs and intentions that underpin pre-theoretical notions of consciousness. What follows is an attempt to describe constructs from information theory and physics that place certain constraints on the dynamics of self-organizing creatures such as ourself. These constraints lend themselves to an easy interpretation in beliefs, in terms of beliefs and intentions, provide, provided one defines their meanings carefully in relations to the mathematical objects at hand. The benefit of articulating calculus of beliefs and intentions from the first principles has yet to be demonstrated. However, just having a calculus of this sort may provide useful perspectives on current philosophical debates. Furthermore, trying to articulate pre-theoretical notions in terms of maths should, in principle, expand the scope of dialogue in this area. To illustrate this, we will try to license talk about physical forces causing beliefs in a non-mysterious way, a way that clearly identifies systems of artifacts that are and are not equipped with processes that can ground mental capacities and consciousness. To make a coherent argument along these lines, it'll be necessary to introduce a few technical concepts, the formal basis of the arguments in this more philosophical treatment of sentience and physics can be found. And uh, the current paper starts with uh, where Friston stops, namely to examine the philosophical implications of Markov blankets and the ensuing Bayesian mechanics. For readers who are more technically minded, the derivations and explanations of, of the equations paper can be 
uh, you found in a certain section. We have attempted to unpack the derivations for non-mathematical readers, but will retain key technical terms so that the lineage of what follows can be read clearly. To avoid cluttering the narrative with definitions, a glossary of terms, and expressions is provided at the end of the paper. In brief, we first established the basic start setup used to describe physical systems that invents the phenomenological necessary phenomenology necessary to accommodate pre-theoretical notions of consciousness. This will involve the introduction of Markov blankets and the distinction between the internal external states of a system or creature. Having established the distinction between the external and internal states, we introduce the notion of information length and information geometry. This is the first key move in the theoretical analysis of offer. Crucially, information geometry allows us to establish a calculus of beliefs in terms of probability distributions. The calculus enables the distinction to be made between the probability distribution about things and the probability distribution of things. The distinction is then treated as one way of describing an account that literally maps belief states onto physical states. Here, beliefs about external states are that are parameterized, represent encoded or coherent with internal states. We shall call the ensuing views Markovian monism because it is predicated on the existence of the Markov blanket. This brings us to modest representationalism, which allows one to talk about flows, energy gradients, and forces that shape the dynamics of internal states and necessarily the beliefs they parameterize. The next section considers the nature of these beliefs and in particular beliefs about how internal states couple to external states, namely beliefs about action upon the world out there. To do this formally, we have to look at two distinct ways of describing the dynamics and introduce the notion of trajectories via the path integral formulation. Having done this, we can then associate intentions with beliefs about action that in turn depend upon beliefs about the consequences of action. At this point, we can make a distinction between systems that have a rudimentary information geometry or reflexive instantaneous sort and systems that hold beliefs about the future. And this quantitative distinction that may provide a spectrum of intention or agential systems ranging from protozoa to people. We conclude with a brief discussion of related formulations and how the central role of sentience observation measurement or inference opens the door to further developments of sentient physics. In particular, we will discuss how Markovian monism can be interpreted in terms of existing theories regarding the relationship between mind and matter, such as neutral monism and panprotopsychism. The primary target of this paper is sentience. Our use of the word sentience here is the sense of responsive to sensory impressions is not used in the philosophy of mind sense namely the capacity to perceive or experience subjectively phenomenal consequences or having quality of sentience here simply implies the experience of a non-empty subset of systemic states, namely sensory states. In virtue of the conditions, dependencies that define the subset, uh, the internal states are necessarily responsive to sensory states, and thus the dictionary definition is fulfilled. The deeper philosophical issue of sentience speaks to the hard problem of tying down quantitative experience with or subjective experience with the information geometry afforded by Markov blanket construction. We will return to this below. While most of this paper deals with sentience in the sense just specified, it may shed light on the origins of consciousness, first applying the concept of subjective phenomenological consciousness to a system trivially presupposes that the system can be described from two perspectives. Second, the minimal form of goal directedness and as if intentionality that one can ascribe to sentient systems provides conceptual building blocks that ground more high-level concepts such as physical computation, intentionality, and representations, which may be useful to understand the evolutionary transition from non-conscious to conscious organisms and thereby illuminate the origins of consciousness. Marco Blanket's and self-organization. Before we can talk about anything, we have to consider what distinguishes a thing from everything else. Mathematically, this requires the existence of a particular partition of all states a system could be in into external Markov blanket internal states. A Markov blanket comprises a set of states that render states internal to the blanket condition independent of external states. The term was originally coined by Perl in context of the Bayesian networks. For a Bayesian network, the Markov blanket comprises the parents, children, and the parents of the children of a state or node for a Markov random field and undirected graphical model. The Markov blanket comprises the parents and children, uh, its neighbors. For a dependency network, a directed cyclic graphical model, the Markov blanket comprises just the parents. For treatments of Markov blankets in life sciences, uh, see other papers. 
The three-way partition induced by the Markov blanket enables one to distinguish internal and external states via the conditional independence given blanket states. The blanket states themselves can be further partitioned into sensory and active states, where sensory states are not influenced by internal states, and the active states are not influenced by external states. Now, that all we have done here is to stipulate define a thing in terms of its internal states and mark a blanket in terms of what does not influence what. The requisite absence of specific influences are precisely those described above, namely internal states and external states only influence each other via the mark of blanket. While sensory states are not influenced by internal states, a similar relation is true with the active and external state. A key insight here is the structural emergence f emerges from influence that are not there, much like the sculpture emerges from the material removed. Thus, there are lots of interesting implications of defining things in terms of Markov blankets. However, we will place the notion of a Markov blanket to one side of the mo moment and consider how systemic states behave in general. After this, we will consider the implications of the generic behavior where there is a Markov blanket play. So let's see figure one. Markov blankets, the schematic illustrates a partition of systematic states into an internal states, blue, and the hidden or external states, cyan, that are separated by Markov blanket comprising sensory, magenta, and active states. The upper panel shows this partition as it would be applied to action and perception in the brain, thus ensuing self-organization of internal states. This corresponds to perception, while action couples the brain states back to the external states. The lower panel shows the same dependence, but rearranged so that the internal states are associated with the intercellular states of the boculus, while the sensory states become the surface states or cell membranes underlie active states. So I'm going to skip the math, encourage people more interested to try to read through this. Okay, active inference will become a key aspect of the arguments below when thinking about. I'm sorry, skip a little more of this. So I'll try to finish up. I've been at it almost six hours. So just read a little bit more. Markovian monism. Above, we have shown that a duality between two ways in which states of a system can be conceived of already arises at a very fundamental level, namely for all systems that possess the mark of blanket. The internal states can both be associated with an intrinsic and an extrinsic information geometry. What metaphysical implication does this have? Does it follow that all systems with mark of blanket have a mind because they have probabilistic belief about external states? Are such systems conscious? The formalism itself does not answer these questions. Different metaphysical interpretations of the existence of dual information geometry are possible. In fact, one might ask whether there is any metaphysical significance whatsoever. For the existence of an extrinsic information geometry only means that one cannot, one can map internal states to conditional probability distributions over external states given blanket states. It does not mean that the resulting descriptions refer to entities that actually exist, just as we can ascribe to a lectern, the propositional belief that the best way to persist is to do nothing, which does not mean that the lectern actually has a propositional belief. Hence, any metaphysical conclusions must be drawn with care. In what follows, we will first argue that the formalism speaks in favor of monistic views. If we assume that the existence of the extrinsic information geometry has any relevance for understanding the mind and consciousness in the first place, after that, we will discuss the different interpretation of the dual perspective afforded by the two information geometries, panprotopsychism, neutral monism, dual aspect theories, and physicalism. We we'll argue that physicalism provides the most plausible interpretation. However, we acknowledge the competing interpretations cannot conclude to be ruled out. Hence, we dub the resulting view Markovian monism. Markovian monism consists of two claims. Fundamentally, there is only one type of thing and only one type of irreducible property. All systems possess a Markov blanket have properties that are relevant for understanding the mind and consciousness, and such systems have mental properties, and then they have them partly by virtue of possessing a Markov blanket. Why do we rule out dualistic interpretations of the dual information geometry? First note that dualism is still consistent with the existence of an 
extrinsic information geometry. However, consider any properties the system has by virtue of the fact that its internal states encode probability distributions over external states. Since the dynamic that can be described with reference to these properties can equivalently be described without regarding the internal states as representations of probability distributions, there is a sense in which both perspectives are reducible to one another. Hence, the dual information geometry itself does not entail property dualism. Therefore, if one believes there are, are irreducible mental properties, one has to posit them in addition to and largely independently of properties entailed by the existence of intrinsic information geometry. But this means that mental properties will not be instantiated partly by virtue of the existence of the Markov blanket. In other words, dualism is more or less orth orthogonally to the formal treatment. However, we do believe the existence of an extrinsic information geometry tells us something interesting about the origins of minds and consciousness under the assumption that properties entail by the existence of Markov blankets are relevant to understanding mental properties. We therefore have to reject dualism. This still leaves different metaphysical options open. Markovian monism as panprotopsychism. According to panpsychism, mental properties are fundamental non-physical properties and are instantiated by all micro level entities, hence the amounts to a form of property dualism, which we ruled out above. Note again that dualism is compatible with the formal treatment presented here, but it would not be an interpretation in which properties entailed by the existence of a Markov blanket have any explanatory relevance to the existence of minds and consciousness because panpsychism already presupposes mentality as a fundamental part of reality. However, there's a variant of panpsychism. Uh, panprotopsychism that could, in principle, be described as a Markovian monism. In short, panprotopsychism is the view that fundamental entities are protoconscious, that is, they have certain special properties that are precursors to consciousness and that can collectively constitute consciousness in larger systems. These special non structural properties are photophenomenal properties that are not identical to microphysical states. Otherwise, even physicalism could be considered as a form of panprotopsychism. There is nothing it is like to be a system that has just a single protophenomenal property. However, the system displays a sufficiently large number of protophenomenal properties, or if it is if they are arranged in the right way, then the system will have a phenomenal properties which are constituted by collections or protophenomenal properties. From this point of view, Markovia monism, one could identify properties entailed by the existence of a Markov blanket with protophenomenal properties, an example of a property of encoding a condition probability distribution over external states. However, it is unclear to us what extent this could be regarded as a non-structural property. Furthermore, a robust version of panprotopsychism would have to presuppose that all systems within a Markov blanket actually represent probable dis probability distributions as opposed to just being systems that can be described as if they represented such distributions. Below, we will suggest that a realist interpretation of the descriptions afforded by the extrinsic information geometry should be contingent on further conditions. This is why we would not interpret Markovian monism as a version of panprotopsychism. Markovian monism as neutral monism. Neutral monism is normally read as a family of views according to which the fundamental layer of reality consists of ontologically neutral entities, different versions of this theory make different claims about the sense in which basic entities are neutral. The most popular option seems to be view according to which the basic entities are intrinsically neither mental nor physical or intrinsically both mental and physical. Good, great advantage of neutral monism is that it solves the mind-body problem without postulating two basic types of entity, mental and physical. The significance is of this is that worries about psychophysical interaction that plague Cartesian dualism disappear. The only causal interaction in question involves neutral entities. However, the problem of mental causation may reappear in the sense that macro-level mental properties may still be causally irrelevant. Markovian monism could be specified as a version of neutral monism in which basic entities are intrinsically neither mental nor physical. There are two conjugate ways in which things that exist can be described, either from the perspective of the intrinsic information geometry or from the perspective of the extrinsic information geometry. Under the assumption that neither perspective is privileged, one would have to include that reality is fundamentally ontologically neutral. However, this would also presuppose a realist interpretation of descriptions in terms of the extrinsic information geometry, 
one would have to assume that all systems with the Markov blanket actually represent probability distributions and perform computations. Furthermore, it would have the consequence that even relatively simple systems, such as single cell organisms, would have a mind. For these reasons, we would not interpret Markovian monism as a version of neutral monism. Markovian monism is dual aspect theory. Dual aspect theory Monism is a position that reality has two aspects, the mental and physical aspect. Dual aspect monism is very similar to neutral monism. Depending on how it is defined, it may even collapse into neutral monism or into panpsychism. For instance, if dual aspect monism is defined as a view that reality is at a fundamental level, both physical and mental, then this comes extremely close to the view that basic entities are intrinsically both mental and physical, and hence to a version of neutral monism. Furthermore, if the aspect of dual aspect is interpreted in terms of properties such that basic entities have both mental and physical properties, then dual aspect theory becomes a form of property dualism which we ruled out above. There are versions of dual aspect theory that explicitly refrain from defining the dual aspect in terms of property dualism. Markovian monism is similar to dual aspect monism in that entails that one and the same thing internal states of a system possessing a Markov blanket can be viewed from two perspectives. Internal states can either be regarded as states of a random dynamical system, or they can be viewed as the parameters of a probability distribution. In order to count as a dual aspect monism, these two perspectives would have to be mutually irreducible. We are skeptical that this would be a coherent interpretation of the dual information geometry. As with the other two interpretations discussed above, an interpretation in terms of dual aspect monism would presuppose a realistic view on descriptions in terms of the extrinsic information geometry. Furthermore, just as the interpretation in terms of neutral monism, it would entail that single cell organisms have a mind. In what follows, we will sketch how Markovian monism can ground versions of reductive materialism. The physicalist interpretation of Markovian monism is the one we favor, although admit that other interpretations cannot conclusively be ruled out. Markovian monism as reductive materialism. Here's what we believe is the most coherent interpretation of the formal treatment, the fact that one can associate two information geometries with systems possessing a Markov blanket reveals a continuity between simple non-conscious systems and more complex conscious systems such as human beings due to the extrinsic information geometry. Simple systems can be described as if they had beliefs about external states. For conscious systems, the perspective afforded by such as if descriptions acquire a special status because it will typically abstract away from many of the details inherent in the mechanistic perspective. For instance, the probabilistic beliefs ascribed to explain cognitive phenomena are typically assumed to be represented by the average activities of neuronal populations, which means that any differences between populations with the same average properties will be irrelevant from the perspective of the extrinsic information geometries. This squares well with the idea that causation, including mental causation, is a macroscopic phenomenon. At the same time, these macrostates are always grounded in more fine-grained physical states, and their properties can be reductively explained in terms of physical properties. Furthermore, the computational properties ascribed to conscious systems will be more numerous and more complex than those ascribed to non-conscious systems. There are no additional non-reducible properties which are necessary to explain the mind and consciousness between some non-conscious and conscious systems. There is only a gradual difference. This entails that consciousness is a vague concept. There will be borderline cases in which the concept cannot unequivocally be applied. In particular, the proposal rests upon the distinction between the temporarily deep and shallow generative models that accompanies the distinction between conscious and unconscious interference. The distinction is vague in the sense that any generative model of dynamics has, to a certain extent, temporal depth. For example, predictive coding, homeostasis, and thermostats can also be articulated in terms of perceptual control and a reflective, reflexive form of active inference using generative models based upon differential equations. The fact that a generative model entails differential equations means that there is some inference over time. The distinction between deep and shallow then becomes a quantitative issue. Perhaps a better distinction would be between generative models that insert in a single trajectory into the future versus multiple counterfactual action dependent trajectories that incur a selection problem, namely choosing an action or planning. Construing consciousness as a vague concept may even have relevance to the meta problem of consciousness. The problem of explaining why it seems 
to many that a physical duplicate of conscious creature could be non-conscious. Although solving the meta problem is not the aim of this paper, we can at least contribute to an explanation as noted above. Our interpretation of Markovian monism entails that there is only a gradual difference between some non-conscious and conscious system and that consciousness is a vague concept. So when people claim that they can imagine a physical duplicate that is unconscious, they may in fact imagine not a complete duplicate, but a system that differs in seemingly non-significant ways from a conscious system. As an analogy, consider a heap of sand. A heap of sand is constituted by grains of sand, but one could object a heap of sand cannot be just a collection of grains of sand because I can imagine a collection of grains of sand, say three grains, that does not count as a heap. Hence, there seems to be a crucial difference between collections of grains of sands and heaps of sand. Just adding a grain of sand to something that is not a heap does not turn it into a heap. Similarly, just adding a bit more structure and function to a non-conscious system does not turn it into a conscious system. Hence, it would seem as if consciousness requires more than just right structure and function as the heart and the heart problem arises. But if consciousness is a vague concept as suggested by our interpretation of Markovian monism, then the right structure and function can be metaphysically sufficient for consciousness, even if adding just a bit of structure and function to any on controversial non-conscious system does not make it conscious. Furthermore, the very existence of the meta problem implies a certain kind of Bayesian belief that entails some puzzlement about our capacity to have subjective experience or a quali quantitative sort. But quality and accompanying puzzlement are just Bayesian beliefs that imply the extrinsic information geometry. So is there anything special about Bayesian beliefs about Bay Bayesian beliefs? The answer is yes, beliefs about beliefs in a mathematical sense require a hierarchical generative model, but a hierarchical generative model requires a hierarchy, a hierarchical deployed markup blanket to introduce the necessary conditional interdependencies which make it hierarchical. We therefore conclude that phenomenally conscious systems for which a hard problem exists must possess a certain kind of statistical structure, namely markup blankets within markup blankets. Although we believe that there is only gradual differences between non-conscious and conscious systems. If one merely considers the probabilistic beliefs that can be ascribed to such systems, there are still categorical differences that can be described in terms of more high-level properties such as intentionality and computation. Not only does this not imply a phase transition between unconscious and conscious systems, in particular one can make a threefold distinction between systems that behave only as if they implemented computations over probabilistic belief systems for which the computational stance provides added explanatory value and systems that can usefully be described as not only computational but only as, but also as representational systems. While not speaking against the continuity between life and mind, this threefold distinction could be used to establish the discontinuity between life and consciousness. Specifying the difference between These systems would require defending a particular account of computation, which is beyond the scope of this paper. The, the steps from one system to the other, from a computational to a representational system, requires ascribing content. The internal states of a system, representationalist interpretations of the free energy principle, refer to computations that are implemented by systems that minimize free energy. Such computations are defined with respect to the exact types of probabilistic beliefs encoded by systems with an extrinsic information geometry. Although Markovian monism interpreted as a form of reductive materialism is not a theory of consciousness, it refers to properties that may ground mental properties, including phenomenal properties. As such, it provides a foundation of the various physicalist approaches to consciousness and to mind, most notably representationalism and computational functionalism. Consciousness and integrated information. There have been previous attempts to use information theory to describe conscious processing. Perhaps the most notable is integrated information theory. One might ask about the relationship between the free energy principle and integrated information theory. At the time of writing, there is a gap between these theoretical approaches. First, the free energy principle is a first principle account that uses variational principles to build upon the Langevin formulation of random dynamical systems. In contrast, IET is an axiomatic approach that starts with some assumptions about what information processing must look like to be a contender for explaining conscious experience. The formal distinction between the free energy principle and IET is that the free energy principle is articulated in terms of probabilistic beliefs about some external things, while integrated information theory deals with probability distributions over the states of some systems. In other words, IT does not commit to an extrinsic information geometry, 
the geometry of integrated information is an intrinsic information geometry. This is not necessarily a problem insofar as IT offers a normative, measurable, and principled description of a system that comply with axioms, which inherit pre-theoretical notions of consciousness. On the other hand, both the free energy principle and IAT can be cast in terms of information theory and particular functionals, variational free energy and phi. Furthermore, they both rest upon partitions, Marco blankets that separate internal from external states and complexes that constitute conscious entities and can be distinguished from other entities. The, this speaks to the possibility of at least numerical analysis that show that minimizing variational free energy maximizes phi and vice versa. Although integrated information theory does not commit to a Markovian information geometry of experience, conscious or unconscious interference about something, it is possible to establish some kind of construct validity between the free energy principle and IT in terms of the axioms upon which IT is predicated. In other words, one can establish at least heuristically that the free energy principle features the essential properties of experience that constitute the axiomatic basis of IT. There are five axioms, namely intrinsic experience, composition, information, integration, and exclusion. In brief, intrinsic experience, consciousness exists. Each experience is actual and exists from its own intrinsic perspective. This is necessary consequence of Bayesian mechanics under the free energy principle because the dynamics underlying inference are physically realized and are by construction intrinsically in the sense intrinsic in the sense of pertaining to intrinsic state composition consciousness is structured with multiple phenomenal distinctions again this is a necessary aspect of Bayesian mechanics which is defined in terms of the structure implicit and conditional interdependencies indeed from a statistical perspective minimizing variational free energy is synonymous with structural learning information consciousness is unique each experience is the particular way it is, thereby differing from other possible experiences, differentiation. Again, this is a fundament of Bayesian mechanics under the free energy principle in the sense that any information geometry implies a particular point of statistical manifold or internal or intrinsic states maps to the particular probability of belief state with phenomenal support and extrinsic belief distribution over external states. Integration, consciousness is unified. Each experience is irreducible to disjoint subsets of phenomenal distinctions. Integration, again, this is a necessary aspect of the information geometry that underwrites the free energy principle. This follows because, because for each point in the internal statistical manifold, there is a single probabilistic belief variational density. In other words, although this density could be very high dimensional, it is just probabilistic belief that cannot be dissembled or reduced. Another aspect of the axiom of integration is that every part of the system has both causes and effects within the rest of the system. This is true for systems possessing a Markov blanket because the gradient flow of internal states and associating belief updating are by definition conditionally dependent. Exclusion, consciousness is definite. Each experience is characterized by what is neither less nor more than and flows at the speed it flows neither faster nor slower. Again, this is a necessary consequence of the density dynamics that underwrite the free energy principle. In other words, flows on the extrinsic statistical manifold are unique and entail particular probabilistic beliefs about external states, precise beliefs about being in a particular external state, but not another. Furthermore, each probabilistic belief has its own sufficient statistical Statistics that exclude the possibility of other sufficient statistics, for example, beliefs about my temperature can be stipulated with an expectation that my temperature is such and such. This precludes the possibility that I expect to my temperature to be anything else. In contrast to the exclusion axiom, however, the existence of the Markov blanket at one spatial temporal scale does not exclude the existence of nested Markov blankets at another spatial temporal scales. In summary, on the informal review, the information geometry and density dynamics implied by Marco blankets appears to possess the qualities or conform to the essential criteria that constitute the axiomatic basis of integrated information theory. The important result of this section from our perspective is that at least some properties associated with consciousness are already entailed by Bayesian mechanics under the free injury principle. This supports the speculative hypothesis that adding further constraints on generative models entailed by systems possessing a Marco blanket might enable us to say which systems are conscious and which are not. Unconscious systems do not perform active inference in a way that entails a characteristic features of consciousness are instantiated 
whereas conscious systems do, specifying the constraints of generative models that underpin active inference of the sort that entails characteristic features of consciousness can lead to a unitary concept of consciousness as opposed to a bundle of feature descriptions. In other words, a sufficiently specified sort of active inference may describe computational processes that account for clusters or features that are characteristic for consciousness and thereby show why these features cluster together. Information geometry and altered states of consciousness. To recap the information geometry above and attended free and attending free energy principle rest upon a separation of external from internal states by mark by blanket states. This move is crucial for elaborating of physics of sentience in which physical dynamics entail probabilistic beliefs about something. In this sense, it takes us beyond existing formalisms in the physical and philosophical sentient sciences, revealing some key issues. For example, example, quantum treatments generally rely on some specification of Schrodinger potential, but where did this potential come from? Similarly, the, for statistical thermodynamics, where did the heat path thermal res reservoir come from and, fr and what contains the heat path? In short, there would be no quantum or statistical mechanism in the absence of the Markov blanket, Schrodinger potentials, and heat paths. The same question can be posed to things like integrated information theory. What is the information about in the absence of a Markovian belief-based information geometry? What principles explain the emergence and maintenance of partitions induced by complexes? The point here is that a Markovian monism or information geometry necessarily requires the notion of duality in Conjugacy here afforded by the Markov blanket on this reading of self evidencing to non equilibrium steady state, some possessing pressing questions arise. For example, what would happen if the internal and external states were statistically sequestered? In other words, if there was a sentient physics for isolated systems, such as those considered in statistical mechanics, from a neurobiological perspective, this speaks to altered states of consciousness then sure with physiological or pharmacological quenching of blanket states. There are many examples that we could pursue here, including states of consciousness associated with psychedelic and psychomimetic drugs, or indeed the false inference associated with psychopathology, hallucinations or delusions. However, we focus on the canonical example, namely sleep and dreaming. So what does sleep or physiologists tell us about conscious or unconscious inference? If for simplicity we assume that the state of sleep corresponds to a sequestering of eternal states from the blanket states, we have an interesting pre preparation of neuronal systems that is temporary and repeatedly isolated from the sensorium. The simplification is easily sustained by many neurophysiological and neurochemical aspects of sleep physiology. For us, the key question is what happens to Markovian information geometry and Bayesian mechanics of the internal neuronal states? At first glance, the notion of self-evidencing as an explanation for the internal dynamics simply goes away. This is because the Lyapunov or potential function driving dynamics ceases to exist in the absence of blanket states. Technically, the gradients that underwent the gradient flows disappear. However, at non-equilibrium steady states, periods of disconnection from blanket states must themselves be transient and repetitive, uh, be part of the iterant, iterant dynamics that have a pullback attractor. This means Bayesian mechanics must still apply even during the suspension of any coupling with blanket states. So in summary, an intrinsic information geometry can exist in the temporary absence of blanket states in virtue of prior beliefs held by internal states. These prior beliefs underwrite proto-consciousness and are necessary to generate virtual or fricative realities in states such as dreaming. There are many fascinating issues here, for example, the complexity term in the free energy function above provides a compelling metaphor to the housekeeping that we enjoy during sleep. The complexity minimization itself has formal links with both machine learning and universal computation and physiological in the form of synaptic homeostasis. Conclusion. In conclusion, we have rehearsed some of the cornerstones of statistical physics and information theory to show how the very existence of things Markov blankets necessarily induces an information geometry with two aspects. First, the dynamics of physical internal states of any sentient particle or creature is equipped with information geometry in terms of time-dependent changes and probability distributions over internal states. We have called this an intrinsic information geometry. At the same time, there is a 
conjugate information geometry, which pertains to probability densities over external states parameterized by internal states. We have called this an extrinsic information geometry because it predicated upon probabilistic beliefs about external states. Crucially, the two are formally and fundamentally linked in that the dynamics of internal states can always be expressed as a gradient flow or a variational free energy function of belief proto-phenomenal states. This construction is entirely consistent with forces cast in terms of stochastic thermodynamics with the appropriate constant of proportionality, Boltzmann's constant in the temperature. Second, we have considered the time it takes for a particle or creature to return to its attracting manifold non-equilibrium steady state from an initial state when treated in the form of a path integral fluctuation theorem. This temporal aspect may distinguish among different kinds of creatures depending on how deeply their generative model entailed by internal states considers the future counterfactual depth. This is functionally equivalent to the temporal depth or extent of policies, namely courses of action, internally consistent with the notion of planning as inference. Another technical formulation of information processing that is closely related to information geometry is the use of gauge theory, the celebrated theory of general relativity. Our own work in this area focused on the gauge theories associated with information geometry in the Fisher information metric, we're called the Fisher information metric that equips the belief space of a statistical manifold here afforded by internal states with a geometry has a number of revealing interpretations. First, the Fisher information metric is simply the curvature of the variational free energy as one moves on the internal statistical manifold. This is the same as the conditional precision or confidence placed in beliefs about external states from a psychological perspective. The curvature of precision plays a key role in predictive processing the Bayesian brain, accounts of attentional selection and particular important role in introceptive inference. We emphasize the seamless connection from gauge theories through information geometry and variational inferences to precision for a special reason, the central role of precision and confidence in mediating consciousness is exactly the endpoint of the phenomenological and neuropsychological analysis of consciousness, processing, and selfhood offered by Mark Solms. Furthermore, the paper trail from gauge theory to attention endorses pre-theoretical notions about the intimate relationship. One could develop the story even further in terms of the predictive processing or precision per se, and how this may underwrite mental action in the sense of agency. In terms of the philosophy of science, perhaps the most tenable way of treating dual aspect information geometry is under structural realism. We mean this in the sense that there is mathematical and geometric form structure afforded by the mathematical analysis above allows one to say something about the relationship between probabilistic beliefs and the statistical physics of internal states that hold the, and represent those beliefs. Structural realism takes the pressure off any strong ontological commitments to the mapping between information structures and their content. However, this information structure implies a lawful dependency of probabilistic beliefs about external states and parameterized probability distributions over internal states in the following sense. Any movement on the internal statistical manifold will necessarily be accompanied by movement in belief space as measured by the information length or distance between the beliefs that are parameterized by expected internal states. Furthermore, because these internal states lie upon a statistical manifold of conditioned expectations, they must play the role of thermodynamic variables. It follows that belief updating and statistical thermodynamics both supervene on the same internal manifold. Note the claim here is that physics statistical thermodynamics supervenes on the same statistical manifold as belief updating. This supervenience on the same statistical manifold from which both information geometries inherit their structure could be read as the philosophical formulation of the mathematical conjugacy implied by the intrinsic and extrinsic information geometries. In terms of the ontological commitments beyond the structural realism argument, any claims would have to be argued much more carefully. It is tenable to associate physics in the sense of quantum statistical or classical mechanics with the intrinsic information geometry. Indeed, this is common parlance in statistical physics. The more delicate issue arises in terms of commitment to or interpretation of the second intrinsic sort of information geometry that underwrites Bayesian mechanics. One could avoid any strong ontological commitments here and simply note that should there be any philosophical sentience in play, they're more likely to be an attribute of belief updating and therefore part of the Bayesian mechanics. We have approached this issue by suggesting Markovian monism entails a gradual difference between non-conscious and conscious entities 
and this sense consciousness is a vague concept. Okay, so uh, a lot of reading today. Um, you appreciate uh, Orfeo, anyone that stuck through and watched this. Um, you know, because I've been going so long, I'm probably just going to end very quickly over six hours and, uh, you know, got to get to sleep and, and got to catch my breath and I got to say my nightly prayers. Log be Omer is tomorrow, um, you know, the 33rd day of the Omer, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi. So you celebrate that, enjoy the uh, Log be Omer celebration. Next week, I might try to talk about David Bohm and Kabbalah and I'll recap what I did this week just because uh, yeah, I wanted to get all this information out there and it's a little bit of like information overflow and you have to process it and so I'll go over tomorrow I'll listen through in two speed and uh, there's just a lot of information I wanted to do this deep dive in monism and you see like a whole plethora of fields where monism is applicable from quantum physics, psychology, um, the heart problem of consciousness. You know, we saw international relations, theology, and, uh, you know, the history. And, and so I'm going to continue my research into monism. I still want to write the paper. But, yeah, you know, I figured I would just throw out a whole bunch of stuff today. You know, we can review, deep dive into monism. Hope some of you enjoyed this and, you know, gain from it. Leave comments. I'll try to timestamp it uh, within the next few days. And, uh, you know, look forward to continuing research. On Wednesday, there's the Small Business Expo in Detroit. Um, I'll probably try to stream from there. Thursday, I'm going to continue with Michael, the introduction to Jewish prayer. And we will do the Shmon Esrei Amida. And... Uh, that's my only plans, like maybe Amy or Luke Ford or something like that. And it's possible I'll, I'll you know, appear on more streams. But like as of now, you know, just week in review and the continued research. So appreciate everyone who tuned in. Hope people gain from this. And, uh, you know, God bless. Have a great night. Have a meaningful Log Biomer, you know, the merit of Rabbi Shim Bar Yochoi. And next week I'll, pro I'll try to talk about Kabbalism and you know uh, Kabbalah as a monistic system but we'll see you know what tunes in so god bless have a great week everyone